The Positive Theory of Capital by Eugen von Bombowitz. Book One: The Nature and Conception of Capital. Chapter One: Man and Nature. There is scarcely a system or a textbook of political economy which does not, at some point or other, bring in discussions of matters belonging to the physical sciences. Usually, these are introduced in the chapter on production. There, we are taught that to create new goods does not mean to create new material, since matter is constant and cannot be increased. We learn what nature contributes to the work of production in the shape of materials and powers, what is done by the mechanical, what by the chemical, and what by the organic powers of nature. What importance climate, heat, moisture have on the development of production, on what physical and technical foundations the working of many machinery rests, and many things of this sort. To the principle of this custom, no sensible person will object. It is the form in which consciously or unconsciously we pay homage to one of the weightiest principles of our knowledge, the unity of all science. Ever since Bacon, we have recognized that no single branch of inquiry explains to the very end the facts with which it deals, but breaks off at some point or other and passes on its facts to some sister science for further treatment, so that the total explanation is only given by the totality of all the sciences. Thus it is that if one would not set before his readers simply a collection of barren fragments, he must add to what is distinctively departmental at least so much as will connect it to the related sciences in the organic whole of human knowledge, and thus indicate the way in which the explanations begun by him may be concluded. It would, however, be rather impertinent if we theorists were to think that such terminal truths as we may properly call them are added only for the purposes of statement and for the good of our readers. Rightly employed, they are of much greater use to ourselves as scientific inquirers. They may be an effectual means of preventing us from lightly building our whole system or parts of it on air and unintentionally maintaining in the name of political economy something which, in its assumptions or conclusions, is physically or psychologically speaking nonsense. I must not be misunderstood, however. It is not in the least my meaning that political economy should assume a nature foreign to it and become natural science or psychology. What I do mean is that it must never be in contradiction with these sciences. What is false in natural science or psychology is false in all and every science, and to prevent us unwittingly running counter to certain fundamental truths, perhaps the best way is to put these truths explicitly in black and white before our eyes. Now the subject with which we have to deal in this work is of such a nature that it very specially requires to be based on sound natural principles, and a very great deal may be lost by neglect of this. I have therefore strong reasons for following the good old custom and prefacing my theory by some fundamental truths that stretch over into the neighboring sphere of the natural sciences. I shall endeavor not to abuse the opportunity by inflicting a mass of learned scientific detail on the reader. The few truths I mean to start with would indeed, in a professional classification, be put within the sphere of the natural sciences, but they are of so general a character that practically they are outside departmental limits and belong to the commonwealth of knowledge. They are known and recognized by everybody, and in one form or other, they have been expressed all along in our economic literature. There is really only one thing that I should like to think will distinguish my use of them. I shall try so to put them that they will not be mere paragraphs introducing the theory, but will remain present and living in the spirit of it. Usually these excursuses into the domains of physics are placed in some corner of economical books rather for ornament than use. In one chapter they are made much of, in the next they are forgotten and contradicted. In what follows I shall try to avoid this error, and wherever anything depends upon these fundamental truths, which will often be the case in discussion on capital, to keep unobtrusively but firmly in touch with them. In this way, while there is no fear of our economic theory obtaining the character of a theory of natural science, it will not be one that runs counter to physical facts. Men strive after happiness. This is perhaps the most general and certainly the most vague expression for a complex of strivings, all of which 
have for object the bringing about of such occurrences and conditions as we know and feel to be pleasant, and the averting of those we know to be unpleasant. Instead of striving after happiness, we may use the expression striving after self-preservation and self-development, or striving after the greatest possible furtherance of life. Or we may, with equal propriety, use the words striving after the most complete possible satisfaction of wants for the expressions we are so familiar with in economic terminology. Want and satisfaction of want mean in the last resort nothing else than respectively unsatisfied craving of man to be put under conditions he thinks desirable or more desirable than those he has and the successful obtaining of such conditions. The whole world as we know it is subject to the law of cause and effect. No effect can take place without sufficient cause. From this law, man and his conditions have no exemption. None of those beneficent changes of condition, which we call satisfactions of want, can come about otherwise than as the effect of sufficient cause. Every satisfaction presupposes an adequate instrument of satisfaction. The adequate instruments for the satisfaction of human wants, or, what is the same thing, the causes of beneficent changes in human conditions, we call goods. The man who wants finds goods in different spheres of the world in which he lives. He finds them in the world of persons as well as the world of things. For obvious reasons, which need not be discussed here, we use the word good in somewhat different ways in these two spheres. On the one hand, we designate by the name of goods not by the persons who are of use to us, but only by the acts, the services, through which they are of use. On the other hand, we give the name to the impersonal material shapes themselves, and call them material, as opposed to personal goods. In what follows, we have to do with material goods only. Material goods are part of the external world. They are natural things, as such they are, in constitution and action, wholly and entirely natural products and subject to natural laws. The fact that men's goods are instruments towards the personal ends of the Lord of creation gives these goods no kind of immunity from complete subordination to the natural order. Any more the man himself is able to emancipate the natural side of his being from similar control. Material goods, therefore, come into existence only as natural laws allow and demand that a material shape thus and not otherwise constituted, should come into existence. They pass out of existence if a new combination of natural powers working according to natural laws results of necessity in the dissolution of their former material shape. They cannot exert the smallest effect, be it useful, hurtful, or indifferent to men, unless the given coincidence of materials and powers under natural laws produce this very effect and no other. These seem peculiarly trifling propositions. They are trifling enough to require no formal proof. Indeed, no one will seriously dispute them, but simple and trifling as they are, on certain tempting occasions, these fundamental truths have been lost sight of. And theories have been put in circulation which implicitly contradict them. The theorist, therefore, has good cause to emphasize them, and even follow out their logical conclusions to a certain extent into those departments where they have to do duty as, peculiarly, the fundamental truths of economic theory. These departments are the function of goods and the origin of goods. In other words, the theory of the use of goods and the theory of the production of goods. The theory of the use of goods I have already gone into at length in capital and interest. I there showed that material goods are nothing else than such distinct forms of matter as admit of the natural powers residing in them being directed to human advantage. I showed how the use they afford is realized through concrete activities of these natural powers, and therefore, by real forth put into power, I showed how a use cannot be made of them otherwise than by taking the peculiar forms of the energy of the good at the proper moment, supplying the conditions necessary to render them available where they previously existed in an unavailable form, and then bringing these forms of energy into proper connection with that object in which the useful effect is to take place. On these considerations, I base the conception of the material services, which I believe to be the only one that corresponds with facts, and rejected certain shadowy ideas 
which connected the old theory of interest with the word uses of goods. What remains for us here is on the same lines to lay down certain fundamental ideas as to the origin of material goods. We have already said that the origin of natural goods lies entirely under the control of natural laws. No material good can come into existence except when a previous coincidence of materials and powers has made it necessary in physical law that exactly this form of matter should emerge. Looked at from the point of view of nature, the formation of goods is a purely natural process. Not so, however, from the point of view of man. Man has cause to lay emphasis on a distinction which is not visible from the purely physical standpoint. One great class of useful forms of matter comes into existence without interference from man as the product of favorable coincidences of matter and force, a product which, from the teleological human standpoint, we should call accidental. Thus originate fruitful islands in the courses of streams, thus the grass on natural pastures and prairies, thus berries and trees of the wood, thus deposits of useful minerals. But though in this way accident does much for man, it does not do nearly enough. In nature left to herself, we have on a large scale what we should have on a small one, if we wished to make a definite picture out of colored bits of stone, and instead of piecing the picture together deliberately, were to put the bits of stone into a kaleidoscope and wait till accident shook the plainest stones into the wished for picture. Among the infinite number of ways in which the working materials and powers might combine, there are, in the one case as in the other, a countless number of possible effects, but only a few favorable ones, and in the natural, undisturbed course of things, these few turn up too seldom for man, and all his wants to rest content with them. Accordingly, he interposes another factor in the natural process, his own consciously directed energies. He begins to produce the goods he requires. To produce, what does this mean? It has been so often said by economists that the creation of goods is not the bringing into existence of materials that hitherto have not existed, is not creation in the true sense of the word, but only a fashioning of imperishable matter into more advantageous shapes, that it is quite unnecessary to say it again. More accurate but still exposed to misinterpretation is the expression that in production natural powers are the servants of man, and are directed by him to his own advantage. If this proposition be taken to mean that man in any case can impose his sovereign, will in place of natural laws, can at will bully natural law into making a single exception at his bidding. It is entirely erroneous. Whether the Lord of creation will it or no, not an atom of matter can for a single moment or by a hair's breadth work otherwise than the unchangeable laws of nature demand. Man's role in production is much more modest. It consists simply in this, that he himself, a part of the natural world, combines his personal powers with the impersonal powers of nature, and combines them in such a way that under natural law the cooperation results in a definite desired material form. Thus, notwithstanding the interference of man, the origin of goods remains purely a natural process. The natural process is not disturbed by man, but completed, inasmuch as by an apt intervention of his own natural powers, he supplies a condition which has hitherto been wanting to the origination of a material good. If we look more closely at the way in which man assists natural processes, we find that his sole but ample contribution consists in the moving of things. Putting objects in motion is the idea which gives the key to all human production and its result, to all man's mastery over nature and its powers. And this is so simply because the powers reside in the objects. Now when man, by his physical powers, the power of moving things, is able to dictate where the object shall be, he obtains control over the place at which a natural power may become effective. And this means broadly a control over the way and over the time in which it may become effective. I say control over the way in which a natural power may become effective. Of course, a pound weight acts as a pound weight, and never in any other way whether it be a pound weight on a writing table, or a counterpoise on a scale beam, or whether it keeps down the valve of a steam engine. It never ceases to exert the force of gravitation with which its mass is endowed. 
but just because the expression of one and the same natural power always remains the same, results that are extraordinarily different may be obtained by getting it to work in different combinations, just as by adding like to unlike the different sums may be got every time. And so our pound weight, while in itself constantly acting with perfect uniformity, will, according to the different surroundings in which we place it, sometimes hold together a heap of papers on a writing table, sometimes indicate the weight of another object, sometimes regulate the pressure of steam in a boiler. Again I say control over the time in which a natural power may become effective. This proposition also must not be taken too literally. It must not be imagined that natural powers work intermittently, that man can sometimes bring them to a standstill, sometimes set them working again. On the contrary, natural powers are always at work. A natural power not active would be a contradiction in terms, but it is possible that several powers may be so combined that their activities may, for a time, mutually balance each other, and the result would be rest, if not complete rest, still some movement so slight that, as regards human purpose, it may be neglected. When this is the case, before any new resultant can emerge, that is, of interest to man, there must be an entirely different combination of materials and powers. This suggests how man may get control of the point of time at which a definite resultant emerges. It is only necessary for him, by skillful use of his power, to move objects to provide the causes of the desired effect, all but one. So long as this one is not present, the conditions are unfulfilled, and there cannot be the desired result. But when, at the proper moment, he adds the last condition, the movement hitherto, held in leash, as it were, is suddenly set free, and the desired effect is obtained at the opportune time. Thus the sportsman moves powder and lead into the barrel of the gun. He shuts the breech, he raises the cock. Each of these things has for long possessed and expressed its peculiar powers. In the powder are present the molecular powers, whose energy, later on, is to expel from the shot of the barrel. The barrel now, as formerly, exerts its force of cohesion and resistance. The trigger, which is to let the cock smash down, restrains and presses against the spring. Still the arrangement, the disposition, of the collective powers is such that the resultant of their mutual energies is rest. But the sportsman covers the wild fowl with the barrel. There is a slight pressure on the tongue, a little dislocation of the arrangement, and the shot flies. The same considerations which show us the kind of mastery man has over nature show us at the same time the measure and the narrow limits of his mastery. As we have seen, man has certain power to make natural forces act, where, when, and how he will, but this power he possesses only in so far as he can control the matter in which these forces reside. Now the masses of matter, and therefore the masses of inert resistance, which have to be overcome before our purposes are served, are often immense, while the physical force which is at our command is very modest and comparatively trifling. Often, on the other hand, the matter is too fine to be manipulated by our rude hand. Our interests often call for infinitely delicate rearrangements of infinitely smaller pieces. And how unsuited are our clumsy fingers to deal with the molecules and atoms? How entirely incapable is the human hand of imitating even one of those wonderfully delicate cellular tissues which nature flings out of the thousandfold, every day in every plant? And leaf. Thus human powers are doubly deficient. They are too slight as against the mass, too rude against the structure of the matter which they have to subdue. In those circumstances we should be very badly off for the wherewithal of production if we had not some real allies behind these doubly insufficient powers. One of these allies is the human mind. In investigating the causal relation of things we come to know, the natural conditions under which the desired goods come into existence, we thus come to learn where human force can be applied with advantage and where not, and thus we are taught to avoid exertions which are barren and choose those which are profitable. Human power so directed is like a small but well-officered army, which makes up in mobility, cohesion and energetic use of opportunity, what it wants in numbers. Another powerful ally 
is the struggle against nature and nature herself. All that we are able to do in production would be wretchedly small, were it not that, in the storehouse of nature, we find the means of dividing nature against herself, and setting force against force. But here we touch on a subject which is, in itself, too important, particularly as regards our inquiry, to admit of merely a passing mention. Chapter 2. The Nature of Capital The end and aim of all production is the making of things with which to satisfy our wants, that is to say, the making of goods for immediate consumption or consumption goods. The method of their production we have already looked at in a general way. We combine our own natural powers and natural powers of the external world in such a way that under natural law the desired material good must come into existence. But this is a very general description indeed of the matter, and looking at it closer there comes in sight an important distinction which we have not as yet considered. It has reference to the distance which lies between the expenditure of human labour and the combined production and the appearance of a desired good. We either put forth our labour just before the goal is reached, or we intentionally take a roundabout way. That is to say, we may put forth our labour in such a way that it at once completes the circle of conditions necessary for the emergence of the desired good, and thus the existence of the good immediately follows the expenditure of the labour, or we may associate our labour first with the more remote causes of the good, with the object of obtaining not the desired good itself, but approximate cause of the good, which cause again must be associated with other suitable materials and powers, till finally, perhaps through a considerable number of intermediate members, the finished good, the instrument of human satisfaction, is obtained. The nature and importance of this distinction will be best seen from a few examples, and as these will, to a considerable extent, form a demonstration of what is really one of the most fundamental propositions in our theory. I must risk being tedious. A peasant requires drinking water. The spring is some distance from his house. There are various ways in which he may supply his daily wants. First, he may go to the spring each time he is thirsty and drink out of his hollowed hand. This is the most direct way. Satisfaction follows immediately on exertion. But it is an inconvenient way for our peasant has to take his way to the well as often as he is thirsty, and it is an insufficient way, for he can never collect and store any greater quantity, such as he requires for various other purposes. Second, he may take a log of wood, hollowed out into a kind of pail, and carry his day supply from the spring to his cottage. The advantage is obvious, but it necessitates a roundabout way of considerable length. The man must spend, perhaps, a day in cutting out the pail. Before doing so, he must have felled a tree in the forest to do this. Again, he must have made an axe, and so on. But there is still a third way. Instead of felling one tree, he fells a number of trees, splits and hollows them, and lays them from end to end, and so constructs a runnel or roan, which brings a full head of water to his cottage. Here, obviously, between the expenditure of the labour and the obtaining of the water, we have a very roundabout way. But then the result is ever so much greater. Our peasant needs no longer to take his weary way from his house to well with a heavy pail on his shoulder, and yet he has a constant and full supply of the freshest water at its very door. Another example, I require stone for building the house. There is a rich vein of excellent sandstone in a neighboring hill. How is it to be got out? First, I may work the loose stones back and forth with my bare fingers and break off what can be broken off. This is the most direct way, but also the least productive way. Second, I may take a piece of iron and make a hammer and chisel out of it and use them on the hard stone, a roundabout way, which, of course, leads to a much better result than the former. Third method, having a hammer and chisel, I use them to drill a hole in the rock. Next, I turn my attention to procuring charcoal, sulfur, and nitre and mixing them in a powder. Then I pour the powder into the hole, and the explosion that follows splits the stone into convenient pieces, still more of a roundabout way, but one which, as experience shows, is as much superior to the second way in a result as the second was to the first. Yet another example, I am short-sighted and wish to have a pair of spectacles. For this I require ground and polished glasses and a steel framework. 
but all that nature offers toward that end is silicious earth and iron ore. How am I to transform these into spectacles? Work as I may, it is impossible for me to make spectacles directly out of silicious earth, as it would be to make the steel frames out of the iron ore. Here there is no immediate or direct method of production. There is nothing for it but to take the roundabout way, and indeed a very roundabout way. I must take silicious earth and fuel and build furnaces for smelting the glass from the silicious earth. The glass thus obtained has to be carefully purified, worked, and cooled by a series of processes. Finally, the glass thus prepared, again by means of ingenuous instruments carefully constructed beforehand, is ground and polished into the lens fit for short-sighted eyes. Similarly, I must smelt the iron ore in a blast furnace, change the raw iron into steel, and make the frame there from processes which cannot be carried through without a long series of tools and buildings that, on their part again, require great amounts of previous labour. Thus, by an exceedingly roundabout way, the end is attained. The lesson to be drawn from all of these examples alike is obvious. It is that a greater result is obtained by producing goods in a roundabout ways than by producing them directly. Where good can be produced in either way, we have the fact that, by this indirect way, a greater product can be got with equal labour, or the same product with less labour. But beyond this, the superiority of the indirect way manifests itself in being the only way in which certain goods can be obtained, if I might say so. It is so much the better that it is often the only way. That roundabout methods lead to greater results than direct methods is one of the most important and fundamental propositions in the whole theory of production. It must be emphatically stated that the only basis of this proposition is the experience of practical life. Economic theory does not and cannot show a priori that it must be so, but the unanimous experience of all the technique of production says that it is so, and this is sufficient all the more that the facts of experience which tell us this are commonplace and familiar to everybody. But why is it so? The economist might quite well decline to answer this question, for the fact that a greater product is obtained by methods of production that begin far back is essentially a purely technical fact, and to explain questions of technique does not fall within the economist's sphere, for instance, that tropical lands are more fruitful than the polar zone, that the alloy of which coins is made stands more wear and tear than pure metal, that a railroad is better for transport than ordinary turnpike road. All these are matters of fact with which the economist reckons, but which his science does not call on him to explain. But this is exactly one of those cases where, in the economist's own interest, the interest he has in limiting and defining his own task, it is exceedingly desirable to go beyond the specific economic sphere. If the sober physical truth is once made clear, political economy cannot indulge in any fancies or fictions about it, and in such questions political economy has never been behind in the desire and the attempt to substitute its own imaginings. Although then this law is already sufficiently accredited by experience, I attach particular value to explain its cause, and, after what has been said, as to the nature of production, this should not be very difficult. In the last resort, all our productive efforts amount to shiftings and combinations of matter. We must know how to bring together the right forms of matter at the right moment, in order that from those associated forces the desired result, the product wanted, may follow. But, as we saw, the natural forms of matter are often so infinitely large, often so infinitely fine, that human hands are too weak or too coarse to control them. We are as powerless to overcome the cohesion of the wall of rock when we want building stone as we are from the carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphor, potash, etc., to put together to a single grain of wheat. But there are other powers which can easily do what is denied to us, and these are the powers of nature. There are natural powers which far exceed the possibilities of human power in greatness, and there are other natural powers in the microscopic world which can make combinations that put our clumsy fingers to shame. If we can succeed in making those forces our allies in the work of production, the limits of human possibility will be infinitely extended, and this we have done.
The condition of our success is that we are able to control the materials on which the power that helps us depend more easily than the materials which are to be transformed into the desired good. Happily, this condition can be very often complied with. Our weak yielding hand cannot overcome the cohesion of the rock, but the hard wedge of iron can. The wedge and the hammer to drive it we can happily master with little trouble. We cannot gather the atoms of phosphorus and potash out of the ground and the atoms of carbon and oxygen out of the atmospheric air and put them together in the shape of the corn of wheat, but the organic chemical powers of the seed can put this magical process in motion, while we, on our part, can very easily bury the seed in the place of its secret working, the bosom of the earth. Often, of course, we are not able directly to master the form of matter on which the friendly power depends, but in the same way as we would like it to help us, do we help ourselves against it. We try to secure the alliance of a second natural power which brings the form of matter that bears the first power under our control. We wish to bring the well water into the house, wooden ruins would force it to obey our will, and take the path we prescribe, but our hands have not the power to make the forest trees into ruins. We have not far to look, however, for an expedient. We ask the help of a second ally in the axe and the gouge. Their assistance gives us the ruins, and the ruins bring us the water. And what in this illustration is done through the mediation of the two or three members may be done with equal or greater results through five, ten, or twenty members, just as we control and guide the immediate matter of which the good is composed by one friendly power, and that power by a second, so can we control and guide the second by a third, and the third by a fourth, this again by a fifth, and so on, always going back to more remote causes and the final result, till in the series we come at last to the one cause which we can control conveniently by our own natural powers. This is the true importance which attaches to our entering on roundabout ways of production. And this is the reason of the result associated with them. Every roundabout way means the enlisting of our service of a power which is stronger or more cunning than the human hand. Every extension of the roundabout way means an addition to the powers which enter into the service of man and the shifting of some portion of the burden of production from the scarce and costly labor of human beings to the prodigal powers of nature. And now we may put into words an idea which has long waited for expression and must certainly have occurred to the reader. The kind of production which works in these wise circuitous methods is nothing else than what economists called capitalist production, as opposed to that production which goes directly at its object. And capital is nothing but the complex of intermediate products which appear on the several stages of the roundabout journey. It is in this way I interpret the most important fundamental conception in the theory of capital, and I should be very glad to stop here, but like so many another conception in this theory of capital, this conception of capital itself has become a veritable apple of discord to the theorists. A perfectly amazing number of divergent interpretations here confront each other and block the approach to the theory of capital with one of the most vexatious controversies in which our science could be involved. This uncertainty as to the conception of capital bad enough in itself becomes worse in proportion as capital gives modern science new questions to consider and discuss. It is certainly very unfortunate when a science already earnestly, even acrimoniously, engage on the solution of questions which affect society to its depths, questions which all the world knows, ponders and discusses as the great problems of capital is struck, as it were by a second confusion of tongues, and becomes involved in an endless wrangle as to what kind of thing it is that properly is called capital. Such a controversy at such a point is more than embarrassing, it is a calamity, and has been found so in the history of political economy. Almost every year there appears some new attempt to settle the disputed conception, but unfortunately no authoritative result has yet followed these attempts. On the contrary, many of them have only served to put more combatants in the field and furnish more matter to the dispute. I confess that, to me, the settlement of the real problems connected with the name of capital seems more important, and certainly is more attractive, than the cataloguing of controversies 
as to the proper use of the word. All the same, the fact remains that the confusion about the name has brought a great amount of confusion into the matter, and again, it might be open to misconstruction, and not without reason if the author of a somewhat comprehensive work on capital were to pass over the discussion of what is certainly the most noisy, if not the most weighty controversy about capital. On these two accounts I feel obliged, again, to tread the heated path of controversy, in the hope that an impartial and sober inquiry into the matter in dispute may succeed in ending it. Chapter 3. Historical Development of the Conception It will be most convenient to open the discussion by a historical survey of the development of the conception. Originally, the word capital was used to signify the principle of a money loan, in opposition to the interest. This usage, already foreshadowed in the Greek formation, became firmly established in medieval Latin and appears to have remained the prevailing one for a very long time, even pretty far down in the new era. Here, therefore, capital meant the same thing as an interest-bearing sum of money. In the meantime, the disputes which had arisen over the legitimacy or illegitimacy of loan interest brought about an essential deepening and a widening of the conception. It had become apparent that the interest-bearing power of barren money was at bottom a borrowed one, borrowed from the productive powers of things that the money could buy. Money only gave the exchange form, to a certain extent, the outward garb, in which the interest-bearing things passed from hand to hand. The true stock, or parent stem, which bore interest was not money, but the goods that were got for it. In these circumstances, the obvious course was so to change the conception that besides embracing the representative thing money, it would embrace the represented thing goods. And indeed, popular language seems to have made this change before science did. At least as early as the year of 1678, in a glossary of that year, besides the meaning of a sum of money, there appears this further interpretation of the word capital. But science was not long behind in sanctioning the adoption of the conception. We find it substantially in Hume in his essay on interest, when he shows that the rate of interest altogether depends not on the amount of money, but on the amount of riches or stocks available. The only thing wanting is that he should have formally called these riches or stocks real capitals. This formal change was finally made by Turgot, whoever, he says, in the Reflections sur la Formation et la Distribution des Richeses, gets possession of more goods in a year than he requires to use, can lay past the surplus and accumulate it. These accumulated goods are what people call capital. It is absolutely the same whether this sum of goods or this capital consists of a mass of metal or of other things, since money represents every kind of goods, just as, on the other side, all other kinds of goods represent money. Thus Turgot gave the second reading in historical succession to the conception of capital. It was very soon superseded by a third, for when Turgot designated all saved goods indiscriminately as capital, he seemed to have gone too far in broadening the conception. To replace the word money in the definition by the word goods only reflected, indeed, the more thorough grasp which was now taken of the subject. But to give the name of capital without any further discrimination to stocks of goods was to give up without sufficient reason the second feature in the old conception, the reference that capital had to a capability of yielding interest, to an acquisition of goods. To that extent, Turgot's conception of capital was only in part a development born of the time. In part, it was an entirely new reading of the term, a reading which, at the same time, exposed him to the charge that, without due cause, he had neglected the very suggestive differences there are between goods and goods. It was no less a man than Adam Smith who changed the rectified Turgot's definition. The saved stocks, he said, must be distinguished as containing two parts. One portion is destined for immediate consumption and gives off no kind of income. The other portion is destined to bring in an income to its owner, and this part alone rightly bears the name of capital. With this distinction, however, Adam Smith connected another consideration, which was destined to have very serious consequences on the development of the conception. He remarked that his use of the term was applicable as well to the case of individuals as to that of a whole community. Only with this shifting of the standpoint 
the group of things embraced by the conception was also somewhat changed. Individuals, that is to say, can make a gain not only by the production of goods, but also by lending to other individuals for considerable goods, which are destined in themselves to immediate consumption, such as houses, masquerade dresses, furniture, etc. But the community, as a whole, cannot enrich itself otherwise than by the production of new goods. For the community, then, the conception of means of acquisition coincides with the otherwise narrower conception of means of production. In harmony with this conception of capital, from the point of view of the community, must be limited to a complex of the means of production. It is worth our while to put this more exactly before us, the bearing of this insignificant remark, which, by the way, in Adam Smith, is put more unpretentiously and much less sharply than in the abstract which I have given of his meaning. First of all, this was the beginning of the division of capital into two independent conceptions, the conceptions afterwards distinguished as national capital and individual capital, or, to indicate the relation still more exactly, the parent conception of capital as a stock of goods yielding income lived on under the designation of private capital, but under the name of national capital, it sent out an offshoot, which quickly grew to independent importance, soon, indeed, to greater importance than the parent conception itself. It was immediately recognized that a very notable importance as regards production attached to that class of goods, which people now began to call capital par excellence, and this became the occasion of a great many profitable applications of the new conception to the theory of production. Thus we find the national conception in a short time taking its place as one of the chief fundamental conceptions of that theory, and engaged in those very important problems that are now associated with its name. In the triad, land, labor, and capital, we find the new conception giving its name to one of the three great sources of wealth, or, as it was put later, to one of the three factors of production. But all the time, in virtue of the old parent conception, that known later as private capital, the term capital remained connected with the phenomena of interest, which belonged to the theory of distribution or income. Thus, from that time onward, appeared the peculiar phenomenon which was to be the source of so many errors and complications, that two series of fundamentally different phenomena and fundamentally different problems were treated under the same name. Capital as national capital became the central figure of the weightiest problems of production, as private capital of the fundamentally distinct problem of interest. In view of this, it becomes of consequence to state clearly that Adam Smith's two varieties of the conception of capital are properly two entirely independent conceptions resting substantially on quite different foundations and only connected externally by a very loose bound. As chance, however, would have it, it was just this secondary and external relation that caused the name to be given to the younger conception and brought about the identity of name between the two. The center of gravity of the conception of private capital, as has been pointed out, lies in the acquisition of interest in the characteristic of being a source of income. The center of gravity of the conception of national capital, on the other hand, lies in production in the characteristic of being a tool of production and the loose bond that connects them is the accidental circumstances that the goods of which men make use in production are the same goods as are the source of profit and interest to a people considered as a whole, and are, therefore, capital in the original sense. Now this latter reference to income gave the national conception of capital its name, but it was very far from giving it its living substance. This was found so exclusively in the relation to production that in a short time the formal definition of capital was based upon that relation alone. It was defined as a complex of produced means of production, and such like, and in the end it scarcely caused any misgiving when, on closer consideration, the produced means of production seemed never to be quite identical with those stocks which constitute the income-bearing capital of a people. For there can be no question that communities obtain income from consumption goods loaned to other countries against interest. When this incongruity was expressly noted, and yet notwithstanding, national capital was quietly defined as a complex of means of production. It amounted to a practical and emphatic recognition of the fact that people were interested in capital 
So, like, <clears throat> it amounted to practical and emphatic recognition of the fact that people were interested in capital solely on account of its relations to production, and not at all on account of its accidental characteristic of being the source of interest to the community. To put it shortly, in national capital, the characteristic of being the national source of interest came to the front only for a moment, but this moment was long enough to attach the name of capital to it. Scarcely was this done when the center of gravity was shifted and placed in its relation to production, and since then, national capital has been looked on as an independent conception, substantially quite foreign to its namesake, private capital. Clearly, as the historian of economic theory may now distinguish between these conceptions as developed, the distinction was not seen at the time, nor for long afterwards. With Adam Smith himself, the whole matter lies, I might say, in embryo. His ideas were so far from being fixed that he could occasionally ascribe to them meanings which were quite distinct from and did not at all fit in with the fundamental conception. An instance of this is his extension of the national conception to all sorts of personal properties, talents, skills, etc., which seem a little out of place as elements of a stock, and which, like spirits rashly conjured, banished peace for many a long day from the theory of capital. This, however, is an episode of only secondary importance. The principal point is that the followers of Adam Smith not only failed to get rid of the confusion in which he had left the conception of capital, but, on the contrary, positively put their seal to one of its worst mistakes. They did not notice that, in what Adam Smith and they themselves called capital, there were two fundamentally distinct conceptions. They considered the capital of which they spoke in the theory of production as identical with the capital which bears interest. As we know, Adam Smith had already noticed that there was a certain difference in the meanings usually given to the word capital, and that, for instance, rented houses, hired furniture, or masquerade dresses were capital in one sense and not in another, and his followers had not failed to loyally transmit the remark. But obviously, they attached no importance to it, but was the use of making a fuss about a distinction which referred only to a few hired fancy dresses and such alike, and held fast by the conception of capital, the factor of production being capital, the source of interest, and now one confusion resulted in another. Before, it was the conceptions that were mixed. Now, it was the phenomena and the problems. Capital produces and it bears interest. What more natural than to say, shortly, it bears interest because it produces, and thus introduced and made possible by the confusion in the conception of capital, originated that naive and one-sided theory of the productivity of capital which, from Say's days to our own, has held and still, in some measure, hold economic science under its baneful influences. The socialist or semi-socialist writers of our time were the first to face in earnest the confusion of conceptions by distinguishing capital into pure economic capital and capital as historical legal category. This distinction, as we shall see, did not indeed hit the nail on the head, but it was at least a distinction which, of necessity, finally distinguished between the object of the production problem and the object of the interest problem, and thus paved the way for an advance in the treatment of the still viciously confused problems. But this is to anticipate the course of development to resume the methodical narrative we must go back to Adam Smith. It may be said that Adam Smith's fundamental conception was never afterwards quite neglected. The relation of capital to acquisition and to production, which in opposition to Turgot he had again imported into the conception, has in some form or other been retained by all latter writers. On the other hand, it very soon became manifest that within the common fundamental conception there was a surprising amount of latitude for different readings of it, and, as it chanced, there were certain circumstances which very much favored the taking advantage of this latitude. First of all, the Congress felt heir not only to the fundamental conception, but to the seed of ambiguity which Adam Smith had planted in it. This seed now burst into full life. Almost everybody, entangled in the confusion we have just described, thought that capital must be defined by one uniting conception. But the one party, and indeed the majority, thought more about the instruments of production, while the other thought more about the source of income, 
and thus they attached to capital and characteristics of two different conceptions. This was one fruitful cause of divergent definitions, but there was another, still more fruitful. Whether the theoretical conception of capital was made to include productive instruments only, or whether more liberally it was made to embrace acquisitive instruments as well, in any case, there are many different kinds, both of productive and of acquisitive instruments. Now, in proportion, as economists discovered more similarities or more contrasts between the various groups of goods which serve for production and for acquisition, they considered it appropriate to group together under the conception which they called capital, sometimes all acquisitive or all productive instruments, without exception, sometimes only a certain circle of the same, and this circle again, according to the tendencies of the writer, might be larger or smaller, sometimes of moderate dimensions and sometimes again very closely limited. It may be said, indeed, that of all the combinations and permutations which were logically and mathematically conceivable, economical science in this case was not spared one. Without attempting either to give a complete tale of these or to keep the chronological order, I shall shortly collocate the more important of them. Numerous writers define capital as a group of products that serve towards production or as a group of produced means of production. This conception, which is expressly based on the relation of capital to production, excludes on the one hand land as not produced and on the other hand all goods that serve for immediate satisfaction of wants. This conception I have followed in defining capital as a group of intermediate products insofar as it is not so much an alteration as a more distinct formulation of Adam Smith's national conception. I do not reckon it an independent variation. The variation which Herman, however, has given must be considered an independent one, and is the fourth reading in arithmetical order given to the conception. He goes back to capital as the source of income, and makes this the object of his definition. Capital, he says, is every durable foundation of a utility which has exchange value. In opposition to the last definition, this one includes under the conception of capital all land, and besides embraces such consumption goods as are durable, like furniture, houses, etc., even if they are personally used by the owners. A fifth variation is given by Menger. He defines capital as such groups of economic goods of higher rank, productive goods, as are now available to us for future periods. This definition is, in one way narrower, in another, wider than Herman's. It excludes durable consumption goods, goods of the first rank, but it is wide enough to take in the productive services of labor, which Herman has not reckoned as capital. A sixth variation comes from Kleinwachter. He finds in a characteristic mark of capital that it lightens the toil of acquisition or productive labor. Now this characteristic appears to him not to belong to all means of production, but only to one category of these, the tools of production, while the matter or materials of production are absolutely passive during the whole production process. They are worked up or used up, but give no assistance in working. Logically, therefore, the conception of capital should be limited to tools of production. A seventh interpretation has Jevons for its author. It runs parallel to a certain extent with the foregoing. That is to say, Jevons also considers it proven that by capital is to be understood wealth employed to facilitate production. But he finds this characteristic in quite another group of concrete goods from that of Kleinwachter. The single and all-important function of capital, he says, is to enable the laborer to await the result of any long-lasting work, to put an interval between the beginning and the end of an enterprise. Capital, then, consists merely in the aggregate of those commodities which are required for sustaining laborers of any kind or class engaged in work. A stock of food is the main element of capital, but supplies of clothes, furniture, and all the other articles in common daily use are also necessary parts of capital. The true and only capital thus, according to Jevons, is the sustenance of laborers. Marx arrived at an eighth reading of the conception. As everyone knows, he sees an interest a profit got by the capitalist at the expense of the wage earner. This element of exploitation seems to him so important that he brings it into the conception of capital as a constitutive feature of it. He conceives of capital as only the productive instruments which, 
in the hand of the capitalist serve as instruments for the exploitation and enslaving of the laborer. The same things in the possession of the laborer, on the other hand, are not capital. A ninth variation we owe to the distinguished critic of the theory of capital, Karl Knies. It originates in a well-meant attempt to settle the terribly tangled controversy to the satisfaction of everybody. To this end, Knies endeavors to construct a conception of capital which will be so wide that the most important of the contending interpretations may find room in it beside each other. The uniting element in the conception he imagines he finds in the devotion of goods to the service of the future. Accordingly, he defines the capital of a community as its available stock of goods, whether for consumption, acquisition, or production, which may be applied to satisfying the wants in the future. This definition does, as a fact, afford room both for Turgot's saved stocks of goods and for the produced means of production of Adam Smith's school, as also for all goods embraced in Herman's definition as affording the foundation of durable, and therefore a conspicuously future utility. Quite by itself stands the tenth interpretation, that of L. Walrus. He divides all economic goods into capital and income. All kinds of goods, irrespective of their destination, which can be used more than once, that is, all durable goods he calls capital, while all perishable goods are income. Going into details, he mentions the following as capital, land, persons, and movable durable goods. Or, while he considers food, the raw materials of industrial production, fuel, and the like as income. If the interpretations just mentioned are divided in opinion as to the goods which should be designated capital, they are, at any rate, all agreed that it is goods that are to bear that name. But finally, an eleventh reading of the conception calls this in question, and instead of making capital a real concrete quantity, distills out, as it were, some kind of abstraction as the essence of capital. Thus Enliod, who sometimes recurs to a favorite metaphor of earlier writers and defines capital as a stock of accumulated labor, sometimes goes still deeper in abstraction and defines it as purchasing power or circulating power. These phrases are not meant as illustrations, but explanations given in full earnest. He gives us to understand this in the most emphatic way by saying, in one place, that the application of the word capital to goods is a simple metaphor, and on another occasion, in so many words that capital does not represent goods in any way whatever. Quite recently, too, we have a strikingly similar conception in the suggestive work of a juristic writer, Cunist. He also tells us, emphatically, that capital is of a material nature and does not consist of material objects at all, of goods themselves, that is to say, but only of their value. Capital is the value of productive power contained in material goods, or complex of productive material values. Numerous as these various readings of the conception our list does not, by any means, exhaust the divisions and subdivisions that might be given, in addition to the above interpretations which differ in form, which are, that is, different definitions. There may be complete unanimity as to the formula of the definition, and yet a good deal of disagreement as to the essence of it. This might happen where a word employed in all the definitions as characteristic and distinctive was not used in all of them in the same sense. Not to speak of less important instances, there are two characteristic terms which, as capable of different readings, involve materially different interpretations of the conception of capital. One of these is the word good of the many economists who were agreed in defining capital as a stock or group of goods. Some, taking the word in its narrower sense, thought only of a supply of material goods, some extending it to immaterial objects thought of things like the state, peace, law, national honor, virtue. Some again under the same term included useful personal properties and powers, while others took man himself into the conception. A similar ambiguity has attended the use of the characteristic term means of production, or simply production, while some economists, and those the majority understood by production, simply producing of materials for the satisfaction of human want, Others included the producing of what they call inward goods, the creation of satisfactory conditions for and in the human person. The consequence of this was that the significant term 
means of production lost every possible limitation and that even goods for immediate enjoyment were received into the conception of capital on the ground of being instrumental in producing the inward goods of content, health, culture, etc. The greatest sinner in this respect is Rosher. He first defines capital to be every product which is dedicated to further production, but then divines this general conception into productive capital and use capital, according as these products affect the production of material goods, or the production of personal goods or useful relations. Thus, notwithstanding the difference in definition, his conception of capital practically comes very near to that of Turgot. Chapter 4. The True Conception of Capital Political economists have not, as a rule, been noted for the unanimity of their definitions, but here the differences in the interpretation of the conception are so excessive as to suggest that there may be something quite peculiar about the objects of dispute. I think Canise has quite correctly estimated the peculiar position of the case when he says that there is something else in it that is ordinarily scientific dispute as to whether a particular definition is happy or unfortunate, or indeed true or false. It is not the definition that is the matter of dispute, but the thing defined, or, as I should prefer to say, the terminology. The material difference in the definitions is not so much that the one thing to be defined appears to each one in a different light, as that each one is defining an entirely different thing, and thus definitions that are really incompatible come within the same ring fence because each one claims the expression capital for the object he is defining. It is clear that, while this circumstance may explain the striking divergence of opinions, it makes it, unfortunately, more difficult to decide between them. For in questions of nomenclature, there is, strictly speaking, neither right nor wrong. There is, therefore, nothing to compel conviction. There is only an appeal to a greater or less appropriateness, and people may, to a considerable extent, remain of different opinions as to the appropriateness. All the same, it is clear that our controversy must be settled. It is impossible that economic science can, for all time, allow its representatives liberty to call ten or eleven fundamentally different things by the same name. Political economy requires clear thinking, and for that the prerequisites are clear ideas and clear speech. We must come to an agreement, and it will become to exactly as men have agreed and continue to agree over the innumerable disputes to which the nomenclature of the descriptive natural sciences, zoology, botany, mineralogy, geography, continually give rise. The majority unite and slowly but surely leave the dissensions and pass to the order of the day. But on which of the numerous readings of our conception of capital can we hope to unite unprejudiced persons? To my mind, if we have once realized the nature of the controversy as preeminently one of terminology, we shall not find it so difficult to decide as the amount of confusion up till now might lead one to suppose. Happily, there cannot be much doubt as to certain leading principles that have to be observed in questions of terminology. If these are impartially acted upon, the great majority of the competing definitions will be definitely thrown out and there will not remain more than two or three between which there need be any real hesitation, and even in this short lead, the arguments of appropriateness which must decide are so unequally distributed that, though we may not be able actually to force a universal acceptance of one definite conception, as it is, after all, only appropriateness that must guide us, yet we may confidently look for the voluntary adhesion of a vast majority. The leading principles we have to observe seem to me to be as follows. First and chiefly, it is quite clear that our readings of the conception must be logically unassailable. That is to say, it must not contradict itself and it must apply to the object which it possesses to define. Then we must not be spendthrift in our terminology. That is to say, we must not attach the name capital to and make it synonymous with a conception that already has a name while other suggestive conceptions to which naturally the word would equally well apply have to do without any name. Thirdly, the conception we adopt must be scientifically important and scientifically useful. Lastly and not least, unless an alteration be urgently demanded on some grounds of logic or appropriateness, the name of capital must be left to that conception 
for which it has been longest and most generally used. Or, to put it in a more roundabout way, as things are at present, everybody treats of the most weighty theoretical and social problems under the general names of problems of capital. That being so, the word capital, wherever possible, should be so used as to spare us the aggravated difficulties that will attend the greatest controverted questions of the day if we rebaptize their terms. In view of these rules, I would suggest the following as the most adequate solution of the controversy. Capital in general, we shall call a group of products which serve as means to the acquisition of goods. Under this general conception, we shall put that of social capital as narrower conception. Social capital we shall call a group of products which serve as means to the socio-economical acquisition of goods, or as this acquisition is only possible through production. We shall call it a group of products destined to serve towards further production, or, briefly, a group of intermediate products. Synonymous with the wider of the two conceptions, the term acquisitive capital may be very suitably used or less suitably but more in accordance with usage the term private capital. Social capital, again, the narrower of the two conceptions, may be well and concisely called productive capital. The following are my reasons for this classification. Capital in its wider sense and capital in its narrower sense both mark out categories which, economically, are of the highest importance. Products which serve to acquisitive ends possesses a preeminent importance for the theory of income as being the source of interest, while the intermediate products possesses at least as great an importance for the theory of production. The distinction between production from hand to mouth and production which employs roundabout and fruitful methods is so fundamental that it is eminently desirable that a special conception should be coined for the latter. This is done, if not, as we shall see, in the only possible way yet in a way that is not inappropriate, in grouping together, under the conception of capital, the intermediate products, which come into existence in the course of this roundabout production. Again, the solution suggested is the most conservative one, without laying any particular weight on the fact that the historical origin of the word capital indicates a relation to the acquisition or a gain, and that our reading remains true to this. It preserves the double relation the relation to acquisition of interest on the one side and to production on the other, which was imported into the conception of capital by Adam Smith, and since his time has been adopted into scientific usage. It is no inconsiderable advantage, then, that we do not require to create a majority in its favour by a revolution in terminology. The majority is already with us, and the conception may easily be carried unanimously if we add some new unbiased members. Here, too, it is worthy of particular attention that those writers who have occupied themselves professedly and most profoundly with investigation of the conception of capital and its problems have ended, almost without exception, by adopting exactly the same conception or at least one which comes very close to it. Connected with this is the further advantage that we avoid a puzzling change of the name for the two classes of problems which are both treated of now under the name of problems of capital. The popular name is retained, both for the factor of production and for the source of interest. And finally, it seems to me no small advantage that, notwithstanding, the material difference there is between capital, the factor of production, and capital, the source of interest. It is not necessary in our reading of it to make two conceptions of capital that are entirely foreign to one another, and have nothing more in common than cat has with category. Our two conceptions have just enough in common to allow of their being formally coupled under one common definition, and then distinguished as narrower and wider conceptions. True, their connections is not an intimate one, and in the light of what has been said, it cannot be so. It rests simply on the accidental circumstances that for society as a whole, which cannot acquire except through producing the goods which constitute the produced means of acquisition, coincide with the goods which constitute the produced means of production. It will be noted that I use the phrase social capital and not the common expression national capital. I do so for this reason, that for a limited community the means of acquisition embrace not only productive goods but consumption goods, 
lent to foreign countries. Those who hold by the consumption of national capital then must either take in the above-named consumption goods along with productive goods, thereby arriving at a very uninteresting conception indeed, or if they mean to confine it to productive goods only, they must build their national conception on a quite independent basis and break off all logical connection with the other conception, which would at any rate be a doubtful policy. Our social capital avoids both these difficulties. Chapter 5. The Competing Conceptions of Capital And now we may review the other conceptions of capital already mentioned and see if any of them can better satisfy scientific requirements. The conception which seems to me to come nearest to ours is that suggestive one which may be most concisely called the National Subsistence Fund and which very much coincides with Turgot's saved stocks of goods. This conception embraces all material goods with the exception of land. Later on, we shall have to make ourselves very accurately acquainted with it, and to avoid repetition, I refrain from going farther into it. I shall only say this much. The conception of the National Subsidence Fund is, like our own, a conception of a great scientific suggestiveness and is so regards those very problems which connect themselves with the word capital, in particular as being so much in touch with the phenomenon of capitalist production, production carried on in lengthy processes and roundabout methods. It is even more happy than our conception of the intermediate products. The latter, indeed, embraces all those goods which come into existence during the production process, the goods which carry it on and help to complete it but it does not embrace the initial fund of consumption goods needed to commence the process. It therefore leaves out the first link in the chain, which is a very important one, while the conception of the subsistence fund, as I understand it, embraces the entire group of goods by means of which the capitalist process is begun and carried through. Notwithstanding the importance of this conception in the theory of capital, I put it second to the other for the following reasons. First, on account of the difficulty of sharply dividing between those funds of subsistence which serve for acquisition and production, and those which stand outside of any relation to acquisition and consequently have nothing at all to do with the scientific problem of capital. Second, in any case, the conception of intermediate products is so conspicuously important that it is scarcely less worthy of being indicated and emphasized by the name of capital than is the conception of the National Subsidence Fund. Third, that as compared with the latter, the intermediate products appear to me to have in their favor the distinct and also the decisive advantage of being already familiar expressions. Capital, the factor of production, cannot again be left without a name, and for that reason the conception of National Subsidence Fund must come second. Next in importance comes Rocher's conception. It is due as much to the high scientific position of this writer as to the widely spread acceptance of his doctrine that we should go more fully into the definition he gives of capital. Unfortunately, I am bound to say that it seems to me anything but happy. In the form of it, Rocher appears to come very near to the same conception as lies at the basis of our definition, in claiming the designation capital for every product saved for further production. But in the very next lines, when enumerating the elements of a community's capital, he veers round to Turgot's conception and includes dwelling houses, utensils of personal service, and, in short, goods for immediate consumption. This vacillation is due to the fact that Rocher gives an unusually wide interpretation to the conception of product and means of production. He looks upon every satisfaction of a real want as the production of a personal good and this causes him to recognize everything that serves to the satisfaction of human want, that is, simply all goods, as means of production. Any unbiased person can see how unfortunate this is. Without due cause, it obliterates the very important opposition that exists between the production of goods which satisfy want and their consumption. A christens, for example, the idler as a zealous producer, always thinking how he may produce the personal goods of satiety, of ease, of contentment, and so on. It leads, moreover, to a lamentable waste of terminology. When the conception means of production is made synonymous with the conception good, 
there is no name left for the true instrument of production. But the latter, as a highly important economic category, must be kept prominent and distinct from goods for immediate consumption, and so we fall from one confusion and ambiguity of terminology into another. This shows itself most significantly in Roscher's own conception. He feels the sensible need of distinguishing inside his conception of capital those goods which serve to the production of material goods from those other goods which serve simply to the production of personal goods, and he does this by designating the former as productive capitals and the latter as use capitals. This expression is doubly unfortunate, first in putting use capitals in opposition to productive capitals. The capacity of being means of production is implicitly refused to use capitals, while they found admittance to the conception of capital only on the ground of this very capacity, as products saved for further production. And second, the same word productive is made to serve in the one breath as the predicate which binds together all capitals and as the predicate which divides capital into two. Could any terminology be more unfortunate? But Roscher's definition of capital is not only inappropriate, it is, in my opinion, logically unsound, inasmuch as it does not cover those things which Roscher means it to define. After he has christened all goods productive instruments, it might be thought that he would consider the totality of goods as capital, with the exception of land. Thus definition of products saved for further production, if the production of personal goods be included, seems to apply to them all. That, however, is not Roscher's meaning. From his enumeration of the elements of a community's capital, as well as from an expression used where he puts the use capital in opposition to objects of which are not capital, it follows that of consumption goods he will reckon as capital only those which are durable, such as houses, furniture, etc., and not those which are perishable with the exception of means of subsistence of productive laborers. He justifies this by saying, on the other hand, the sharp line of division between the use capital and those objects of consumption which are not capital rests in conformity with our definition of capital on the fact that the latter are not only more speedily consumed but are always meant to be consumed, whereas in the case of the former, the consumption is only the inevitable and the reverse side of use. These words cannot very well mean anything but that the speedy intentional consumption of goods is the direct opposite of saving, so that one characteristic demanded by Roscher's definition is not present in perishable consumption goods. Suppose this granted is the same defect, not inherent in the perishable raw materials and auxiliary materials of production, as in the means of subsidence of the productive laborers, which Roscher has expressly enumerated among the elements of the community's capital. Is not the coal at the forge, the gunpowder in the chase, and in blasting operations, the bread in the worker's mouth, quickly and intentionally consumed. It is either or, either speedy and intentional consumption is the opposite of saving and takes away from such goods the property of being capital. In which case, Roscher must also exclude the perishable raw and auxiliary materials of production and the maintenance of the producers or speedy consumption is not a ground of exclusion from the conception of capital, in which case the perishable means of production of personal goods cannot be refused admittance to the conception. Roscher's definition, therefore, fits either a wider or narrower circle of things, but never exactly that circle which he meant to define as capital. The conception of capital, most closely allied to this, insofar as it enumerates consumption goods along with acquisitive instruments, is that laid down by Keynes. It is based on an idea which, from the point of theory, is as interesting as it is important. All the same, I think that, on closer examination, it will not be preferred to ours. Keynes defines as capital that complex of goods available to a community which may be applied to the satisfaction of want in the future. This definition, as we can easily see, agrees almost word for word with that of another conspicuously important and fundamental conception. If we leave out the words in the future, it takes in all the goods of a community available for the satisfaction of want, and that is an amount which most writers are in the habit of calling the wealth of the community. If, like Keynes, we emphasize the fact 
that wealth embraces only the net amount of goods after the deduction of debts. We may perhaps call that amount the community's gross property. In any case, we have in this to deal with an independent amount bearing an independent name, with which capital neither coincides nor should coincide. Now from this amount, Canis would distinguish his conception of capital by adding the words in the future. Do these words really convey a distinction? In my opinion, they do not, at least, if we strictly give them the meaning they naturally have. It is an attribute of all wealth, without exception, that it is used for the satisfaction of wants in the future. All accumulation of wealth is based on provision for future requirements. Every atom of wealth in my possession at this moment has been acquired at a previous point in time with the view of being spent at a future point of time. That point of time may not be far away. It may perhaps be the next day or the next hour, but certainly it is still the future. If, therefore, we take the word future in its strict sense, Kinesis' formula has obviously defined not only capital, but wealth, and his conception of capital coincides with the ordinary conception of wealth. If Kinesis had actually contemplated this, it would not be difficult to pronounce upon his conception of capital. We should have to accuse him of waste of terminology. It would evidently be a highly inappropriate duplication of terms to use the word capital as a synonymous expression for the familiar conception which already bears the name of wealth, while other weighty conceptions as, for instance, certain groups of acquisitive instruments have no name. But Canese had no thought of any such identification. Indeed, he repeatedly and emphatically says that his conception embraces only a part of the total possession of goods, and he opposes to it. As the second member of his division, those goods that serve for the satisfaction of current present want. This classification obviously assumes that the word present is not to be taken altogether literally. For if by the present were to be understood strictly that point of time which divides the past from the future, the goods which entered into employment in that moment of time would, of course, represent so insignificant an amount that it would not be worthwhile to speak of them, to say nothing of basing a scientific classification and a new conception on their short lease of life. If the second member of Kinesis' classification is to be anything at all, the present must be extended from a point of time to a period of time, and this, naturally, can only be done at the expense of the future. By the present, we must understand a period of time which goes beyond the narrow limits of the fleeting moment, and takes in some part, large or small, of the immediate or near future. Now, while it would be pedantic to say that such a deviation from strict literal exactness, is inadmissible. It seems to me unfortunate if a scientific conception can only hold its own by allowing its most important, indeed its only characteristic feature, to be used in a loose sense. All the more so that Knies, in order to guard his conception of capital from merging into that of wealth, should have made the distinction between the present and future into a sharp opposition. It is not too much to say that his conception of capital lives by the opposition between present and future, and this opposition must lose its strength whenever, and so far as, goods devoted to the service of a near future. But all the same future find their place not on the side of capital devoted to the future, but on the other. But to look further, if we add a portion of the future to the present, how far is this addition to go? Is it to be the next hour or the next day? Is it to be a longer period, say the current month, or the economic year? This seems to me rather an important point to determine, but Canis himself has not said anything about it. If in his place we consider the different possibilities, it is easy to see that the addition of a short period, an hour or a day, does not secure the end contemplated. The amount of goods that a people consumes in a day is one three sixty fifth of its income, and is a much smaller fraction of its wealth. Now, very few people would think it appropriate to separate off a thousandth part of the total amount of goods which form the total wealth of a community in order to put the remaining 999 of a thousandth together under one independent conception, particularly when that thousandth part is not divided off from the principal sum 
by a clear and well-marked opposition, but only a conventional and somewhat metaphorical reading of the word present. To put it shortly, a conception of capital which embraces roughly 999 of one thousandth of the conception of wealth comes too close to the conception of wealth to have any scientific significance. But if we add a longer period of time, say a month, we encounter new difficulties. Owing to this altered reading, we shall now deduct from the conception of capital all goods that are destined to be consumed in the ordinary purposes of life during the current month. Good. But it is possible that I may make a profit out of these very goods previous to their consumption and without prejudice to it. For instance, a sum of money which I intend to dispose of finally on the 15th of the current month, I may lodge with a bank as an interest-bearing deposit, from the 1st to the 15th, against a deposit receipt, or I may put it into an open account. What then? Does this interest-bearing money belong to capital, or does it not? Whatever the answer, we do not avoid serious difficulties. If we answer it in the affirmative, we lay ourselves open to the charge of being illogical, for, by hypothesis, the whole of the current month is a widened present. But if we answer it in the negative, we first put ourselves in a position of flagrant contradiction with firmly established usage. Then we commit ourselves to the strange doctrine that a thing which undoubtedly bears interest is not capital. And finally, we give up what formed the strongest recommendation of Kinesis' conception, its purpose of reconciliation. This conception of capital has been put forward by Kinesis with the express intention of uniting under it as a higher and broader unity, all former and competing conceptions. In Turgot's Stocks of Goods and Adam Smith's Complex of Acquisitive Instruments and Herman's Goods of Durable Use, were to find ample room beside each other. But this mission of reconciliation, and with it raison d'etre of Kinesis' theory, disappears the moment that any one acquisitive instrument is denied recognition as capital, especially interest-bearing money the first parent of the conception. In whatever way, then, it is looked at, we get no clear satisfaction from Kinesis' conception. But to be just to Kines, I must recognize emphatically that there is a deep and significant idea at the root of it, and that if his conception fails of its end, it is only because of external defects, or, if I might say so, defects that belong to the technique of conception. As a fact, their destination to the service of the future is a peculiarly important characteristic of the goods we call capital. Indeed, a characteristic which gives us the key to the most important problems connected with the subject. Only it is not exactly the distinguishing character, but one that capital shares with several other classes of goods which we have good reasons for not reckoning as capital, and for that reason, but only for that reason, it is not fitted to act as a constitutive and distinctive feature on which to base our definition. The conceptions of capital hitherto mentioned are distinguished, as a whole, from our conception in that they include consumption goods as well as acquisitive instruments. We come now to certain conceptions that agree with ours in reserving the name of capital for a complex of acquisitive instruments, but differ from it and from each other as to what this complex includes. The widest of these would simply include the under capital, all acquisitive instruments, not only material but personal. Under different names it counts labor as capital. Many conceive of the work of the laborers as capital, others of his labor power, others, again, of the entire person of the laborer. In itself, of course, there is nothing in the world to prevent the totality of things which serve in acquisition from being grouped together under one uniting conception and called by one common name. This has already been done substantially in the conception and under the title of acquisitive instruments, or productive goods, or goods of higher rank. But it is an entirely different question whether one is justified in claiming the name of capital for such a conception. I should say, with all possible emphasis, that one is not. First of all, if the title is given to the totality of all acquisitive instruments, it can only be at the cost of refusing it to any narrower group of acquisitive instruments, which likewise claims it. Now the former conception is already sufficiently known by the above-mentioned name, while the narrower and rival conception is very important and has no other name but capital.
Even were the question, then, in other respects an entirely open one, we should, on the ground of economy of terms, decide against the use of the word capital for the totality of acquisitive instruments. But it is not an open question, it is already prejudiced by universal usage. In political economy and in practical life, generally, we have long been accustomed to treat of certain great social problems as problems of capital, and in doing so, we have had in our minds not a conception which embraced labor, but a conception that opposed capital to labor. Capital and labor, capitalism and socialism, interest on capital and wages of labor, are certainly not harmless synonyms. They express the strongest conceivable social and economical contrasts. Now what would be the consequence if people began all at once to call labor capital? In the most favorable circumstances, it would be an innovation in terminology with little to recommend it. If all the world were to adapt itself to the innovation and were to do so full consciousness that it was an innovation in terminology and nothing more, it might remain perfectly clear that in putting under one common name the real differences that separate labor from what has hitherto been called capital, these differences are not in the least reconciled. As before, everybody would notice these differences and work without bias at the social problem to which they give rise. Economic theory would not then suffer any material injury beyond the inconvenience of having no name for the chief object of such inquiries. For, of course, from the moment that labor is reckoned capital, we must cease to give the name of capital to its social opposite. This, I say, might be the result in the most favorable circumstances. Unfortunately, such a result is most unlikely. It is much more probable that the blending of the names would bring confusion into the matter. We need not deceive ourselves on this point. Names and catchwords always exert an immense influence over us. Most of us are very fond of slurring over inconvenient contradictions and smoothing down thorny problems. How could one resist the tempting opportunity which the new meaning of the word capital would offer? Between capital and labor, as these words were used formerly, there was discord, contrast, conflict. Now one single happy word unites all contrasts. What we thought opposites are really homogeneous. Labor is capital. Wage and interest are, at bottom, one. The reader will perhaps think it a mere jest to put such words in the mouth of serious thinkers. Economic literature, unfortunately, witnesses to the earnest of it, as we see in the case of those writers who conceived the unlucky idea of rebaptizing labor as capital. There is first McCulloch. He represents the laborer as a piece of fixed capital as a kind of machine, when he has thus torn down the partition wall between capital and labor, he immediately goes on to the logical conclusion and abolishes the distinction between interest and wage. To him, they are the homogeneous, but, and it is as significant as it is ridiculous, he does not very well know whether he should explain interest by wage or wage by interest. He gets out of the difficulty by explaining each by the other. He first sets forth at great length how interest is essentially nothing else than the wage for previously accumulated labor, and then he tries to make the nature of wage clearer by explaining it as a profit of capital. The common and ordinary rate of profit on his capital, exclusive of a sum to replace its wear and tear earned by the machine called man. It does not seem to have occurred to him that a seesaw like this does not really explain either of the phenomena. McCulloch's ill-digested doctrines have nearly fallen into well-deserved oblivion, but if I am not mistaken, we are threatened with the resurrection of them in changed form. Quite lately, we have had a number of views closely related to the foregoing, put forward with all that suddenness and abundance, which is at all times a sign that the idea is, so to speak, in the air, and promises to be fashionable. We are told almost simultaneously, in almost the same words, by Wes, by Dargan, and by Offner, that every laborer represents a capital equal to the cost of his upbringing, say a thousand dollars for the unskilled, or three thousand dollars for the skilled laborer. Or, on another method of valuation, we are taught that the laborer is equal to the capitalized net return of his year's labor. His wage, therefore, is peculiarly a kind of hire of capital and must, like every other hire, contain at least the three following elements. 
1. The replacement of the cost of the necessary upkeep of the human machine, calculated at the minimum of existence. 2. A quota for amortization and premiums of assurance against old age. And 3. A net interest calculated on the capital value of the human machine at the ordinary interest rate. All honor to the motives which have given rise to this theory. It is devised in the interest of the poor and for the reconciliation of all classes. Between the iron law of wages, which takes away all hope from the worker of earning anything but bare necessaries, and the socialist theory, which promises the laborers everything and the propertied classes nothing, it steers a middle course. It leaves the owner of material capital his hard contested interest, but would have him share it with the owner of personal capital. Thus the joint capitalism of the worker becomes on this theory the magic formula that is to be followed by the golden fruits of reconciliation and humanity. The pity is that only a formula, a parade of words, with no soul of truth in it. Very few people would deny that in certain points there is a real analogy between a worker, the cost of whose education and training in the production has been advanced to him, and a piece of capital. But how deep does this analogy go? On occasions when we wish to make use of it, in making comparisons that are really instructive, or when nothing depends on scientific exactitude, the analogy goes deep enough to permit of using a figure of speech and calling the laborer a capital, just as capital also is often spoken as figuratively as previous labor, or stored up labor, but the analogy does not hold right through, and in particular it fails as regards wage and interest. That capital yields a profit or gain rests on a quite peculiar ground, a ground that does not obtain in the case of laborer, or does so very exceptionally. I hope to establish this with perfect clearness when we come to the theory of interest, but this much I may say, meantime, that a man must have curiously shifted his point of view if he thinks to make the essential nature of his wage more intelligible by supporting it on the phenomenon of interest. Of the two phenomena, that of wage is by far the more simple and self-explanatory, one man gives the valuable good called labor, and another man gives him a price for it. Anything simpler cannot well be imagined, but the fact that capital yields an interest is much less easy to understand. Witness the many theories we had to discuss in capital and interest, none of which were able to state satisfactorily the essence of that phenomenon. To think of explaining the simple facts of wage by reading into them is much more involved in obscure facts of interest, is really to explain the church by the steeple. Moreover, the value of these forced interpretations receives a vivid illustration in the fact that, as we have seen, numerous writers are at the same time striving to get a better understanding of the nature of interest by expounding it as a peculiar kind of wage, where then the one sees the riddle, the other sees the solution. What an amount of vagueness as to the nature of the problems waiting solution is involuntarily betrayed in all this. To sum up, the conclusion of labor in the conception of capital would be, in the most favorable circumstances, inappropriate. In the more unfavorable, which unfortunately has been the real circumstances, it has been pernicious, calculated to perpetuate the confusion of terminology, to open door after door of false analogies, and to obscure and prevent clearness of thought in those very questions which are at once the most difficult and the most important in the social science of today. We shall therefore decide very emphatically, and I hope unanimously, to exclude personal means of acquisition from the conception of capital. The next stage of the controversy brings us to the question whether we are to give the name of capital only to the products of labor that serve for acquisition, the previous stored up labor, or are to include land. Both views claim for the name of capital a really important and fruitful conception. As contrasted with labor, land has so much in common with the produced acquisitive instruments of material nature that a union of them under one conception has good justification. So too, the income which flows from the two kinds of acquisitive instruments has, in many essential respects, the same nature, and this likewise favors the uniting of them in one conception. On the other hand, in many essential respects, land and capital take different ways. The former is immovable, 
the latter for the most part movable. The former is a gift of nature, the latter a result of labor. The former cannot be increased, the latter can be. The landowner has a social and economical position essentially different from that of the capitalist. Property in land is justified on essentially different grounds from property in movables. Land is the special object of a kind of production which is economically distinguished by many important peculiarities. Income from land, while subject to many laws in common with income from capital, obeys many distinct laws of its own. Land rent, for instance, rising with economical development, while interest falls. On all these considerations, the number of which might easily be increased, it is most convenient to keep land quite distinct from the other kinds of productive wealth. Thus, the two competing conceptions are fairly well balanced in importance and suggestiveness. And if these properties were the only things to look to in deciding our controversy, the decision might really be left very much to individual choice. If, however, we go on to compare the two in the light of other rules we have laid down as regulating appropriate terminology, we find several points in which the complex of produced acquisitive instruments has a definite advantage over its competitor. The first is that of economy of terms. If we apply the word capital to all the material means of acquisition, then the narrower of the competing conceptions and the branch of income that corresponds to it remain notwithstanding their importance, without any name at all. When we have disposed of the words capital and rent of capital otherwise, we have no correspondingly simple name, either for the group of produced acquisitive instruments or for the income that comes from them. On the other hand, we avoid any such confusion of terminology by giving the name capital to the produced acquisitive instruments. The totality of all material acquisitive instruments may then, well and simple, be called acquisitive wealth, and all income flowing from it may, on Rod Burtis's precedent, be called rent with its convenient subdivisions of land rent and capital rent. The limitation of capital to produced means of acquisition has another advantage in being in accord with popular usage. Both scientific and popular language tell us unmistakably that they do not put land under capital but oppose the two. The genius of our language plainly distinguishes between landowner and capitalist. No one will say that a nation that has an abundance of fruitful soil is possessed of great capital on that account. The name of interest is never applied by people generally to the income from land, and in scientific literature it is so applied only by an insignificant minority. And in the discussion of the great social problems Property in land and property in capital are generally attacked and defended by quite distinct people and by quite distinct methods. If we sum up all that has been said, the conclusion seems to be that while, for reasons repeatedly given, there can be no idea of an absolutely convincing argument, there is still a considerable balance in favor of defining capital as the produced means of acquisition and against the inclusion of land. Finally, such conceptions as would limit capital still more severely may, I think, be easily and decidedly refuted. Kleinwachter would distinguish between the materials and the tools of production, and reckon only the latter as capital, on the ground that in production it is only the tools that actively cooperate and assist us, the materials of production being purely passive. But this assumption is not correct. The function of materials of production is not simply to serve as a dead and plastic mass. By means of the natural powers residing in them, these materials take a share in the work of production, which is, indeed, less prominent, but is essentially no less active. Kleinwachter's view is by his own confession incorrect from the point of physical science, and as we have here to do with a question of productive technique, where political economy must take its stand on natural science, it is incorrect from the point of economics. Marx, again, would confine the conception of capital to those productive instruments which are to be found in the hands of persons other than the laborers themselves, and are used to exploit the laborers. With him, therefore, capital is the same thing as means of exploitation. This distinction would be quite an important and suggestive one if the exploitation theory itself were correct. But since, as has been shown in my former work, it is not the justification of the distinction 
based on that theory, falls within. Jevons's notion of capital is that of the aggregate of those commodities which are required for sustaining laborers of any kind or class engaged in work. The wages of labor, either in its transitory form of money, or its real form of food and other necessaries of life. If this were correct, every land would be rich in capital and proportion as its wages were high and its means of subsistence cheap. An African tribe that has neither industry nor machinery nor factories nor railways, but lives under the tropical sun where the necessaries of life are poured forth without stint, would be the richest in capital. Obviously, of course, the idea that Jevons had in his mind was a perfectly correct one, but the expression he gave it was unfortunate. He confused a condition of the formation of capital with capital itself. The way of capitalist production is long and roundabout, and man cannot enter upon it unless he is provided with the means of subsistence for the time that must intervene before he reaps the return. But it is not the means of subsistence, and, in particular, it is not the means of subsistence alone that constitutes capital. Capital only comes into existence when man actually enters upon the profitable roundabout journey that the means of subsistence have made possible. When he builds machines, tools, railways, factories, raises raw materials, and so on. However abundant the means of subsistence were, if the workers were to consume them in living from hand to mouth, the community would evidently never accumulate capital at all. Finally, there remain those conceptions which see in capital not a complex of goods, but an abstract quantity hovering over goods as it were as, for instance, Cunnist's sum of value, or Emily's circulating power. I have, generally speaking, a very poor opinion of the idealizations of economic conceptions. They are usually cheap expedients for getting round difficulties. If in any difficult subject, there occurs some troublesome angular kind of conception that corresponds with real life and will not fit to the particular line of explanation. There are always certain theorists ready to disembody it, whereby, of course, it loses its unmannerly angles and edges, but at the same time its strength and truth. It becomes a phrase and leads to phrases. We have an instance of this here. If we were to take the sponsors of those definitions at their word, and asked them whether they would seriously say that an immaterial sum of value or circulating power can grind corn, or spin yarn, or plough of land, or carry a load, or whether it is not the case that these goods are done by the common material goods, called mills, looms, ploughs, locomotives, they would be very much perplexed. For asking at their own consciousness, they could scarcely deny that under the name of capital, they have always and peculiarly thought of that something which helps man to work in his production. And the rude materiality of this sometimes agrees, but ill with the high-sounding abstract definitions of sum of value or circulating power. It is very significant, as regards this group of definitions of capital, that their origin may be traced to a slipshod expression of a writer who was always too careless about the way in which he stated his conceptions. J.B. Say Say first, and quite correctly, gives the name of capital to certain results of labor that serves as tools to further production, such as seed, dye stuff, wool, tools, machines, buildings, cattle, etc., and calls their total value capital value. Later on, he makes the remark that a capital value may take very different forms, such as money, houses, utensils, commodities, etc., and gives him occasion to call this value a capital so soon as it is contained in objects, whatever they be, which are destined to productive activity. Evidently, a careless and contradictory expression, which, however, his economic disciples made the basis of a serious theory. Thus, of all many readings of the conception of capital, there is only one left on the field, only one, of which it can be said that it stood all the tests. It is that which, by capital, understands an aggregate of products destined, not for immediate consumption or use, but to serve as means of acquisition. It is a conception which meets all our logical and terminological requirements. Logically, it is unassailable and it is suggestive, so suggestive that it distances the most of its competitors 
and is distanced by none of them, and terminologically its investiture with the title of capital best economizes our terms and agrees with that usage which has taken most general and firm root in economics and in popular speech. Finally, it is the conception which most exactly coincides with the object of those great social problems of our time, which people are in the habit of discussing as problems of capital. In its one division as social capital, it indicates the third instrument of economical production in the triad of nature, labor, and capital. And in its other division as private capital, it indicates the third source of the economical acquisition of goods by individuals in the triad rent of land, wage of labor, interest on capital. If then unbiased people were to ever agree on a conception of capital, we may expect that this will be the one chosen. Chapter 6. Social and Private Capital A few remarks still remain to be made on the relation in which the two divisions of our conception, social or productive capital, and private or acquisitive capital, stand to one another. When enumerating and reviewing the various theories, I have already expressed my views, generally, on this point, and may here shortly sum them up. Private capital, as we now call it, is the parent conception. It is not so much a branch or a subdivision of general conception of capital as a conception itself. The conception of national capital, or, more correctly, social capital, has attached itself from the other in the historical development of theory, as a narrower conception. Substantially, it is a quite independent conception, in every essential respect, in definition, in scientific employment, and in scope, it stands on entirely independent principles. It is bound up with the conception of private capital only by the external subordinate circumstance, that the aggregate of its intermediate products happens to coincide in extent with the aggregate of those products, which are the source of income to society as a whole. Those products which constitute capital in the older sense. But through a historical accident, it is this subordinate feature that has had most to do with the naming of the new conception, and thus it also bears, and will perhaps continue to bear, the name capital. And this circumstance, so long as the whole relation was not clearly understood, led to the lamentable tangle so often spoken that not only the conceptions themselves, thus similarly named, but the fundamentally distinct problems connecting with them were confused and interchanged. This unfortunate confusion of the problems was first attacked, so far as I know, by Rod Burtis, and his efforts were seconded with peculiar clearness by Adolf Wagner. In the course of this new interpretation was given to the distinction between national and private capital, which is highly interesting in itself, and which at the same time has been accepted so quickly over so wide an area that I feel bound to take up a definite position towards it. Wagner, like Rod Burtis before him, makes a distinction between capital as a purely economic category and capital in the historical legal sense, or property in capital. Capital as a purely economic category, considered apart from the legal relations which obtain as regards property in capital, is a store of those economic goods, natural goods, which serve as technical instruments to produce new goods to a community. It is a store of productive instruments. It is a national capital or a portion of such. Capital in the historical legal sense, or property in capital, is that portion of a person's wealth which may serve him as a means of obtaining income, rent, interest, and which, therefore, is owned by him to this end. It is a rent fund or private capital. In this, the distinction between national capital and private capital is narrowed down to the distinction between a natural store of goods on the one hand and the legal rights which private individuals have over that natural store on the other. I am far from denying the very great importance and usefulness of this new distinction. Its appearance was an event of the first rank in economic criticism, and it has done good and laudable service in clearly stating the fundamentally distinct problems associated with the one name of capital. Without it, certainly, the far-reaching consequences of the other distinction that between social and private capital would never have been noticed. One thing, however, I cannot allow, it does not exhaust the meaning of this latter distinction, and consequently it is not exactly fitted to take its place. 
the categories of social capital and private capital on the one hand, and of natural capital and property in capital on the other, do not coincide, either in compass or in content, so as to allow us simply to explain or replace the former by the latter. They are rather independent categories, each of them resting on a different basis of distinction. Social capital and private capital are not distinguished from each other simply as a natural store of goods and property in these goods. They represent two distinct natural stores of goods. Social capital embraces only the means of production. Private capital embraces also certain consumption goods. These distinct natural quantities or stores of goods further exert distinct economic functions. And if to these we add the further distinction that social capital is a category independent of any regulations of positive law, is, that is to say, a purely economic category, while all capital as source of income presupposes an owner, and therefore a right of ownership founded on history and law, then this is only one distinction out of many, and that not a peculiar and essential distinction. For if we were to drop the two former distinctions and draw our dividing line according to the absence or presence of historical legal claims of ownership, we should find the division has made some very considerable changes in the constitution of the members. In the first branch, indeed, we should have, as before, social capital, the natural means of production. But in the second branch, we should have only the same means of production now looked at as private property and as source of rent. And we should not have those consumption goods, such as dwelling houses, libraries, etc., which serve as sources of rent. To cover these latter, and so fill out the compass of private capital to its true extent, we must set against the natural means of production not only private claims based on history and law, but also another natural store of goods that is still more extensive. Perhaps the peculiar inappropriateness of confusing these two distinctions may be most strikingly known by taking an exact analogous example. If one were asked to characterize the distinction between the two conceptions producing and exchanging, and were to answer that production is a purely economic category, whilst exchange as presupposing the existence of private property is a historical legal phenomenon, the answer would scarcely be taken as sufficient. We should certainly have the impression that it gave us a distinction, but not the distinction between producing and exchanging, for the essence of exchanging obviously does not consist in its being a historical legal category. It is also a very important economic category, indeed it is just such another as producing, and one who would explain both conceptions must, at once and before anything else, establish the distinction between the economic nature of the two, and similarly, in this opposition, be purely economic and historical legal categories. A distinction is put forward, and a very important distinction, but not the characteristic distinction between social and private capital. Let me say once more that I consider the distinction made by Rodbertus and Wagner between natural capital and property in capital a very important one indeed, and one which, in any case, must also be drawn. What I want to point out is that it should not be confused with the distinction between social and private capital, which rests on an entirely different basis, and the definition of social and private capital should not be based on characteristics borrowed from one another and totally different distinction. The example of Rodbertus himself is the best proof that this is not simply a quarrel of both formulas. His one-sided conception led him directly into a false theory of interest. In his view, the essence of private capital consisted in historical legal circumstances of force that were connected with it, and he was thus logically committed to explain the interest on private capital, simply and solely from the existence of those circumstances. Interest to him was robbery, a profit which the owners of capital squeezed out of the laborers in virtue of the brute strength which their exclusive property in the means of production gave them. If, on the other hand, Rod Burtis had attended a peculiarly economic side of the matter, he would have found that the other natural complex of goods, called private capital, has exerted and continues to exert a peculiar economic function, quite equally with social capital. And further, he would have found that it is simply as the natural fruit of this economical element that interest originates. Thus he would have found that interest is not purely a growth of history and law, but an original economic growth, the emergence of which is, to a certain extent, independent of the form which history and law have given it.
This will be shown with sufficient clearness, I trust, in the investigations into the origin of interest which follow. Before concluding this chapter, there is still one question to be put. What in the concrete are the groups of goods that constitute social capital and what private capital? The answer to this should, by rights, follow from the very definition of the two conceptions, but peculiar circumstances have led to disputes, not only as to the correct definition, but even as to the compass which was allowed to each conception in conformity with the accepted definition. It is well, therefore, to be quite clear on this point. Social capital as an aggregate of products destined to serve for further production covers 1. Productive improvements, arrangements, and dispositions of land, so far as these preserve an independent character such as dams, drains, fences, etc. So far, however, as they are completely incorporated with the land, they are to be kept separate from capital for the same reasons which made us keep land itself separate from capital. 2. Productive buildings of all sorts, workshops, factories, sheds, steadings, shops, streets, railways, and so on. Dwelling houses, however, and other kinds of buildings, such as serve immediately for any purpose of enjoyment or education or culture, like theatres, schools, churches, law courts, do not come under capital. 3. Tools, machines, and other kinds of productive utensils. 4. Useful animals and beasts of burden employed in production. 5. The raw and auxiliary materials of production. 6. Finished consumption goods in the hands of producers and merchants as warehouse stock. And 7. Money. At the first glance at the two categories may be called in question. Consumption goods found in warehouses are, to all appearance, no longer intermediate products, but finished goods, and money is not a tool of production, but a tool of exchange. Still, I think it correct to put both conceptions under capital. They serve both to complete a roundabout way of production. When, in order to take advantage of more favorable conditions, goods are produced or caused to be produced at a different place from where they are demanded, it is nothing else than a peculiar kind of roundabout process. The consequence then is, and it is here, that the roundaboutness, which is to be understood literally in this case, comes in that, after the product is technically finished, it must be conveyed to the place where it is demanded. All this is done very often inside the narrow limits of an isolated economy. The peasant must bring his harvested grain from the field, his felled wood from the forest, but it is done on an immensely greater scale in the wider field of social production and divided labor. Just as the peasant may raise his crop a quarter of an hour distance from his house, or cut his wood an hour's distance off, because in this way he can best utilize the conditions of production, so for good reasons it is quite common in organized and divided industry to obtain the objects of our demand from other people's workshops, indeed often from other places, other lands, other continents, and then naturally, in the end we have to provide their means of conveyance. In the one case, as in the other, the conveyance forms the last act of production, and before this last act is finished, we cannot properly say that the products are ready for human consumption. So just as everybody would include, among instruments of production and capital, the horse and cart which assist the peasant in carrying his grain and wood, must we reckon as capital the objects and apparatus of that more extensive leading in of the national harvest, the conveyed products, the streets, rails, ships, and the commercial tool money. It may be noted, besides, that those commercial roundabout ways arising out of the division and organization of labor rank as regard the advantage they confer, along with the other technical roundabout ways. They are as profitable as, or even more profitable than, any of the capitalist methods of production to which the most famous technical inventions have led. These seven categories exhaust, in my opinion, the group of things, which constitutes social capital. It goes without saying that economists who take another view of the conception of capital add other categories, such as land, durable consumption goods, the person of the laborer, and so on, and this needs no further elucidation here. It is surprising, however, to find writers who take exactly the same view of the conception as we do, proposing to add certain other categories. Most surprising of all in this connection is the unanimity which the economists from the earlier English writers down to Adolf Wagner put the maintenance of the productive laborers under social capital. Certainly the real wages of the laborers 
the articles of food, clothing, fuel, lighting, etc., which the laborers use, are from the standpoint of the undertaker, who advances them his private capital. But it is just as clear, in my opinion, that, from the standpoint of the whole community, these objects cannot be counted as capital, if capital is defined as a complex of means of production. The conception of means of production should and does form an antithesis to the conception of means of consumption. There cannot be the slightest doubt as to the meaning of this antithesis, and just as little can there be as to the fact that the workers' subsidence in the immediate instrument to the satisfaction of their wants, and that laborers are men and members of society. But if this is so, it seems to me absolutely proved that the maintenance of the laborer must be classed along with wealth destined for consumption and for the immediate satisfaction of the wants of society, and not with the means of production or capital. It could only be otherwise if the laborers were to be looked upon not as members of the civil society in whose interest industry and commerce are carried on, but as material machines of labor. Then, but only then, the maintenance of the laborers would, as a matter of course, fall under the same category as the feeding of beasts of burden and the stoking of furnaces. It would be a means of production or capital. The idea, however, scarcely needs refutation. It may be pointed out, however, that productive laborers are not simply consuming subjects, but are also active economical instruments, and that, consequently, the subsidence, which does not directly serve for the maintenance and furtherance of their life indirectly serves towards the further production of goods. But in this case, a simple indirect relation to production is not sufficient, for it is easy to see that the distinction between means of production and means of consumption has a meaning only if it refers to the immediate destination of goods. If we were to take notice of their indirect or immediate destination, we should require to put all goods, without exception, under the category of means of consumption, since even the means of production serve indirectly to the satisfaction of human wants. Then this raises another difficulty. The division of goods into goods for consumption and goods for production is intended to be a real division. It should be based on an opposition. Now it is impossible to deny the food which the laborer consumes serves for the immediate satisfaction of the wants of a member of the community. That is, it corresponds entirely to the definition of a consumption good. How then could we class a thing which has all the properties of one category under the category opposed to it? Thus, as is so often the case, the labored explanation leads us into a net of confusion, and the simplest is the truest. The goods with which the working members of the community feed, heat, and clothe themselves are goods for immediate consumption, not means of production. That, in face of arguments so obvious, the opposed doctrine should be held so universally and so tenaciously is a phenomenon scarcely intelligible at first sight, but easily explained when we inquire more closely into the circumstances of the case. Two powerful factors, I think, cooperated towards it. One was historical tradition, which in this case was very strong and deep rooted. It should not be forgotten that the inclusion of the laborer's maintenance into the conception of capital came at a time when the conception itself was not yet clearly defined, and when, in particular, private capital to which the laborer's maintenance in any case belongs was not yet sharply divided from the social capital to which it does not belong. This was assisted by the peculiar view dominant for a long time that the function of capital was the putting of labor in motion, a function which the laborer's maintenance conspicuously realized. It was assisted, moreover, by the famous wage fund theory. That theory made the rate of wages depend chiefly on the proportion between the number of laborers and the amount of the wage fund, that is, the amount of capital destined for the support and payment of the laborers, an idea which helped to connect more means of subsistence still more closely with the conception of capital. And finally, another impulse in the same direction may have been given by the frequently and justly criticized tendency of the English school to look upon the laborer as a machine of production and to consider his wage simply as an element of the costs of production, a deduction from the national income and not part of it. Resting on such a wide basis of support, the proposition that the maintenance of productive laborers forms an element in social capital worked 
its way by degrees so firmly to the scientific consciousness that it was considered by many as an axiom quite above discussion, and in the end it was able to maintain its position on the strength of its own authority, even after the ground had really been taken from under it by the discovery of the distinction between private and social capital, and by the definition of the latter as an aggregate of means of production. The second factor has had even more effect than the weight of historical tradition, and not only has it cooperated in the past in the creation of these traditions, but it still asserts the living influence. That factor was, if I am not very much mistaken, the conscious or unconscious inclination towards another, reading of the conception of capital than that recognized in what we may call the official definition. Economists have stood and still stand in hesitation between those two conceptions which have the most numerous and suggestive relations to the problem of capital, the conception of produced means of production and the conception of national subsidence fund. In the official definition, it is true, the preference was finally given to the produced means of production, but economists quite rightly feeling that the national subsidence fund has also something to do with the theory of capital, could not quite give up this conception. And thus they put together a hybrid conception, adding to the means of production proper, which had the stamp of the official definition, a portion of the subsidence fund conception in the maintenance of productive laborers. Of course, a classification like this, which is nothing else than the result of uncertainty and compromise, cannot be satisfactory. Economic theory must make decisive choice between the two competing conceptions, and, however, the choice turns out the conception will be limited and determined otherwise than it is by the writers now being criticized. Either we shall decide for that conception which makes capital an aggregate of intermediate products, and this choice, for reasons of appropriate terminology already stated, I consider the happier one, and in this case the laborer's maintenance falls outside the conception or we shall give the name capital to the subsidence fund, which makes the roundabout way of production possible. And then, as will be shown later, not only must the means of subsidence of the productive laborers be reckoned as capital, but also the subsidence of the capitalist and landowners, in standing in exactly the same indirect relation to the adoption of capitalist methods of production. If all this cannot justify it may at least explain the phenomenon otherwise most incomprehensible that, in flat contradiction to the official definition of capital, people continue to add to it the maintenance of the laborers, and perhaps the exposure of this origin may help to put an end to the curious habit. Another category which seems to me wrongly placed among the constituents of social capital is the so-called incorporeal capitals, such as debt and other kinds of claims, goodwill of businesses, the state, etc. These things are not capital, because they are not real goods. They are, as I have shown at length in another place, nothing but representative words or collective names for a sum of real goods, which may be capital or may not. If they are, then they are already contained in our seven categories. If they are not, we should not, of course, open a special category for them. Finally, private capital consists of the following. 1. All goods which form social capital, and 2. Those consumption goods which their owners do not use for themselves, but employ by exchange in the acquisition of other goods, such as lead houses, lending libraries, means of subsistence advanced by undertakers to their laborers, and many others. Many writers add certain relations patents, trade connection, legal claims, these, of course, on the same grounds of theory as above, I must reject as constituting an independent category of capital. And now, after this very lengthy introduction, which can only be excused by a singular confusion in which we found the theory, we may turn from the conceptions to the problems which are associated with them. In the book which follows, we shall work out the theory of the conception we have had to glance at in the two first chapters of the present book, the theory of capital as instrument of production or the theory of social capital. Book 2. Capital as Instrument of Production Chapter 1. Introductory In expounding the theory of capital as instrument or tool or means of production, we have to describe and explain the emergence and effects of capital in the economic production of goods. 
what we have to say on this matter groups itself into two questions. How does capital originate? And what is the nature of its productive work? The first question has to do with the theory of the formation or accumulation of capital. The second with the productive function of capital. The reader who has waded with us through the dozen theories and dozen definitions of capital will scarcely be surprised at meeting a similar divergence of opinion on the question we have now to consider. Of course, there is no dispute about the fact that capital is, in the highest degree, useful to production. But I am much afraid that this is the only proposition on which our economists are quite agreed. So soon as the further question is asked, in what does this usefulness consist, or what character does the cooperation of capital in itself bear? Agreement is at an end. One finds the utility of capital in putting labor in motion, another in saving or supplanting labor, a third in performing labor, a fourth praises it, giving man the mastery over the powers of nature, and a fifth as enabling the laborer to put an interval between the beginning and the end of an enterprise. Some, like Lauderdale, see in it an independent original factor of production, along with the land and labor. Others, like Jeed, call it an independent but still merely derivative factor. Kleinwachter looks on it simply as a condition. Carry again as an instrument or tool of production. Indeed, our theorists cannot even agree as to the way in which that useful auxiliary of production comes into existence. If we ask the question concretely, how is a plane or a plow or a steam engine made, they would probably be able, with perfect certainty, to give minute information as to how those concrete portions of capital come into existence. But whenever they have to generalize what they have observed, they divide into hostile camps. Capital originates in saving, says one. No, says another, it must be produced, while a third proclaims that it originates in the two together. It is a much greater cause for wonder that economists came to no agreement in these and similar questions than they remained apart in their theories of interest. The task here was quite different and essentially easier. In the interest theory, the difficulty is to give the proper explanation of facts which are really much entangled, while here there is almost nothing to do but to describe the facts correctly, and facts, moreover, with which everybody is quite familiar. As we have said, everyone knows how a plane or steam engine comes into existence. Similarly, everyone has a sufficiently exact idea what and how a plane, a machine, a plow, a raw material does in production. It was only necessary to leave out everything peculiar in those cases and to describe in appropriate words everything universal and typical in them, and the theory of the formation and function of capital would almost have been written. The reason why economists fail in this simple task was that they did not allow the fact to speak for themselves. Instead of simply describing them, as they were explanations, were read into them and added to them. One feature was pushed into the foreground, another kept in the background, a third was quite overlooked, while perhaps a fourth was entirely absent, but was read into them. When every man had thus imported his own particular views bodily into the facts, it was, of course, no wonder that everybody got something different out of them. To my mind, the most important duty of the theorist in such a case is to avoid the faults we have just condemned. To make certain of this, we shall make a clear distinction, even in outward form, between the statement of the facts and the interpretation of them. The next chapter, therefore, will delineate and describe the process of capitalist production when a solid basis of fact has thus been obtained. The interpretation and construction will follow in the chapters on the productive function of capital and on the theory of the formation of capital. Chapter 2. Capitalist Production We have already sketched in its most general outlines the process of capitalist production. There are certain features of it which now require more exact treatment. I shall briefly recapitulate, interpolating what remains to be said as we go along. All human production aims at the obtaining of goods for consumption. These consumption goods are dependent for their existence on physical conditions and are subject to natural laws. To obtain them, as we have seen, we must seek to bring about such combinations of active forces as will result in the desired object. 
Thus we get a product which has come into existence under natural law and continues to exist under natural law. Now look a little more closely at the nature of the power which man can employ towards these productive combinations. It is made up of two components very dissimilar in amount. First, an enormous mass of powers which the natural world exerts spontaneously year out, year in. And second, the much more limited natural powers which reside in the human organism. The natural world in midst of which man lives is endowed with a vast number of forces which are never for a moment idle. Gravitation holds this ball of earth together, keeps all things fast to its surface, makes the rain fall to earth, and rolls streams and rivers to the sea, governs the ebb and flood of the tides, works unceasingly at every point of the earth's crust as stress, weight, pressure. The sun sends our earth light and heat, and thereby develops an infinity of mechanical and chemical processes of which vegetation particularly attracts our attention, both by its mysterious magic and by its enormous importance for the human race. Uncounted and countless again, there are molecular, electric, and chemical effects and counter-effects which every atom of matter exerts without intermission on its neighbors. The total of those energies which nature pours forth in ceaseless stream without help from man we may look upon as one branch of the productive endowment of humanity, and this extremely valuable branch we shall call man's natural endowment. It is in an infinite treasure house from which the producing man may draw as much as he will and can, as yet it is only the very smallest part of this treasure that has been touched, as yet by the far greater portion of the energies of nature pass away in combinations which, from the human teleological standpoint, seem useless or even harmful. The resistless rise and fall of the tide, the rush of rivers and waterfalls, the atmospheric movements, the giant forces of electricity, magnetism and gravitation slumbering on our earth, are powers turned to human account only to a very small extent. Others again, such as the vegetative powers of land, have been utilized to a greater, but still very far from complete extent. The steady advancement in agricultural science not only leads us to expect a constantly increasing amount of utility from the land, but makes us suspect that the possibility of such advance is still far from being exhausted. Now, as we have seen, the way in which we get command of these natural treasures is through the other branch of our productive endowment, our own personal powers. We put forth our labor in all kinds of wise combinations with natural processes. Thus, all that we get in production is the result of two and only two elementary productive powers, nature and labor. This is one of the most certain ideas in the theory of production. Man finds ready to hand an abundance of natural processes and allies his own powers with them. What nature by herself does and what man does along with her, these form the double source from which all our goods come and the only source from which they can come. There is no place for any third primary source. These two elements, then, technically do everything in the work of production, but economically a further and very suggestive limitation must be drawn of the vast natural endowment which serves as foundation for man's productive combinations. One portion particularly claims the interest of economics, and that is those useful things offered by nature only a limited amount. In nature, indeed, there is no lack either of materials or powers, carbon and nitrogen, oxygen and hydrogen, generally speaking. Most of the elements are, per se, not more scarce than our electrical, magnetic, chemical, and gravitation forces, but certain spontaneous combinations of these elements that are peculiarly well adapted to human want may be relatively scarce, such, for example, as useful plants and minerals, water for driving power, fertile land, etc. These limited gifts and energies of the natural world obtain for us a peculiar economic importance. It would be foolish not to economize them. Technical elements of production, which we may have in any quantity, like atmospheric air or water or sunlight, we may employ or waste as we please without suffering loss in our productive returns. 
but the limited technical elements must be treated with consideration, must be saved, must be fully utilized. In a word, within the technical natural endowment, as a wider circle, they form a specifically economic natural endowment of man, since all, or at least almost all, limited sifts and energies of nature are connected with land. We may, without much danger, take land with its activities or uses as the representative of this economic natural endowment. To the uses of land, the exertions of labor form the counterpart. Labor has almost entirely an economical character. This is due partly to the fact that physical strength is given us in such scanty measure as compared with the very extensive claims put forward by human needs, that even the most assiduous exertions of labor power cannot fully satisfy our desire for goods, not to speak of supplying them in superfluity, partly to the fact that the exercise of our powers is usually attended by the painful feeling of distress and fatigue, at least when carried beyond a certain point, and the feeling warns us to economize our labor. Nature and labor are, then, the technical elements of production. Uses of land and labor are the economic elements. These latter are the talents which the producing man puts out at usury with nature, with their great fruitful soil and infinite store of force. They are the only powers that require economic treatment, inasmuch as the cooperation of the free natural powers, which technically is also indispensable, is given without question and without cost. It is only the man who has command over the requisite uses of land and services of labor, who receives the desired economic product. The man who has not these much do without the product. The man who owns a double allowance or half allowance of them will, if the technique of production remains the same, receive double or half the product. In production, therefore, they are the only powers with which the economic community has any concern and with which it has to reckon. In short, land and labor, or more accurately, uses of land and services of labor, are the primary economic productive powers. Now, in what way does man use these original productive powers? In answering this question, we turn back for a little into familiar paths. To construct goods for human consumption out of these productive elements, man may take one of two ways. He may combine the economical productive powers with one another or with activities of free natural powers, in such a way that the desired good immediately emerges as a result of the culmination, as when he gathers shellfish on the shoreline, or he may take a roundabout way, and with the element at his command, may make first another good, and then with its assistance, the good he wishes, as for instance, when he makes a boat and net and takes to fishing systematically. We already know that the former method is identical with what the Germans call capitalist production, the latter with capitalist production, and that the intermediate products which come into existence in the course of the indirect methods represent economic social capital. The adoption of capitalist methods of production is followed by two consequences, equally characteristic and significant. One is an advantage, the other a disadvantage. The advantage we have already looked at it consists in the greater technical productiveness of those methods, with an equal expenditure of primary productive powers, that is to say labor and valuable natural powers, more or better goods can be produced by a wisely chosen capitalist process than could be by directed unassisted production. This proposition, which is quite convincingly accredited by daily experience, we illustrated and tried to explain in the second chapter of Book 1, by a number of examples. We found the explanation to be that, when roundabout methods are skillfully chosen, new allies are obtained from the immense stores of natural powers, and their activity is enlisted in the work of production. It is this well-known fact that is usually indicated by the term productivity of capital. This name, however, imports into the fact a particular interpretation, the correctness of which has yet to be examined in the next chapter. The disadvantage connected with the capitalist method of production is its sacrifice of time. The roundabout ways of capital are fruitful but long. They procure us more or better consumption goods, but only at a later period of time. 
This proposition, no less than the former, is one of the ground pillars of the theory of capital. We shall see later on that the very function of capital as a means of appropriation or source of interest to a great extent rests upon it. I must, therefore, guard it against any misunderstanding by the two following remarks. In the first place, it may very well happen, in an exceptional case, that an indirect method of production is not only better, but speedier. A man wishing to gather apples from a high tree will evidently attain his purpose sooner, first by cutting a stick down from another tree and using it to knock down the apples, than by climbing the tree and trying to break off the apples one by one with his hands. But this is not the rule. In the overwhelming majority of cases, we must tread the roundabout ways of capitalist production under technical conditions of such a nature that we have to wait, and often for a very long time, before we get the ripe final product. Instead of giving examples which must occur of themselves to every reader, I would rather draw attention to the fact that in the loss of time which is, as a rule, bound up with the capitalist process, lies the sole ground of that much talked of and much deplored dependence of laborer on capitalist. If capitalist production led as quickly from the hand to the mouth as unskilled direct production does, there would be nothing to hinder the workers carrying on such roundabout methods from beginning to end on their own account. They would still be dependent on the landowners, who could prevent them from access to the land which at the outset they require, but they would not be dependent on the capitalists. It is only because the laborers cannot wait till the roundabout process, which begins with the obtaining of raw materials and making of tools, delivers up its products ready for consumption, that they become economically dependent on the capitalists who will already hold in their possession what we have called intermediate products. Again, though this scarcely needs pointing out, when we speak of capitalist production taking time, it is not relevant to raise the objection that with a piece of concrete capital once made, say a tool, a definite product can be made more quickly than it could be without the assistance of capital. That, for instance, a tailor takes three days to sew a coat by hand, and one day to do it with a sewing machine. For it is clear that the sewing machine forms only one part, and indeed the smaller part, of the capitalist process. The principal part falls to the making of the sewing machine, and the total process lasts considerably longer than three days. Thus far, we have considered capitalist production as an undivided whole, and have contrasted it with production carried on entirely without capital. But here we are reminded of a fact that has to be reckoned with, which is that in capitalist production there are stages and degrees. To speak accurately, there are innumerable degrees of capitalism. In the making of a consumption good, the possible roundabout methods are of very varying length. We may make intermediate products, from which the final good will be obtained in a month or a year, or ten years, or a hundred years. The question now is, what influence such differences of degree have on product? On the whole, it may be said that not only are the first steps more productive, but that every lengthening of the roundabout process is accompanied by a further increase in the technical result. As the process, however, is lengthened, the amount of product as a rule increases in a smaller proportion. This proposition also is based on experience and only on experience. What it says must be simply taken as a fact of technique of production. The reader, moreover, will easily be able to check its accuracy if he follows in thought the steps which lead to the production of any consumption good. For instance, firewood can be got quite directly so long as we limit ourselves to the gathering of dry branches or breaking off weak twigs. We take a short roundabout path in making and using a stone axe. A longer process involves digging ore out of the ground, getting the fuel and necessary tools and smelting iron out of the ore, working up the iron into steel, and finally turning out a finished steel axe. Beginning farther back, we may construct cunning machinery for mining, and raising the ore, elaborate blast furnaces for smelting it, special machines for making and sharpening the axe. Going farther back still, 
we may put up engineering shops and machinery for constructing each kind of appliance, and so on. It will scarcely be doubted that every additional step increases the productiveness of the total process, that is, results in the obtaining of the unit, say, the cubic foot of wood, at a smaller total expenditure of labor, immediate and immediate, but just as little will it be doubted that the first two productive methods, the use of the stone axe and then of the steel axe, must have caused a much greater revolution in the productiveness of woodcutting than the later improvements, although absolutely these may be by no means inconsiderable. If necessary, this may easily be proved to demonstration by a little calculation. Assume, for example, that a laborer working with his hands can cut in one day two cubic feet of wood, and working with a stone axe, which has taken three days to make, can cut ten cubic feet. The three days capitalist process is rewarded by a surplus return of eight cubic feet per labor day. Now possibly the doubling of the process say that the more careful fashioning of the stone axe takes six days, may also double the surplus return, and give sixteen cubic feet. But it is scarcely likely that troubling the roundabout process can trouble the surplus return, and it is quite certain that extending the roundabout process a thousandfold, say by sinking of pits, from which the ores for the axe may be got after years have collapsed, will not be able to increase the surplus return a thousandfold. Otherwise, we should have the all but inconceivable possibility that a worker in one day could cut 8,000 feet of wood. From some one point, probably a point not far off, the surplus, though still increasing, will increase in a less ratio than the production period. Of course, in such cases, no definite figure can be named, either for the point from which the productiveness of further extensions of the process begins to decrease, or, speaking generally, for the amount of surplus result connected with any definite length of process. These data vary according to the technical circumstances of each branch of production and at each stage of productive skill. Every new invention alters them. The discovery of gunpowder, for example, opened up at a flash the possibility, which did not exist the moment before, of increasing the productiveness of the chase by perhaps one half and the productiveness of stone quarrying by perhaps a hundredfold. We may, however, with sufficient confidence, repeat the proposition already formulated, that every extension of the production process, so far as it is wisely chosen, of course, leads, generally speaking, to some surplus result. It may be confidently maintained that there is not one branch of production, the returns of which may not be considerably increased in this way as against the method of production prevailing at the time, and that without any new invention, but simply by the intercalation of intermediate members long familiar to capitalist production, whether it be by adoption of a steam motor, or an apt transmitter, or some ingenious gearing, blast, lever, regulator, or the like, how far behind, indeed, in capitalist equipment are the most of our agricultural and industrial businesses compared with the most advanced typical businesses, and certainly these latter are no less far behind an ideally perfect equipment. The fact that the prolongation of production processes leads to surplus results, and the fact that these surplus results usually decrease from a certain point onwards, have long been noticed and acknowledged in our signs, mostly, I must say, in another form, and one borrowed from the jargon of the productive theory. It has been many years since Thunen put them in the most impartial manner and showed that, in the case of progressive increase of capital, the capital that comes last does lead to an increase in the product of labor, but in a constantly decreasing proportion. On this foundation of fact, he himself framed the well-known doctrine that the rate of interest adjusts itself to the productiveness of the last dose of capital applied in the least productive employment. And in the wake of this doctrine, the facts were recognized and received in the widest circles. In harmony, however, with the fashion of the time, these facts were forced into the special forms of presentation and terminology of the productive theory, whereby the most vexatious mistakes and confusions slipped in along with them. 
Before going further, it seemed to me advisable here to try to restate the facts in their naked simplicity. It scarcely, perhaps, requires to be proven that the capitalist production of consumption goods, although carried out in roundabout ways and by many stages, does not on that account cease to exhibit an intimately connected and united work of production. The labor which produces the intermediate products, the mediate labor, as we shall call it, with Rodbertus, and the labor which, out of and with the intermediate products, produces the desired good. The immediate labor both form a part of the production of the consumption good. The production of timber is more than the labor of felling wood in the forest. It embraces the labor of the smith who makes the axe, of the carpenter who cuts the haft, of the miner who raises the ore, of the iron workers and the steel workers who prepare it, and so on. True, our modern division of employment to outward appearance breaks up the unity of the process into a number of independent parts, but it is the theorist's business to understand economic processes in their living connection, and he dare not, of course, let himself be deceived by appearances, but must reproduce in his own mind the real unity of the work of production thus obscured. The masterly manner in which Rod Burtis has done this is one of his best services to economics. But this very consideration, essentially economic as it is, raises a doubt we must fairly meet. According to what has been said, the production period of a consumption good is, strictly speaking, to be reckoned from the moment on which the first hand was laid to the making of its first intermediate product, right down to the completion of the good itself. In our times, when unassisted production has almost entirely disappeared, and one generation builds on the intermediate products laid down by the earlier generations, the production period of almost any consumption good could, in any strict calculation, trace its beginning back to earlier centuries. The boy who cuts a stick with his knife is, strictly speaking, only continuing the work of the miner, who, centuries ago, thrust the first spade into the ground to sink the shaft from which the ore was brought to make the blade. Of course, the finished product of today owes a quite infinitesimal fraction, not worth calculation, even if that were possible, to the first means of labor in these far-off centuries, and it would therefore give a very false view of the degree of capitalism expended in the cutting of the stick, if we were to estimate it by the absolute period of time intervening between the atom of labor first put forth and the completion of the work. It is more important and more correct to look at the period of time which elapses on the average between the expenditure of the original productive powers, labor, and uses of land as successively employed in any work, and the turning out of the finished consumption goods. Production is more or less capitalistic according to the average remoteness of the period at which the original productive powers exerted during the process are paid. Say, for example, that the production of a commodity costs in all hundred days of labor for the sake of simplification, we shall leave out the cooperating uses of land, and that of these hundred, one day was expended ten years before the completion of the work, another nine years, others respectively eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one year, while remaining ninety days were expended immediately before the completion. Then the first day of labor is paid ten years later, the second nine years later, the third eight years later, and so on, while the last ninety days are paid immediately. The calculation is as follows. To say that on average a hundred days of labor are paid in about half a year, say that the production of another good were also to demand in all a hundred days of labor, likewise spent in the course of a ten years period, but spread over it in such a way that twenty days' work was expended ten years before, other twenty days' work nine years before, five days' work in each year, from the eighth to the first, successively, while that last twenty days were spent immediately before the completion of the work, the average would come out quite differently and much higher. Or, more than five and a half years, it is highly probable, moreover, that in both cases some fraction of a day's work will have been spent centuries before, but such a small element 
will scarcely influence the average, and may in most cases be simply neglected. Where I have spoken above of extension or prolongation of the roundabout process of production and of degrees of capitalism, I must be understood in the sense just explained. The length or the shortness of the process, its extension or curtailment, is not to be measured by the absolute duration of the period that lies between the expenditure of the first atom of labor and the last. Otherwise, the cracking of nuts with a hammer, which might chance to be made of iron, brought from a mine opened by the Romans, would perhaps be the most capitalistic kind of production. Nor is it to be measured by the number of independent intermediate members, which the production process embraces. Otherwise, when by means of the three intermediate products, twig, lime, and bird lime, a boy catches birds on the same day as he commences making these three forms of capital, his bird catching would be more capitalistic than the far back labor of the miner who devotes years to the sinking of a shaft. But it is to be measured by the average period which lies between the successive expenditure in labor and uses of land and the obtaining of the final good. It is only in methods of production where the expenditure in the original powers is distributed equally over the whole production period that the absolute length of the process affords at the same time the proper measure for the degree of capitalism. Let us now apply what has been said of single acts of production to the circumstances of an entire community. Every year, a community comes anew into possession and gets the disposal of a certain quantum of original productive powers. The power is represented by its labor and land. The farther away its production is from capitalist production, there is no production, of course, absolutely without capital, the greater will be the proportion of the year's productive powers that is changed into consumption goods during the same year. The more capitalistic the production is, the smaller will be the proportion of the year's productive powers consumed within the year, and the greater the proportion invested in intermediate products that will come to maturity as finished goods only in future years. And again, the higher the degree of capitalism is, the more remote will be the period at which these intermediate products mature. Thus, a community producing from hand to mouth consumes in each year the fruit of the productive powers of that same year. The capitalist community consumes only, to a small extent, the fruits of the productive powers of the present year, and, to a great extent, the fruits of the productive powers of past years, while it again is making intermediate products for the service of future years, and the higher the degree of capitalism, the farther back in the past, on the average, are the years whose productive powers it consumes, and the farther on in the future are the periods for which it provides. And now I trust the following proposition, which puts together the chief features of the capitalist production process, will be understood beyond possibility of mistake. All consumption goods which man produces come into existence through cooperation of human power with natural powers, which latter are partly economic, partly free. By means of these primary productive powers, man may make the consumption goods he desires, either immediately or through the medium of intermediate products called capital. The latter method demands a sacrifice of time, but it has an advantage in the quantity of product, and this advantage, although perhaps in decreasing ratio, is associated with every prolongation of the roundabout way of production. Chapter 3. The Function of Capital in Production After what has been said in the preceding chapter, it should not be difficult accurately to indicate the role which capital plays in economic production. Capital has, first, a systematic importance. Its presence is always the symptom of a profitable roundabout production. I say deliberately, symptom, and not cause or condition, of profitable methods of production, for as a fact its presence is rather the result than the cause. If men today are fishing with boats and nets instead of picking the fish out of pools on the shore with their hands, it cannot be said that they have adopted those more fruitful methods because they possess boats and nets. Obviously they possess boats and nets because they have adopted these methods. They must have already chosen the roundabout way of production before these goods generally speaking, 
come into existence. This, however, does not exhaust the importance of capital. It is, secondly, and herein lies the chief point of its productive efficiency, an effective intermediate cause of the consummation of this profitable roundabout process. Every piece of capital is, to a certain extent, a store of useful natural powers, the working of which helps to bring to a successful issue the roundabout process in the course of which the piece of capital has come into existence. I say intermediate cause, not cause. Capital gives no independent impulse. It only transmits an impulse given by the original productive powers, just as one billiard ball transmits motion to another. The function of capital, indeed, has been called the prisoning of natural powers. The expression is quite appropriate and very happy, only it must never be forgotten that this attribute belongs to the entire capitalist process, not only to the descending branch, generally called the use of the capital, but also to the ascending branch in which the capital itself is first made. Man does not first prison natural powers by means of capital. Capital itself originates as the result of a previous imprisonment by the original productive powers that are at man's own bidding of certain compliant natural powers. Taken all in all among the many predicates which economists have given to capital, the one that best fits this aspect of the case is that of the tool of production. But thirdly, capital is also the indirect cause of other profitable roundabout ways of production being entered on other, that is, than those in the course of which it itself has come into existence. When a people possesses much capital, not only can it successfully complete those processes in the course in which the capital presently existing has come into being, but it can also adopt other and new methods. For the stock of capital in hand, which essentially is nothing else than an aggregate of consumption goods in the transition state, throws off every year a certain quantity of its constituents which have just completed their transition state and become finished goods, and places them at the disposal of the current economic period for purposes of immediate consumption. In this way, the greater the stock of capital, the larger is the share taken by the productive powers of the past in providing means of consumption for the present, and the less are the new productive powers of the present drawn on for the present. Thus, a larger proportion of these current powers is free for the service of the future, that is, for investment in more or less far-reaching processes of production. If a community is so poor that the consumption goods maturing out of capitalist intermediate products in any year, say in 1888, scarcely cover one twentieth of that year's wants, then the remaining nineteen twentieth must be provided out of the labor and uses of the land of 1888, and only a fractional part of the productive powers of that year remains over to initiate methods of production that will turn out consumption goods in the years following. If, on the other hand, the past has accumulated a treasure of intermediate products, raw materials, tools, machines, factories, workshops, etc., so great that their success of maturing covers the consumption demand of the year 1888 to the extent of 35 over 10, that of 1889 to the extent of 4 tenths, and that 1890 to the extent of three-tenths, and so on, then only one-half of the productive powers of 1888 will be claimed to make up their current wants, while the entire other half may be spent unhesitatingly in producing intermediate products, which will come to maturity as consumption goods. Only in later years, all the later in proportion as the next year's wants, are already covered by accumulations of capital in the past. In this sense, but only in this sense, is it correct to say that man must already have capital before he can enter on roundabout ways of production. That want of capital prevents man taking advantage of far-reaching and profitable methods of production, such as the laying of railways, building of canals, irrigation schemes, altering of riverbeds, and so on. It would be quite incorrect to understand this proposition as meaning that a community must have, finished and ready to hand, that kind of concrete capital with which the methods of production in question are carried out, or even the concrete capital, raw materials, tools, etc., out of which are made the forms of capital first needed.
All that is required is that the community possesses so much capital, whatever its shape, as will cover it, while it is being gradually changed into consumption goods, the demand of the present and near future for such goods sufficiently to leave the current production powers free for investment in intermediate products of the kind required. It would be essentially more correct to say that we require consumption goods before we can enter upon roundabout ways of production, whether these be in the form of finished stocks of goods ready for consumption or in the transition form of intermediate products. Lastly, we can now answer easily and categorically the much disputed question whether any independent productive power is inherent in capital or, to put the question in its usual form, whether capital is a third and independent factor in production, alongside of labor and nature. The answer must be a most distinct negative. This seems to me the only conclusion anyone can come to, provided he makes clear to himself the sense in which this question is put, and must be put if it is worth the trouble of putting at all. And this sense is a very emphatic one. The following analogy will make it perfectly clear. A man throws a stone at another man and kills him. Has the stone killed the man? If the question is put without laying any special emphasis, it may be answered without hesitation in the affirmative. But how if the murderer, on his trial, were to defend himself by saying that it was not he but the stone that had killed the man? Taking the words in this sense, should we still say that the stone had killed the man and acquit the murderer? Now it is with an emphasis like this that economists inquire as to the independent productivity of capital. The question comes in the course of the inquiry concerning the elements which constitute our material goods, a similar interest to that which the chemist has in the analysis of compound bodies leads the economist to analyze the multiform transition stages of material goods to trace them back to their source, and to resolve the thousandfold instruments and auxiliaries of production, to which, directly or indirectly, they owe their existence into the simple, fundamental powers from the cooperation of which everything proceeds. In this connection, the doubt arises whether capital is an independent productive power or not. The whole spirit of the inquiry allows only one meaning to be given to the question, and the emphasis is very marked. We are not asking about dependent intermediate causes, but about ultimate independent elements. The question is not whether capital plays a part in the bringing about of a productive result, such as the stone does in the killing of the man, but whether, granted the productive result, some part is due to capital so entirely and peculiarly that it simply cannot be put to the credit of the two other recognized elementary factors, nature and labor. Now, can this question be answered in the affirmative? Emphatically, it cannot. Capital is an intermediate product of nature and labor, nothing more. Its own origin, its existence, its subsequent action, are nothing but stages in the continuous working of the true elements, nature and labor. They, and they alone, do everything from beginning to end in bringing consumption goods into existence. The only distinction is that sometimes they do it all at once sometimes by several stages. In the latter case, the completion of each stage is marked outwardly by the appearance of a foreproduct or intermediate product, and capital has emerged. But, let me ask, is a thing any the less the work of its author that is not produced all at once, but in installments? If today, by allying my labor with natural powers, I can make bricks out of clay, and tomorrow, by allying my labor with natural gifts, I obtain lime, and the day after that, make mortar, and so construct a wall. Can it be said that any part of the wall, that I and the natural powers have not made it? Again, before a lengthy piece of work, such as the building of a house, is quite finished, it naturally must be at one time a fourth finished, then a half finished, then three quarters finished. What now would be said if one were to describe these inevitable stages of the work as independent requisites of house building, and maintain that, for the building of a house, we require, besides building materials and labor, a quarter finished house, a half finished house, a three quarters finished house. In form, perhaps, it is less striking, but in effect, it is not a whit more correct. To elevate those intermediate steps in the progress of the work, which outwardly take the shape of capital, 
into an independent agent of production by the side of nature and labor. This would never have been called in question had it not been that the introduction of division of vocations and labor had split up the united work of producing consumption goods into a number of apparently independent acts of production. It was this that made economists forget to look at it as a whole, and made them with a singular modesty bow before the dependent intermediate creations of previous human activity, as if they represented an independent power. But even as it was, it was scarcely possible for any acute theorist to make this confusion if another circumstance had not conspired to assist it. That was the accepted parallelism between factors of production and branches of income, and the awkwardness economists feared to encounter in the explanation and justification of interest if they had to refuse recognition to capital as an independent factor of production. All natural income, it was taught, is based on participation in the production of goods. The various branches of income are nothing else than the forms in which the different contributories to production are paid. Rent of land is the payment for the factor of nature, wage the payment for the factor of labor, and interest wealth. Interest appeared to have no substantial foundation if it also could not be interpreted as a payment for a third independent factor of production. It did not seem to be explained theoretically, nor what indeed might be more serious to the theorists in question, to be justified practically. Thus it was that many, a learned thinker, was driven into a corner, and preferred rather to shut an eye to clear facts than to sacrifice the independent productivity of capital, and with it the welcome basis for the current theory of interest. Facts certainly spoke with perfect distinctness. It was impossible to deny that capital is no element in the proper sense of the word, inasmuch as it itself springs from the cooperation of nature and labor. Not only so, but by a singular irony of fate this had to be expressly proved, as it had been by Adam Smith before them, by those very theorists who maintained an independent productivity in their theory of price, in having to show how all prices resolve themselves finally into rent, wage, and interest. They were forced to demonstrate in the most minute way that concrete capital is not an element, that, for instance, copper and steel, which serve as capital in the manufacture of watches, originate in the cooperation of the natural mineral deposits or the work of miners, and of older capitals which themselves have originated in similar ways, and so on. In the face of this, to maintain the independent productivity of what they had just demonstrated to be a dependent and intermediate product, they were driven to adopt very singular expedients. The favorite ones were obscurity and brevity. Instead of making an earnest effort to bridge the yawning contradiction, they either did not suggest the doubt at all, or if a doubt had already been raised, they dismissed it with some laconic phrase or other. A long series of writers makes no scruple about expounding capital on one page as a factor of production derived from nature and labor, and on the next as a third-party independent factor of production, along with nature and labor. Mill has so far yielded to the pressure of facts as to admit that capital is itself the product of labor, and that its instrumentality in production is therefore, in reality, that of labor in an indirect shape. But with a quick turn, he saves its independence. Not the less, he continues, does it require to be specified separately, a previous application of labor to produce the capital required for consumption during the work is no less essential than the application of labor to the work itself. Therefore, because labor must be applied twice in two different stages of production, something else besides labor must be recognized as the independent condition of production. Some writers, of course, treat the matter more seriously. They do not evade the difficulty, but try to get a real solution of it. They cannot overlook the fact that capital first comes into existence through combination of similar factors. Quite correctly, therefore, they do not attempt to claim for capital itself the character of an element, but they still require an independent support for interest. This they obtain by resolving capital into its elements and finding that, besides nature and labor, there is still a third independent element. Senior calls it abstinence. Herman calls it the use of capital. 
These attempts at solution, which I went into in detail and pronounced upon in my former book, Capital and Interest, were certainly not very happy. Hermans, in particular, is singularly unfortunate in being obliged to explain the use which capital gives as more elementary than capital itself, as if the egg which the hen lays is antecedent to the hen. Nevertheless, as regards our present question, these theories are very instructive. They show that several of our most clear-sighted thinkers prefer to take refuge in the most hazardous and artificial constructions rather than agree in the current doctrine that capital itself, while originating in the cooperation of nature and labor, is all the same an independent factor of production along with them. We may confidently, then, strike capital out of the list of independent productive powers, as a portion of the English school did long ago, and as the socialists have done more recently. I may say, however, that the manner in which they have done so is not quite appropriate. In the instrumentality of capital, they see only the instrumentality of the labor expended in producing it. They explain it as previous stored up labor. This is not correct. Capital, to keep the same form of expression, is stored up labor, but it is something more. It is also stored up valuable natural power. It is the medium through which the two original productive powers exert their instrumentality. To the instrumentality of gold, which is employed as capital in gilding the lightning rod, the labor of the miner who finds the ore and refines it is not the only contributory. Nature also has contributed her share in depositing the valuable vein or placer. Although then we have traced its instrumentality in production to nature and labor, is capital itself not productive at all? Certainly it is, in more than one sense of that too ambiguous word. It is first productive because it finds its destination in the production of goods. It is further productive because it is an effectual tool in completing the roundabout and profitable methods of production once they are entered on. Finally, it is productive indirectly because it makes the adoption of new and profitable methods possible. One thing, however, it is not. It is not independently productive in the sense on which the most important part of the controversy turns, as the old economist Lotz expressed it briefly and succinctly, of any independent labor in capital there is simply no question. Chapter 4. The Theory of the Formation of Capital In our science there are three views in circulation as to the formation of capital. One finds its origin in saving, a second in production, and a third in both together. Of these, the third enjoys the widest acceptance, and it is also the correct one. But the formula will have to be amplified to some extent, and presented in a way that is at once clearer and more true to life than has usually been the case. To put the matter, first of all, in its simplest conceivable terms, Suppose a recluse working absolutely without capital, say some Robinson Crusoe, thrown on a lonely shore without either tools or weapons, being without capital, he must at first support life in the most primitive fashion, as for instance by gathering berries which grow wild. Now what must happen before he can get possession of his first capital, say a bow and arrow? Let us put the first theory to the test. Is saving by itself sufficient to call capital into existence? Certainly not. But the one possession that he has, his wild fruits, our Crusoe may save and stint as much as he please. He will accumulate a store of berries, goods for consumption, but that will never give him a single bow or arrow. As we can easily see, these must be positively produced. Is it sufficient then for the origination of capital that it be produced? Again, certainly not. Of course, once Crusoe has the length of commencing to produce capital, the formation of capital is as good as accomplished. But before he gets that length, there is something else to be done. And that something is by no means self-evident. Productive powers are to be set free for the proposed formation of capital. And this can only be done, as we shall see, through saving. The amount of original productive powers which our Crusoe has daily at his command is equivalent leaving natural gifts out of account, to one day's labor, which we shall assume to be ten hours of labor. Suppose now that the berries within reach of his hut 
are so scarce that a full day's labor of ten hours is necessary to provide as much food as will just support him in bare light. Obviously, no formation of capital is possible. There is no use advising him to produce a bow and arrow. Producing requires strength and time, and all the time and strength our Crusoe has is fully claimed already to keep him in life. To produce capital, then, may be difficult enough without something else, and what that is will appear immediately on our varying a little the assumed facts of the illustration. Suppose there is such wealth of berries that the result of nine hours gathering is sufficient to support bare life, while ten hours gathering gives a return such as to a guarantee a substance amply sufficient to maintain Crusoe in health and strength. Obviously, he has now a choice between two lines of conduct. Either he may take advantage of the opportunity thus offered to complete his provision and consume each day the fruits of an entire ten hours day of labor, in which case it is perfectly clear that he has now no time and strength left to make a bow and arrows, or although the productive power at his disposal would enable him to live better, he may content himself with the barest living, which, as we said, can be provided by the nine hours' labor of gathering, then, and only then, as the tenth hour free to which to make weapons for future use. This amounts to saying, in other words, that before capital can actually be formed, the productive powers necessary to its making must be saved by encroaching on the moment's enjoyment. To anticipate and avoid a mistake very apt to be made, it must be said distinctly that this encroaching on the moment's enjoyment need by no means involve downright privation. With more productive labor, Crusoe's choice would not lie, as in the above illustration, between bare living and comfortable living, or perhaps between comfortable and ample living. It is not a question of the absolute insignificance of these claims on the movement's enjoyment, but on the relation to that amount which I may indicate in the shortest and most generally intelligible way by the word income, an expression, unfortunately, not yet strictly enough defined in scientific usage. The essential thing is that the current endowment of productive powers should not be entirely claimed for the immediate consumption of the current period, but that a portion of this endowment should be retained for the service of a future period, but such a retention will undoubtedly be called a real saving of productive powers. A saving of productive powers, be it noted, for productive powers, and not for the goods which constitute capital, or for the immediate objective of saving. This is an important point which must be strongly emphasized, because, in the current view, too little consideration is given to it. Man saves consumption goods, his means of enjoyment he thus saves productive powers, and with these finally he can produce capital. It is only exceptionally that capital itself is the immediate object of savings. It may happen in the case of those goods which by nature admit of being used either for consumption or for production, such as grain. To the extent that a man withdraws such goods from immediate use in consumption, his saving directly lays the foundation of capital. To build on that foundation, of course, the negative element of saving must have added to it the positive element of devoting the saved goods to production as intermediate products. It is easy to show that every further increase of the existing stock of capital is limited by the same conditions as the first formation. Assume that for a month our Crusoe consumes daily only so much fruit as he can gather in nine hours of labor, and devotes the tenth hour to making weapons. As a result of this thirty hours' work, he now owns a bow and arrow, and in them he has the possibility of making his living much more easily and amply than before. Naturally, his desires widen. He wishes decent clothes, a house, all sorts of things that minister to comfort. But for these he requires the suitable intermediate products, axes, nails, braces, etc. Now we ask further, what kind of conditions must be fulfilled that Crusoe may obtain this new capital? This is very easily answered if he makes use of the improved circumstances which he owes to the possession of the bow and arrows, simply to increase his immediate consumption, that is, if he spends the whole labor time at his disposal in the service of the moment, hunting, gathering fruits, and sleeping. Not only is it impossible for him to acquire new capital, but he will lose the old. 
Bows and arrows do not last for ever. In a month's time, we shall say his arrows will be spent, and his bow will be worn out. If, therefore, his capital is to remain in existence, he must obviously employ at least one of the ten hours in renewing his weapons, and, at the most, he can employ nine only in gathering and hunting. To put it in the propositional form, to retain capital in existence, man must make over and devote to the service of the future at least so much of the productive powers of the current period as he has consumed during the current period of the produce of former productive powers. Or, to put it in other words, the consumption of the current period is limited by the produce of as many productive powers, present and past, taken together, as come into existence anew during the current period. Finally, if an increase of capital is to become possible, obviously a still greater proportion of the current productive powers must be withdrawn from the consumption of the present and transferred to the service of the future. Of his ten hours of labor, our Crusoe must devote one to renewing his weapons and less than nine to gathering berries and killing game, if he is to make the new capital he desires in what remains free of his labor time. To put it generally, he must curtail the immediate consumption of the current period to such a point that it uses up the produce of fewer past and present productive powers then come into existence anew in the same period. He must, in a word, save productive powers. All this is quite clear and simple. Indeed, it is even a little too simple for our purpose. Robinson aids and pictures of primitive circumstances are very good when the object is to present clearly the simplest typical principles, to give a kind of skeleton of economical procedure, and to that extent, I trust, our Robinson aid also has done good service, but naturally they cannot give us an adequate picture of those peculiar and developed forms in which this skeleton clothes itself in the living actuality of a modern economic community, and it is just at this point that it becomes important to fill out the abstract formula with explanation to the illustration taken from life. We shall, therefore, leave the lonely shore of our Crusoe and come to the industrial conduct of a great nation with its millions of people. Chapter 5. Formation of Capital in a Community Let us take the case of a community embracing 10 millions of able-bodied persons, leaving out of account the current uses of land, so as not to cumber the statement unnecessarily, the annual endowment of such a nation, its original productive powers, thus amounts to 10 million years of labor. Its accumulated stock of capital, we shall suppose, represents the fruit of 30 million labor years and a corresponding amount of uses of land, invested during previous economic years in intermediate products. Now look at the constitution of this stock of capital more closely. Every capital is, by its nature, composed of a mass of intermediate products, and the common goal of all these products is to ripen the consumption goods or means of enjoyment. They reach this goal through the continuation of that production process in the course of which they themselves have come into existence. They are all, as it were, on the way towards the goal of human consumption, but the length of the road which they have had to travel is different. This is partly because the various branches of production adopt a roundabout ways of various length. Mining, for instance, or railway building, takes a much more roundabout and lengthy method than wood cutting. But it is partly also because those goods which constitute the community's capital at the moment are at various points on their respective roads. Many an intermediate product has just entered on a very lengthy roundabout road, as for instance a boring machine whose life work it will be to drive a gallery in a mine. Some are midway, others again like clothing stuffs ready for making into coats and mantles are near the end of the journey their particular production process has to take. Now the inventory of capital lays a kind of cross-section through the production processes, thus unlike in length and unlike in the stage of progress, and intersects them, of course at the most different points, just as a national consensus lays a section through the paths of life and encounters and registers the individual members of the nation at the most different stages of life. Considered with reference to the varying distance at which intermediate products lie from the goal of consumption, 
the total mass of capital divides itself into a number of annual classes or stages of maturity, which may be very appropriately pictured by a diagram of concentric annual circles. The outmost circle in figure 1 embraces those goods which will be transformed into goods ready for consumption within the coming year. The second circle represents those goods which will ripen into consumption goods in the year after. The third circle in those which will be ready the year after that, and so on. In a community where production is not yet strongly capitalistic, the inner circles will rapidly contract because in such a way a community, very lengthy roundabout ways of production, such as turn out their finished goods only after many years, will be rare. In rich and well-developed communities, again, there will be a considerable number of comprehensive circles, and of these the inner ones will have a content that, although relatively smaller, is not inconsiderable. This representation of the stages of maturity by concentric circles is peculiarly appropriate on this account, that it also gives a very happy expression to the quantitative relations of these stages exactly as the outmost of the concentric circle possesses the greatest area, while the inner circle possesses a gradually decreasing one, does the first of these classes, that nearest to the completion of the process, always, by its very nature, embrace the largest quota of the total mass of capital, while a decreasingly smaller quota falls to more remote classes. There are two reasons for this. The first is that the various branches of production generally adopt processes of different lengths, lengths varying with the technical circumstances of each branch. Many complete the entire work of production, from the preliminary processes to the turning out of the finished product. Within a year, many require two, three, and five years. Only a few have a production period extending over 10, 20, and 30 years. The result is that in the highest classes, those farthest removed in time from the finished product only a few branches of production are found. Intermediate products, for instance, in the 10th circle, can only be provided by those branches of production which have at least a 10 years production period. But the lower circles are filled, not only by those last named branches of production, for the intermediate products of these very long processes must pass circle by circle towards maturity, but also those branches of production which have shorter periods. Thus, the quantity of intermediate products grows larger and larger to the first class, and to this first class every branch production, without exception, sends its representative. But there is still another circumstance that works in the same direction. The ripening of intermediate products into consumption goods demands a steady addition of current productive powers. At each stage of the production process, new labor is added to intermediate products, which have been passed on to it from the previous stage and they pass on to the following stage in a more advanced state. In one stage, the intermediate product wool is changed by the addition of labor into the intermediate product yarn, that again in the following stage, by the addition of labor into the intermediate product cloth, and so on. This has the natural result that, within each branch of production, the amount of invested capital increases with each advancing stage of the production, or what is the same thing, at every change into a lower circle. Consequently, not only are the lower circles, as has been shown, supplied from more branches of production, but they are supplied with relatively larger amounts of capital, and this gives the lower classes a twofold numerical superiority over the higher ones. On these lines, we may now put our illustration into figures. To facilitate our survey, we shall assume that the total capital of the community is comprised in 10 yearly circles. If 30 million labor years are embodied in this total capital, for simplicity's sake, I again leave out the invested uses of land, we may assume the following division of circles. The first circle contains the intermediate products of 6 million labor years. In the normal course of things, the outmost circle becomes divided off from capital each year and is exchanged into consumption goods, but the succeeding circles press forward, each encircled by the addition of new labor, advance one stage, both as regards nearness to maturity and amount of capital invested. The first class, therefore, is changed into consumption goods, the second class into the first, the third into the second, and so on. 
Now the following important questions suggest themselves. What use must the community make of the original product of powers which come anew into its possession during the current year? That is to say, the new 10 million labor years, if, for simplicity's sake, we still leave out uses of land in order to conserve the capital that is in existence. And how must it act to increase that capital? These questions are easily answered. To keep the capital at the present level, the community must not spend more than 4 million labor years in present time production. With the remaining 6 million labor years, the stock of capital reduced by separating off of the first year circle must be brought up in quantity and quality to its former level. This demands that the nine other yearly circles be brought each other one step nearer maturity by the addition of the requisite labor, and that the tenth class, which is now non-existent, be new created. The amount of labor necessary for this may be exactly determined. The former second class, in which as yet only five million labor years have been embodied, needs, in order to make it entirely equal in value to the former first class, an addition of the third class needs an addition of one million labor years. And the creation of a new tenth class requires the labor in all six. It should be noted that it is not a matter of indifference at what point in which particular circles in the six million labor years are spent, if, for instance, they were to be spent in making intermediate products, but not according to the above distribution say they were all spent in making intermediate products of the first circle, which would come to maturity in a year's time. The disadvantage would be twofold. First, the production processes, which had only got the length of the intermediate products of the higher classes, would be brought to a standstill. And second, as we know, the shorter methods would be less productive. With six million labor years invested in a one year's process, the present would hand over to the future the same number of productive powers indeed. But what in the last resort is the important thing? These powers would, in virtue of their own one year's process, be capable of producing only a smaller amount of products than the present has received for consumption from the past. The next year's production, therefore, would necessarily be reduced and the stock of capital would not be maintained at its former level. Again, if the present stock of capital is to be increased, it is evidently necessary for the community to give up a portion of the consumption which it might have enjoyed, while still maintaining the stock at its former height, that it withdraw a portion of the productive powers at its disposal from the service of the present, that it save and employ them for additional future production. Productive powers may be saved in various ways, one, other dispositions remaining unchanged, a smaller portion of the current productive powers, say three instead of four million labor years, may be employed in immediate present time production. Or two, the arrangements for saving may have been already made and the total capital organized in such a way that the circle which is now passing over into the stage of full maturity contains a less quantity of capital, say five instead of six million labor years. Inasmuch, then, as only five instead of six million labor years are now required for the replacement of capital, there remains, if, as before, four out of the ten million labor years, which are the current productive endowment, are spent in present time production, one million over, available for the formation of new capital. Or three, it is conceivable that at the last moment the disposition of the capital should be so altered that less passes into the stage of full maturity than was originally contemplated. It is a familiar fact that there are so many goods which admit of being employed in a variety of ways. This often makes it possible to put back goods which have already attained full maturity, or which stand quite near to maturity by several stages. Grain, for instance, instead of being ground for food purposes, may be stored for seed or use in distilling. Coal may heat the blast furnace instead of the domestic oven. Iron may build machinery instead of parking rails, and so on. If, by thus disposing goods differently, the amount of capital which arrives at maturity becomes reduced from six to five million labor years, there will, after four million labor years, 
have been expended in present time production, be one million labor years free from the making of new capital. All three methods then, of which, in practical life, the second is the most common and the first is the least so, agree in one essential point that during the current year, the produce of nine million labor years only is consumed while 10 million labor years come forward. That accordingly, in other words, 1 million labor years of the current productive endowment are saved. Hitherto we have spoken of the formation of capital by a community as if in such a community there was one single economy guided by one individual will. Of course this is not the case. It remains, therefore, for us to show how in a community where industry is divided up and managed by many heads, the productive forces that conduce to the formation of capital are actually disposed, and to inquire whether, as we have maintained, these dispositions presuppose Satan. And since it is claimed, and not without reason, that universal truths should be proved to hold not only in the present and historical organization, but in every social organization, I propose in this inquiry to look both at the actual economic form, which is preeminently individualistic, and at that form which is at least conceivable and socialistic. We may begin with the latter as being the easier from the standpoint of our present problem. In a socialist state, from which private capital and private undertaking were banished, and where the entire national production was organized by the state, the formation of capital and the previous saving of productive powers necessary thereto would be controlled officially. The method would simply be put a considerable proportion of the national workers to very lengthy processes, whereby the making of capital in the form of intermediate products would be very great, and the amount of matured products in the future would be much increased. Many workers, relatively speaking, will be put to mining, railway building, regulation of rivers, machine making, and the like, and few to wine growing, silk spinning, lace making, beer brewing, cloth making, and the like. The people would thus be compelled to save by pressure from above, inasmuch as of the national production thus conducted by the state, in each year relatively few goods will be put at their disposal for immediate consumption, less, that is, to say, than might be annually produced and consumed if the existing stock were merely to be maintained. The productive powers left free would be invested in lengthy capitalist processes of production. Somewhat more complicated, but still easy to grasp in principle, is the procedure in the individualistic organization of society, as we find it in the present day. Here, in the first instance, it is the undertakers who decide how the productive powers, as they come forward annually, shall be employed, and they thus decide the direction which the national production takes, but they do not decide it at their pleasure. They follow impulses given by the prices of products where lively demand promises a profitable price. They extend their production and curtail it in those kinds of goods where failing demand can no longer take off the supply, and their prices fall below a pain level. Extension and contraction of supply continue till such time as production has adapted itself to the desire for the particular commodities. In the last resort, therefore, it is not the undertakers who decide the direction of national production, but the consumers, the public, all depends on the effective desire they exert by means of their income. The income of a people is, in the long run, identical with the return of its production. The circle that represents a year's income coincides roughly with the circle that represents a year's return of its productive powers. If every individual in the community were to consume exactly his year's income in the form of consumption goods, there would arise a demand for consumption goods which, through the agency of prices, would induce the undertakers so to regulate production that in each year the return of a whole year's circle of productive powers would take the form of consumption goods. If 10 million labor years and the corresponding use of land form the annual endowment of a people, and this people wishes to consume and does consume the whole of its income in the form of consumption goods, it is a necessity that the produce of the whole 10 million labor years, together with the corresponding uses of land, be changed each year into the form of consumption goods. In this case, there is no productive power left to dispose of in the increasing capital, and capital only remains as it was. If, on the other hand, each individual consumes, on the average, 
only three quarters of his income and saves the rest obviously the wish to buy and the demand for consumption goods will fall only three-fourths of the former consumption goods will find demand and sale if the undertakers however were for some time to continue the old dispositions of production and bring to market consumption goods to the amount of ten million labor years the oversupply would very soon press down the price business would become unremunerative and the pressure of loss would compel the undertakers to adapt their production to the changed circumstances of demand they will now provide that in one year only the produce of seven and a half million labor years is transformed into consumption goods whether it be by the maturing of the first class or by adding to present time production and the two and a half millions which remain of the current year's endowment may and will be spent in the increasing of capital i say will be spent for an economically advanced people does not hoard but puts out what it saves in the purchase of valuable paper it deposits in a bank or savings bank in loan securities etc in these ways the amount saved becomes part of the productive credit it increases the purchasing power of producers for productive purposes it is thus the cause of an extra demand for means of production or intermediate products and this in the last resort induces those who have the regulation of undertakings to invest the productive powers at their disposal in these intermediate products we see therefore as a fact an intimate connection between saving and formation of capital if no individual saves the people as a whole cannot accumulate capital because the great consumption of consumption goods forces the producers by the impulse of prices so to employ the productive powers that every year the produce of a whole year's endowment is demanded and used up in the shape of consumption goods and no productive powers are left free for the increasing of capital but if individuals save the altered demand again through the impulse of prices compels the undertakers to dispose of their productive powers differently fewer powers are put each year at the service of the present and thereby is increased the amount of those productive powers whose produce will be found in suspense as intermediate products in other words the economical capital will be increased with a view to an increased consumption in the future now there is still a third possibility individuals may consume on the average more than their income instead of saving they may waste their parents sum of wealth according to our theory this must lead to a diminution of the community's capital and as a fact it does so the steps of the process are as follows by the prevailing extravagance more than a year's income of the community and therefore more than the produce of the one year's circle of productive powers is demanded in the shape of consumption goods production compelled by the impulse of prices yields to the demand for instance the first disposition was that the first circle with its six million labor years should mature during the current year and that of the ten million labor years that form the current endowment four millions should be spent in present time production and the other six in replacing the capital consumed now we shall suppose that through the extravagant manners of the citizens the year's demand for consumption goods rises till it requires the produce of twelve million labor years the undertakers will act in something like the following manner of the current labor endowment they will invest perhaps not four but five million labor years in present production and in correspondence with this the amount devoted to the replacement of capital will shrink from six to five millions this will cover one million of the extra amount required at the same time by differently disposing of such goods as allow of more than one employment they will perhaps divert the produce of another million of labor years from a more remote class into the first class and thus add it to the consumption of the current year this will cover the second million of the extra demand the community now receives and consumes what it desires the produce of 12 million labor years in the form of consumption goods but it does so at the expense of the stock of capital which is insufficiently replaced and so diminished by two million labor years possibly i have wasted too many words in providing the truth so obvious that no thinking man unskilled in science would ever doubt it every child knows that a piece of capital say a hammer must be produced if it is to come into existence 
and to every simple man it is obvious that no stock of capital can be made or can increase if men regularly consume their whole available income if in other words they do not save it was reserved for the sharp and subtle wits of learned theorists to suggest the first doubt about it this however it would have been difficult to do if instead of dogmatizing on the formation of capital they had attempted to give a complete and faithful representation of the process by which capital is formed here lies the entire but almost the only difficulty of these and many other economical doctrines and this suggests it might add the reason why so many abstract deductions are discredited and fail of result it is not the deductive method that deserves the distrust but the persons who misapply it vulgar errors in thought indeed are quite exceptional among capable thinkers and here the fault lies mostly in this that the economists in question could not put a sufficiently clear and lifelike picture before their minds of the circumstances and processes which they introduced into their deductive arguments as assumptions or at least did not keep it persistently enough before them through all stages of the deduction hence losing touch with life they began to make deductions not from truth of facts but from words of formulas and so fell without knowing it into the emptiest dialectic it is because so many economists as it seems to me have made this mistake that i risk being tedious rather than being suspected of sophistry chapter six possible objections it is perhaps advisable to supplement our positive statement by a brief critical consideration of the most important objections that might be urged two of these appear to me particularly worth noting the first is that the majority of goods which constitute capital are by nature quite unfitted to immediate consumption there is therefore no sacrifice in withdrawing them from a use which they could never serve indeed it is ridiculous to speak of the non-consumption of steam engines and land improvements of roofing tiles and bars of metal as an act of saving or abstinence to me this seems a somewhat cheap but still perfectly good argument against those who formulate the theory of saving superficially or falsely but as against the essence of the theory it proves nothing if any one is stupid enough to interpret the theory of saving as meaning that finished capital in its form as concrete capital must be saved he must submit to the retort that man cannot eat iron machines but this is not at all the meaning of any thoughtful representative of the theory what is maintained is only that without saving capital cannot be made or increased that saving is as indispensable a condition of the formation of capital as is labor and this is literally correct the machines themselves have not been saved but built but in order to build them men had previously to withdraw the productive powers necessary to build them from the service of their present they had therefore in the strictest sense of the term to save them it may serve towards the settling of this controversy to remark that the idea of sacrifice of renunciation and thus of moral desert need not be associated with the conception of saving there may be sacrifice in saving and it may be praiseworthy but not at all necessarily a man with a small income will of course feel it a sensible privation and it will require strong self-denial in him to lay past anything while one has an income of a hundred thousand and is content to consume one half of it has little claim to be considered a hero of asceticism because he saves the other half as capital it is simply the fact of a saving that is indispensable to the formation of capital whether there is sacrifice and a moral desert in it or not is all the same to the result and it follows from this that the theoretical truth that saving is necessary to the formation of capital cannot and must not be used to justify either morally or socio-politically all and every taking of interest this is another instance of that confusing of the theoretical with the socio-political problem of interest which I adverted to in another place, as having done so much harm. One side mixed up the theoretical doctrine that the formation of capital must be preceded by saving with the moral judgment that interest is justified as the reward of abstinence, and the other side 
which saw quite correctly that interest could not be justified in such general terms, was misled by the same confusion of the problems into denying not only the false socio-political deduction, but the true theoretical premise. If these two problems are kept distinct, it will help us to give both parties their due. To Robertus and Lasalle, we may grant at once that saving need not be moral heroism, and therefore is no sufficient socio-political justification of interest, but we must stand for the recognition of the theoretical truth that the fact of saving is in any case required to the formation of capital. A second objection lays emphasis on the fact that for a man to be able to accumulate capital, he must acquire more than he uses, and draws the conclusion that it is essentially the productivity of labor, industriousness and not abstinence, to which the formation of capital is due. Thus Rodvertus says, in so many words, that if in the beginnings of economic development an isolated worker has no time to make a tool, because he must always live from hand to mouth. The blame lies simply in the productivity of labor being too small. If later this productivity increases so much that, say, eight hours labor is sufficient to produce a day's maintenance, and then from the labor time which up till now he had to devote entirely to make what was absolutely necessary, he has a portion over for other labor, and it is this spare labor which he is now able to devote to the making of a tool. And from this quite correct consideration, Rodbertus draws the conclusion that it is only the increasing of the productivity of labor and not saving which makes the existence of such a primary capital possible. And still more briefly does Klein Wachter give expression to the same idea when he says, he who transfers a portion, say a half of his revenue, to the bank is merely industrious. He might, for instance, by a five hours day of labor earn his bare maintenance and devote, say, every afternoon to his recreation or enjoyment, instead of which the man works 10 hours a day and regularly carries what he earns in the afternoon to the savings bank. I think this objection is very easily met. It is simply not correct to say that the man is merely industrious. He is industrious and saving. If he were simply industrious, he would, every day, spend the produce of the afternoon's labor along with the produce of the forenoon's labor in immediate enjoyment of life. That he does not do so is because he is saving as well. I freely admit the greater industriousness causing a return far exceeding necessary requirements and similarly greater productivity of labor very much facilitates saving, just as I admit also that without acquisition, saving as well as formation of capital is absolutely impossible. But I must as emphatically claim recognition of the fact that the greatest acquisition could not lead to the formation of capital if a portion of it were not withdrawn from present use and saved. Production and saving form two equally indispensable conditions of the form of capital, and it is only dialectical one-sidedness which, unfortunately, has already played much too great a part in the doctrine of capital that could deny the cooperation of either of them. But does not this involve me in contradiction with the proposition so earnestly contended for in last chapter, that all goods, and consequently all capital proceed from two elements, of which saving is not one, from nature and labor. Certainly it is not. It is not my intention to do so as Senior did, and try to make saving a third factor in production along with nature and labor. It does not stand beside these factors, but behind them. It does not share with them in the work of production in such a way that any part of the same is due to it solely and peculiarly. It only affects that the productive powers, nature and labor, which in any case must do the whole work of production, are directed straight to this and no other goal, the production of capital and not of consumption goods. In a word, it has its place, not among the means of production, but among the motives of production, the motives which decide the direction of production. The proposition then, that nature and labor are the only true productive powers, can stand perfectly well beside the wider assertion that if capital is to come into existence at all, there must, first, be certain intellectual dispositions through which renunciation is made of a portion of the immediate consumption that is otherwise possible. In other words, there must be saving. Saving, it is objected again, is a non-consumption, something purely negative, and a pure negation can bring forth nothing.
to my mind, there is more dialectic than truth in this argument. Is it quite correct to say that saving is something purely negative? How comes it, then that although nothing is easier than a pure not doing, so many people feel saving an uncommonly difficult and disagreeable thing? In truth, saving is a mental business, and often, indeed, though not always, a very troublesome mental business, preceded by long deliberation and conflict between contending motives. This, of course, does not constitute an act of production, and the representatives of the above dialectical objection are, in the end, quite right in raising it as an argument against those theorists who would dignify saving by the name of a third factor in production. But, indeed, simply mental as saving may be, it is sufficient to effectually fill the role which we have assigned to it in the formation of capital, such as exerting an influence on the direction of production. For the rest, which it be a pure negation or not, we can in no case allow dialectical considerations to interfere with establishing important scientific facts, and it is an important scientific fact which must be reiterated all the more emphatically that it has been disputed, that the progress of capital stands in a causal relation with the extension of the immediate claims put forward by individuals and peoples. Whatever body, be it an individual or a people, extends the claims of the moment so far as to exhaust during the current period, the entire amount of consumption goods which its income makes possible for the current period can neither make new nor increase old capital, and this fact finds accurate and straightforward expression in the proposition that saving is an indispensable condition of the formation of capital. Suppose now that we have succeeded, after considerable trouble, in establishing the proposition that capital comes into existence through saving and devotion, to production of what is saved, we have still got but half the answer to our inquiry as to the formation of capital. We have now to face the further question, on what does it depend that people can, will, and actually do save and produce intermediate products? Strictly speaking, this second question is the more important of the two. It points to the impelling and working forces in the formation of capital, while all that has proceeded has merely laid down the external form of the process. The most general answer, but still, it must be confessed, insufficient for all its generality, runs thus, what people look to in economic life is the value of goods. Here we touch a subject which is too important, and too difficult to be spoken of merely in passing. To obtain the basis for the principal part of our work, the explanation of interest we require to go into the theory of value. I shall, therefore, leave the theory of the formation of capital at this stage, returning to it shortly in the last chapter, where we shall give it the logical conclusion that it still lacks. Book 3. Value. Chapter 1. The Two Conceptions of Value. In the science of political economy, as an ordinary speech, two very distinct things have usually been classed together under the one name of value. From the first, it could scarcely escape notion that there was a difference between them, but the full extent of the difference was certainly underrated. Instead of being recognized as phenomena, belonging to entirely distinct categories of thought, they were quite falsely represented as members of one and the same group of phenomena, and under the not very felicitous name of use value and exchange value, they were assumed to be subspecies of one universal conception of value and distinguished from each other as such. This distinction once made, however, the so-called use value was almost entirely dropped out of sight. Economists took no trouble to inquire any deeper into its nature, nor did they make any use of it in further investigations. They simply catalogued it, as it were, among the conceptions of political economy, and left it lying in a corner of their systems like a stone for which there was no use. It is only of very recent date that economical investigation has discovered in this stone rejected of the builders the basis and support of one of the most important conceptions of economics and has awakened to the fact that on it depends a group of the most notable laws, laws with consequences reaching far beyond the boundaries of the theory of value, and laws to which almost every branch of economic theory must go back for its root and spring. But, first of all, it is important that we give right names to those things which tradition has handed down to us 
under the inadequate designations of use value and exchange value, the two groups of phenomena to both of which popular usage has given the ambiguous name value, we shall distinguish as value in the subjective and value in the objective sense. Value in the subjective sense is the importance which a good or a complex of goods possesses with regard to the well-being of a subject. In this sense, I should say of any particular good that it was valuable to me if I recognized that my well-being was so associated with it that the possession of it satisfied some want secured me a gratification or feeling of pleasure which I should not have had without it, or saved me from a pain which, otherwise, I should have had to endure. In this case, the existence of the good means my gain, the absence of it my loss. In well-being, to me it is a matter of importance, for me it has value. By objective value, on the other hand, is meant the power or capacity of a good to procure some one objective result. In this sense, there are as many kinds of value as there are external results with which man may be connected. There is a nutritive value of food, a heating value of wood and coal, a fertilizing value of manures, a blasting value of explosives, and so on. In any expressions of this kind, all reference to the well-being or ill-being of a subject is excluded from the conception of value. If we affirm that beech has a superior heating value over pine, we only express the purely objective and, as it were, mechanical fact that with a definite weight of beech, a greater amount of heat can be raised than with the same weight of pine. In the above connections, then, instead of the word value, we use, as entirely synonymous with it, the expressions power or capacity, expressions which themselves suggest a purely objective relation. Instead of nutritive value, heat value, explosive value, we use nutritive power, or nutritive capacity, heating power, explosive power, and so on, as meaning exactly the same thing. The varieties of objective value just mentioned by way of illustration do not, however, belong to economical but to purely technical relations, and, however frequently they are referred to in economical textbooks, they do not properly belong to political economy at all. It does not fall within the province of our science to expound the heating value of wood nor in explaining the econo nor in explaining other economical phenomena has it occasion to lay stress on this heating value any more than it does on any other physical or technical fact i have given these illustrations purely as illustrations with the intention of putting in clearer relief the very intimately related nature with the above of that branch of objective values which of course has the greatest possible importance for political economy namely the objective exchange value of goods. By this expression, I mean the objective worth of goods in exchange, or in other words, the possibility of obtaining in exchange for them a quantity of other economical goods, this possibility being looked upon as a power or a property of the former goods. In this sense, we say that a horse is worth 50, or a house worth 1,000. If in exchange for these, we can obtain respectively 50 or 1,000. Here again, it must be noted that as in the kindred expressions, heating value and the like, we say nothing at all as to the influence which goods may exert on the well-being of any subject, whatever. We simply indicate the objective relation that for a particular good, a certain amount of other goods may be had in exchange. In this case also, the characteristic phenomenon recurs that the word value can be quite adequately replaced by the word power, and is indeed so replaced in popular speech. Besides the expression value and exchange, English economists use quite indifferently the expression purchasing power, and we Germans are beginning in the same way to put in general use the term Toschkraft. The economical theory of value has then the double task of interpreting, on the one hand, the laws of subjective value and, on the other, the laws of objective exchange value, as from the economic point of view by far the most important branch of objective value. The first part of this task we shall take up in the present book, the second in the following book, dealing with the theory of price. It is true that the two conceptions price and exchange value are by no means identical. Exchange value is the capacity of a good to obtain in exchange a quantity of other goods, 
price is that other quantity of goods, but the laws of these two coincide. So far as the law of price explains that a good actually obtains such and such a price, and why it obtains it, it affords at the same time the explanation that the good is capable, and why it is capable of obtaining a definite price. The law of price, in fact, contains the law of exchange value. Chapter 2. Nature and Origin of Subjective Value All goods without exception, indeed according to the very conception of them as good, possesses a certain relation to human well-being. There are, however, two essentially distinct grades of this relation. The good belongs to the lower grade when it possesses a general capacity to subserve human weal. The higher grade, on the other hand, demands that a good should be more than merely a sufficient cause. It must be an indispensable condition of human well-being, a condition of such a kind that some gratification stands or falls with the having or wanting of the good. In the expressive vocabulary of everyday life, we find a separate designation for these grades. The lower is called usefulness, the higher value. This distinction, already recognized, in common speech, we must try to make as clear and well marked as its fundamental importance for the whole theory of value deserves. A man dwells besides a bubbling spring of water. He has filled his cup, and the spring goes on, pouring out enough to fill a hundred other cups every minute. Another man is traveling in the desert. A long day's journey over glowing sand still divides him from the nearest oasis, and he has come to his last cup of water. What is the relation in each case between the cup of water and the well-being of its owner? A single glance shows us that the relation is very dissimilar, but wherein lies the difference? Simply that in the former case, we have only the lower grade of the relation we call well-being, that of usefulness. In the latter case, we have the higher grade as well. In the first case, just as the second case, the cup of water is useful, that is, capable of satisfying a want, and moreover, in exactly the same degree, for evidently the refreshing qualities of the water, the qualities on which its capacity to quench thirst is based, such as coolness, taste, etc., are not in the least degree weakened by the fact that other cups of water chance to possess similar properties, nor, in the second case, are these refreshing qualities in the least augmented by the accidental circumstances that there is no other water near. On the other hand, the two cases become essentially distinct when considered with reference to the second grade. Looking at the former case, we must say that the possession of the cup of water does not provide the man with one single satisfaction more, nor its loss with the one satisfaction less, than he could have obtained without it. If he has that particular cup of water, he can quench his thirst with it. If he has not that cup, well, he can quench his thirst quite as well with the other hundreds which the spring puts freely at his disposal every minute of the day. If he likes, therefore, he may make that one cup the cause of the satisfaction by quenching his thirst with it. An indispensable condition of his satisfaction it cannot be, for his well-being it is dispensable, unimportant, indifferent. It is quite otherwise in the second case. Here we must say that if our traveller had not that one last cup, he could not quench his thirst, he must bear its pangs unassuaged, perhaps even succumb to them. In the cup of water, then, in this case, we see not merely a sufficient cause, but the indispensable condition, the sai quinon of human well-being. Here it is of consequence, even of urgency, it possesses importance for his well-being. Now it is not too much to say that the distinction here drawn is one of the most fruitful and fundamental in the whole range of our science. It does not owe any existence to the microscope nor to the hair-splitting distinction of the logician. It has its life in the world of men who know it and who use it and take it as a guide for their common attitude towards the world of goods, not only as regards the intellectual estimate they apply to these goods, but as regards their actual business transactions. About goods which are only useful, the practical businessman is careless and indifferent. The academic knowledge that a good may be of use cannot evoke any efficient interest in the good in face of the other knowledge that the same use may be obtained without it. 
such goods are practically not as regards our well-being and we treat them as such we are not put about when we lose them and we make no effort to gain them who would fret at or make an effort to prevent the spilling of a cup of water at the spring or the escape of a cubic foot of atmospheric air where on the other hand the sharpened glance of the economic man recognizes that some satisfaction well-being gratification is connected with a particular good there the effective interest which we take in our own well-being is transferred to the good which we recognize as this condition we see and value our own welfare in it we recognize its importance for us as value and finally we develop an anxiety proportioned to the greatness of that importance to acquire and hold the good thus formally defined value is the importance which good or complex of goods possesses with respect to the well-being of a subject this addition to this definition regarding the kind and reason of importance is strictly speaking not necessary since goods can only have an effective importance for human well-being in one way which is by the indispensable condition the sine qua non of some one utility which subserves it in view of the fact however that in other definitions of value it is very often translated as an importance while the importance spoken of rests erroneously on a simple capability of utility or not less erroneously on the necessity of expenditure of costs or the like we shall define it unambiguously and exactly as the importance which the goods or complexes of goods acquire as the recognized condition of a utility which makes for the well-being of a subject and would not be obtained without them all goods have usefulness but all goods have not value for the emergence of value there must be scarcity as well as usefulness not absolute scarcity but scarcity relative to the demand for the particular class of goods to put it more exactly goods acquire value when the whole available stock of them is not sufficient to cover the wants depending on them for satisfaction or when the stock would not be sufficient without these particular goods on the other hand those goods remain valueless which are offered in such superfluity that all the wants which they are fitted to satisfy are completely supplied and when beyond that there is a surplus which can find no further employment in the satisfaction of want and which at the same time is large enough to spare the goods or quantities of goods that we are valuing without imperiling the satisfaction of any one want after what has been said as to the nature of value it should not be very difficult to prove these propositions when the supply of goods is not sufficient and some of the wants which they are adapted to satisfy must remain unsatisfied it is clear that the loss of even a single good involves the loss of a possible satisfaction while the addition of a single good involves the acquisition of a satisfaction otherwise impossible and it is clear consequently that some gratification or form of well-being depends on the existence of that good conversely it is quite as clear that if goods of any class are to be had in superfluity there is no harm done if one of the goods be lost since it can be immediately replaced from the superfluous stock nor any utility got if another such good be added since it cannot be employed in any useful way suppose for instance that a peasant requires ten gallons of water per day and no more for general purposes save for his own drinking for that of his family and servants for watering his cattle for cleansing flushing etc and suppose that the only spring within reach supplies no more than eight gallons a day it is quite evident that he cannot spare one single gallon from his water supply without suffering to a more or less sensible extent as regards the wants and aims of his economy every gallon in this case is the condition of a definite sphere of usefulness even if the spring supplied just ten gallons this would still be true but if the spring supplied twenty gallons per day it is just as obvious the loss of one gallon would not do the slightest injury to our peasant he can only employ ten gallons usefully and he must let the other ten gallons flow away unused if one gallon is spilled it is replaced from the overflow and the only effect is that now the unusable surplus 
is reduced from 10 gallons to 9. Now, as it is the insufficient or the barely sufficient goods that are the objects of economical care, the goods we economize or endeavor to acquire and keep, while such goods as are to be had in superfluity are free to everybody, we may express the above propositions shortly in the following form. All economical goods have value. All free goods are valueless. In any case, it must steadily be borne in mind that it is only relations of quantity that decide whether any particular good is merely capable of use, or is also the condition of a utility for us. Chapter 3. The Amount of Value In asking what is the principle that regulates the amount of value, we pass to a sphere where lies the chief task of a theory of value, and where at the same time lie its greatest difficulties. These difficulties are the result of a peculiar coincidence of circumstances. From one point of view, the true principle almost suggests itself. If the value of a good is its importance to human well-being, and if this importance means that some portion of our well-being is dependent on our having of the good, it is clear that the amount of the good's value must be determined by the amount of well-being, which depends on it. Goods will have high value if our well-being depends on them to any important extent, low value if it does not. But from another point of view, there are certain facts in the economical world which seem to give the lie to this very simple and natural explanation. Everybody knows that in practical economic life, precious stones possesses a higher value, while bread and iron have a moderate value, and air and water usually have no value at all. Now everybody knows that without air and water we simply could not exist, and that the uses of bread and iron are extremely important, while precious stones, for the most part, only satisfy the love of ornament, and have accordingly a very inferior importance for human well-being. It would appear, then, that one who holds fast by the principle that the amount of a good's value is determined by the importance of the services which it may render to human well-being, must expect to find, in precious stones, a low value, in bread and iron a high value, and in water and light the very highest value. But facts show that exactly the opposite of this is the case. This startling phenomenon has been a veritable rock of offense in the theory of value. The highest utility accompanied by the smallest value is a strange paradox. It is true that in confusing usefulness and use value, economists did not apprehend and describe the state of the case quite exactly. When they falsely ascribed to the iron a high use value and to the diamond a low use value, the only reason for surprise was that the exchange value of these goods went so entirely in the opposite direction, but this was only to change the name of the opposition, not to take away any of its sharpness. There were plenty of attempts to bridge the fatal contradiction by involved explanations, but these were unsuccessful. And so it happens that, from Adam Smith's time to our own, innumerable theorists have despaired of finding the nature and measure of value in any relation to human well-being, and have fallen back upon quite foreign and often wonderful lines of explanation, such as labor or labor time cost of production, resistance of nature to man, and the like, but unable to get rid of the feeling that the value of goods must have something to do with utility and human well-being, they put down the want of harmony between the utility and the value of goods as a rare and perplexing contradiction. In what follows, I mean to prove that the older theory had no need to abandon the most natural explanation. The measure of the utility which depends on a good is actually, and everywhere, the measure of value for that good. To prove this, nothing more is necessary than a dispassionate but keen casuistical investigation into the question, what is the gain to our well-being that in any circumstances depends on a good? I say deliberately casuistical investigation for the entire theory of the subjective value is properly nothing else 
than a system of casuistry, determining when, under what circumstances, and how far our well-being is dependent upon any particular good. It is very remarkable that the ordinary man in everyday life is constantly making casuistic distinctions of this kind, and making them with great certainty. He seldom makes a mistake, and he never makes a mistake in the principle. He may, of course, ascribe a trifling value to a diamond if he mistakes it for a glass bead. For the theoretical consideration, which is quite irrelevant here, that without water the human race could not continue in life, would never lead to him to the casuistical conclusion that every gallon of water which flows from the village spring is a good of priceless value, or worth thousands of pounds. Our task, then, is to hold the mirror up to those casuistical distinctions which men make in the ordinary affairs of life, and to bring those laws which the ordinary man instinctively handles with certainty, to clear and conscious presentation. What human well-being may gain from a good, and thus the advantage which is dependent on a good, is, in most cases, the satisfaction of want. The casuistical consideration that really determines how far a person's well-being depends upon a particular good is found in the answer to two questions. First, which among two or more wants depends on it? And second, what is the urgency of the dependent want or of its satisfaction? For convenience, we shall take the second question first and answer it in the present chapter. It is a familiar fact that our wants vary very greatly in importance. We are accustomed to rank them according to the seriousness of the consequences which their non-satisfaction has on our well-being. Thus we attach the greatest weight to those wants the non-satisfaction of which would be followed by death. Next to these we place wants the non-satisfaction of which would result in some serious permanent injury to our health, honor, or happiness. Below these again come such wants as expose us to more temporary injuries, pains, or deprivations. Finally, we put in the very lowest class those wants the non-satisfaction of which costs us nothing more than a very slight unpleasantness, or the deprivation of some quite insignificant pleasure. Arranging our wants according to these characteristics, we obtain a regularly graduated scale of wants. Of course, as differences of bodily and mental disposition, culture, and so on, result in very marked differences of wants, this scale will come out very different for different individuals, and even for the same individual at different times. All the same, every practical man, though his means are limited, must have a scale more or less clearly before his mind if he would make a choice among these wants. And even theorists have often had occasion to sketch such a scale from the objective standpoint of impartial scientific consideration. So far, everything would be simple and certain were it not that there is an ambiguity when we speak of graduation or ranking of wants. We may mean by these terms either the graduation of wants as kinds of wants or the graduation of degrees of wants. The concrete individual feelings of want and these two are essentially different, even divergent. If we compare kinds of wants looked at as a whole, according to their importance for human well-being, there is no doubt whatever that to the needs of subsistence would be allotted the first rank, to the needs of housing and clothing a rank not much inferior to the wants satisfied by tobacco, spirituous liquors, music, etc. A very much less important place well, the wants of ornament and the like would have a very insignificant rank indeed. Now the graduation of concrete feelings of want is essentially different from this. Within one and the same kind of want, the feeling of want is not always uniform, not always equally strong. Every feeling of hunger is not equally intense, and every satisfaction of hunger is not equally perfect. In the class of needs of substance, for instance, the concrete want of a man who has not eaten a morsel for eight days is infinitely more urgent than that of another man who has already got through two courses of his ordinary dinner. 
and is meditating whether he should have a third, in the graduation of concrete wants, we have to deal with an entirely different state of affairs, and with a much greater variation. In the scale of kinds of wants, the needs of subsistence came far and away before the desire for tobacco, for liquor, for ornament, etc. In the scale of concrete wants, wants belonging to the most various kinds cross and intersect each other. It is true that even here the most important concrete wants in the most important classes of wants stand at the top of the scale, but the less important concrete wants of these classes are frequently overpassed by concrete wants of much inferior classes. The bottom members of the highest class, perhaps, overpassed by the top member of the lowest class. It is very much the same as if a geographer were one time to arrange the Alps, Pyrenees, and Harz by their height as mountain ranges, and another time were to arrange their single summits. As ranges the Alps would, of course, come before the Pyrenees, and the Pyrenees before the Harz. But in comparing individual heights, a great many of the Alpine summits would take rank below individual peaks of the Pyrenees, some even below hills in the insignificant Harz. And now the question is, when goods have to be valued, by which scale shall we measure the importance of the wants they subserve, the scale of kinds or the scale of concrete wants? When the older theory came to this dividing of ways, the very first opportunity offered it of making a mistake. It chose the wrong way. It adopted the scale of kinds. On this scale, the class needs of subsistence occupies one of the most conspicuous places while the class desire of ornament has a subordinate place. Thus the older theory decided that bread universally has a high use value and diamonds a low use value, and naturally was very much astonished that the value practically put upon those two kinds of goods was exactly the reverse of this. Now their conclusion was quite wrong. What the casuist must say to himself is, if I have a slice of bread, I can indeed still this or that concrete feeling of hunger as it arises. But I can never satisfy the totality of such feelings, the actual and possible present and future feelings of hunger, which together make of the kind needs of substance. Obviously then, it is quite out of place to attempt to measure the service which the piece of bread can render me by the fact that the totality of such feelings possesses much or little importance. To do so would be like the act of a man who, on being asked as to the height of the Kallenberg, an insignificant offshoot of the Alps near Vienna, were to ascribe to it the height of the Alpine chain. As a fact, it would never occur to us in practical life to value every bit of bread in our possession as a treasure of infinite importance. We do not rejoice every time we buy a baker's roll as if we had saved a life, nor do we blame a man as spendthrift when he carelessly gives away a slice of bread or throws it to a dog. Yet this is the judgment we must pass if we would transfer the importance of this kind needs of subsistence on the satisfaction of which our very life depends to the goods which actually minister to that satisfaction. This much is clear, then, that the value we ascribe to goods has nothing to do with the graduation of kinds of want, but only with the graduation of concrete wants, in order to bring out all that is involved in this conclusion. It may be desirable to put more clearly certain points relating to the composition of this graduated scale, and to put the whole argument on a sure basis than has been done in the foregoing analysis. Most of our wants are divisible in the sense that they are susceptible of piecemeal satisfaction. When I am hungry, I am not compelled to choose between satisfying my hunger completely or going entirely unsatisfied. I may take the edge off my appetite by a moderate meal, intending perhaps to dispel the feeling of hunger altogether later on by a full meal, or perhaps to make shift with the partial satisfaction I have got. Naturally, the partial satisfaction of a concrete want has another and a smaller importance for my well-being. Than a complete satisfaction of the same, and, to a certain extent, this of itself would suffice to call attention 
to the above mentioned phenomenon, that within a kind of wants, there are concrete wants, or degrees of wants, of varying importance. But with this is connected a further notable fact. It is an experience as familiar as it is deep rooted in human nature that the same enjoyment, when constantly repeated, gives us beyond a certain point a constantly decreasing gratification till in the end it changes into its opposite. Any one can prove for himself that at a meal, when the fourth or fifth course is reached, the appetite is not nearly so keen as the first course, and that if there are too many courses, a point is reached where enjoyment turns into discomfort or disgust. The same occurs in too long a concert, lecture, walk, play, and generally speaking, in the case of most physical as well as intellectual enjoyments. If we put the essence of these well-known facts into technical language, we get the following proposition. The concrete degrees of want into which our sensations of want may be divided, or the successive degrees of satisfaction obtained from similar amounts of goods, are usually of very dissimilar importance, indeed of importance which diminishes step by step to zero. This will explain a whole series of propositions, which were simply asserted above. It explains firstly how in one and the same kind of wants, there may be concrete wants or degrees of wants of varying urgency. Indeed, in the case of all divisible satisfactions, as the term is defined above, that is, in the great majority of cases, this not only may be, but must be so, quite normally and, so to speak, organically. It explains again that even in the most important kinds of wants, there are lower and lowest grades of importance. Properly speaking, the most important kind is marked off from the less important only by the fact that to some extent its head rises higher than the others, while its base stands on the same level as all the others. And finally, it explains that not only may it occasionally happen, as I have just said, that a concrete want belonging to a kind, which on the whole is more important, may be outweighed by some individual concrete want of a kind, on the whole less important, but that this happens as a perfectly normal, ordinary, and organic occurrence. There will always, for instance, be innumerable concrete substance wants, which are weaker and less urgent than many a concrete want of quite unimportant classes. Such things as the desire of ornament the love of dancing, the craving for tobacco, etc., will often be stronger than the need of good food and warm clothing. If we try to represent the classification of our wants by a typical scheme, we must, on the principles just laid down, give it something like the following shape. In this scheme, the Roman figures indicate the various kinds of wants, decreasing in order of importance from 1 to 10. 1 indicates the most urgent kind, say the needs of subsidence. Five indicates the kind of medium importance, say that of spirituous liquors, while ten indicates the least important conceivable kind. The Arabic figures ten to one, again, indicate the concrete wants and degrees of want that occur in the different kinds. Their rank being shown by assigning the figure ten to the most important conceivable want. The figure nine to that next in importance, and so on, till the last figure, one, indicates the most insignificant want likely to occur. This scheme now puts before us the fact that the more important the kind, the higher stands the most important concrete want contained in the kind. But it shows at the same time that in each kind there are all grades of importance, from the greatest to least. The only exceptions in the scheme occurs in classes four and seven, in which some individual members of the descending scale are wanting. These represent the comparatively rare kinds, where on technical grounds a successive satisfaction by means of partial acts is either incomplete or quite impossible, and where accordingly the want must either be entirely satisfied or not satisfied at all. The want met by kitchen ranges, for instance, is generally met so completely by one range that we should have absolutely no use for a second. Finally, the scheme shows that the most important kind, one, there occur 
the concrete wants which bear the lowest figure of importance, while in almost all other kinds which stand under it in importance, there are concrete wants that bear higher figures. Chapter 4. The Marginal Utility Turning now to the second question suggested in the last chapter, we ask, of several or many wants, which one is it that actually depends on a particular good? This question would not be put at all if the circumstances of economic life were so simple that single wants always stood over against single goods. If a good were adapted to satisfy a single concrete want, and if it were, at the same time, the only one of its kind, or, at least, the only one of its available kind, it would be quite clear, without further consideration, that the satisfaction of a single want depended on our command over the single good. But in practical life, the matter is scarcely ever so simple as it is. On the contrary, it is usually complicated simultaneously from two sides. First, one and the same good is usually adapted to satisfy various concrete wants, which wants, again, possess various degrees of importance. And second, several goods of one and the same kind are frequently available, thus leaving it to caprice which good will be used for the satisfaction of an important and which for an unimportant want. To give the simplest possible example, I have been shooting for a few days on the mountains, and by some accident I miss my companions. I am far from any house or village, and the only food I have for myself and my dog is two entirely similar baker's rolls. It is clear that the satisfaction of my hunger is of infinitely more importance to me than the satisfaction of my dog's hunger, and it is just as clear that it lies with me which of the two rolls I shall consume, and which I shall give to the dog. And now the question arises, which of the two wants here is dependent on the bread? One is tempted to answer, that want to which the bread was actually devoted, but it is evident at once that this is an erroneous conclusion. It would amount to say that the two roles, devoted as they were to the satisfaction of wants of different importance, must possess different values, while it does not admit of a question that two similar goods available under similar conditions must be entirely equal in value. Here again, an easy casuistical consideration gives the proper solution. The problem is, which among several wants is dependent on a commodity? This resolves itself very simply when it is known which want it is that would fail of its satisfaction. If that commodity were not present, that want is evidently the dependent one. And now it is easy to show that the want which failed of its satisfaction would not be that want which the particular commodity was accidentally and capriciously selected to satisfy, but would always be the least important among all the wants in question. That is to say, among all those wants which would formerly have been provided for out of the total stock of this class of goods. Consideration for one's own convenience, as obvious as it is imperative, induces every reasonable man who acts economically to maintain a certain fixed order in the satisfaction of his wants. No one would be so foolish as to exhaust the resources at his command in satisfying trifling wants, or wants that could be easily ignored, and thus to deprive himself of the means of satisfying necessary wants. On the contrary, everyone would take care to use the resources at his command. In the first instance, to provide for his most important wants, then for wants that come after these in importance, then for those of the third rank, and so on, always arranging in such a way that the lesser wants were only provided for when all the higher wants had been supplied, and there still remained some means of satisfaction to spare. We act according to the same obvious and reasonable principles. When our stock undergoes a change by the loss of one member of that stock, Naturally, this will alter the plan according to which we have been employing our resources. Not all the wants we had arranged to satisfy can now be provided for, and some abatement in the totality of satisfaction is unavoidable. But of course, the wise man will try to lay the burden on the least sensitive spot, that is to say, if the loss chances to be in a commodity 
which was destined to a more important use. He will not give up the satisfaction of this more important want, and, by holding on obstinately to his old plan, provide satisfaction for the less important wants. He may be sure that he will satisfy the more important want, and will do so by withdrawing provision from that want, among all the wants hitherto marked out for provision, on the satisfaction of which least depends. To put it in terms of our former illustration, if our sportsman loses the role which he has meant for himself, he will scarcely feed his dog with the one that remains, and expose himself to the danger of starving. He will suddenly change his plan, elevate the role that remains into fulfilling its more important function only, and shift the loss to the least important function, the feeding of the dog. The case then stands as follows. Wants which are more important than his last want will not be affected by the loss of the good for their satisfaction, is as before guaranteed in case of need by the replacement of substitutes. Nor will those wants be affected which are less important than this marginal want. For they go unsatisfied, whether the good is there or not. The only want affected is the last of those that otherwise would be satisfied. It will be satisfied if the good is there. It will not be satisfied if it is not there. It is thus the dependent want we are seeking. Here, then, we have reached the goal of the present inquiry, and may formulate it thus. The value of a good is measured by the importance of that concrete want or partial want, which is the least urgent among the wants that are met from the available stock of similar goods. What determines the value of a good, then, is not its greatest utility, not its average utility, but the least utility which it, or one like it, might be reasonably employed in providing under the concrete economical conditions. To save ourselves the repetition of this circumstantial description, which all the same had to be somewhat circumstantial to be quite correct, we shall follow Weezer in calling this least utility the utility that stands on the margin of the economically permissible, the economic marginal utility of the good. The law which governs amount of value then may be put in the following very simple formula. The value of a good is determined by the amount of its marginal utility. This proposition is the keystone of our theory of value, but it is more. In my opinion, it is the master key to the action of the practical economic men with regard to goods. In the simplest case, as in all the tangle and complication which our present varied economic life has created, we find men valuing the goods with which they have to deal by the marginal utility of these goods, and dealing with them according to the result of this valuation, and to this extent the doctrine of marginal utility is not only the keystone of the theory of value, but as affording the explanation of all economical transactions. It is the keystone of all economical theory. Those who have observed practical life closely will, I think, be convinced that this claim is not exaggerated. Rightly to observe and rightly to interpret what has been observed, however, is an art, not always easy, and in what follows accordingly, we shall make use of the value of theory to guide us in observing and interpreting what falls within its sphere. We begin, then, with an illustration of the greatest conceivable simplicity. A colonial farmer, whose log but stands by itself in the primeval forest, far away from the busy haunts of men, has just harvested five sacks of corn. These must serve him till the next autumn. Being a thrifty soul, he lays his plans for the employment of these sacks over the year. One sack he absolutely requires for the subsistence of his life till the next harvest. A second he requires to supplement his bare living to the extent of keeping himself hale and vigorous. More corn than this in the shape of bread and farinaceous food generally he has no desire for. On the other hand, it would be very desirable to have some animal food, and he sets aside, therefore, a third sack to feed poultry, a fourth sack he destines for the making of coarse spirits. Suppose now that his various personal wants have been fully provided for by this apportionment of the four sacks, and that he cannot think of anything better to do with the fifth sack than feed a number of parrots whose antics amuse him. Naturally, these various methods of employing the corn are not equal in importance. 
If, to express this shortly in figures, we make out a scale of 10 degrees of importance, our farmer will naturally give the highest figure 10 to the sustenance of his life. To the maintenance of his health, he will give, say, the figure 8. Then, going down the scale, he might give the figure 6 to the improvement of his fare by the addition of meat, the figure 4 to the enjoyment he gets from the liquor, and finally, the keeping of parrots as expressing the least degree of importance. He will give the lowest possible figure one, and now putting ourselves in imagination at the standpoint of the farmer we ask, what in these circumstances will be the importance as regarding his well-being of one sack of corn? This, as we know, will be most simply tested by inquiring how much utility will he lose if a sack of corn gets lost? Suppose we carry out this in detail. Evidently, our farmer would not be very wise if he thought of deducting the lost sack from his own consumption, and imperiled his health and life while using the corn as before to make brandy and feed parrots. On consideration, we must see that only one course is conceivable. With the four sacks that remain, our farmer will provide for the four most urgent groups of wants, and give up only the satisfaction of the last and least important. The marginal utility in this case, the keeping of parrots. The only difference then, that his having or not having the fifth sack of corn makes to his well-being is that, in the one case, he may allow himself the pleasure of keeping parrots. In the other, he may not, and he will rightly value a single sack of his stock according to this unimportant utility, and not only one sack, but every single sack. For if the sacks are equal to one another, it will be all the same to our farmer whether he loses sack A or sack B, so long as, behind the lost one, there are still four other sacks for the satisfying of his more urgent wants. To vary the illustration, assume that our farmer's wants remain the same, and that he only has three sacks of grain. What now is the value of one sack to him? The test again is quite easily applied. If he has three sacks, he can and will provide for the three most important groups of wants. If he has only two sacks, he will be obliged to limit himself to the satisfying of the two most important groups and give up the satisfying of the third, that of animal food. The possession of the third sack, and the third sack, be it remembered, is not a definite sack, but any of the three sacks, so long as there are other two behind it, directly carries with it therefore the satisfaction of the third most important want, that is, the last or least of those wants covered by the three sacks which constitute his total stock. Any estimate other than that, according to the marginal utility, would, in this case, also obviously run counter to facts, and would be quite incorrect. Finally, suppose that our farmer's wants remain as before, and that he only possesses one single sack of corn. In this case, it is perfectly clear that all less important methods of employing the corn are out of court, and that it will be devoted to and spent in sustaining the farmer's life, a function for which it just suffices. And it is as clear that if this single sack fails, the farmer will no longer be able to support himself in life. His possession of the sack, therefore, means life. His loss of it means death. The single sack of corn has the greatest conceivable importance for the well-being of the farmer, and all this is still in conformity with our principle of marginal utility. The greatest utility, the preservation of life, is here the soul, as well as the last or marginal utility. These estimates, according to the marginal utility, are not merely academic. No one will doubt that our farmer on due occasion, say, on an offer made him for the corn would act practically according to the same estimates. Any one of us placed in his position would undoubtedly be inclined to let one of the five sacks go pretty cheap in consideration of and in correspondence with its small marginal utility. He would charge considerably more for one of the three sacks, and he would not let the irreplaceable single sack with its enormous marginal utility go for any price whatever. Transfer now the field of illustration from the solitary in the primeval forest to the bustle of a highly organized economic community. 
Here we encounter, in an altogether dominating position, the empirical proposition that quantity of goods stands in inverse ratio to value of goods. The more goods of one kind there are in the market, the smaller. Ceteris paribus is the value of the single commodity, and vice versa. Everyone knows that economic theory has made use of this empirical proposition, the most elementary proposition in the doctrine of price, to establish the law of supply and demand. But this proposition maintains its validity quite apart from exchange and price. For instance, how much more value does a collector put upon the single specimen which represents a class in his collection than upon one of a dozen of such specimens? It is easy to show that well-authenticated facts of experience like these follow. As a natural consequence from our theory of marginal utility, the more individual goods there are available in any class, the more completely can the wants to which they relate be satisfied, and the less important are the wants which are last satisfied, those whose satisfaction is imperiled by the failure of one of the goods. In other words, the more individual goods there are available in any class, the smaller is the marginal utility, which determines the value. If, again, there are available so many individual goods of one class that, after all the wants to which they are relative are completely satisfied, there still remains a number of goods for which no further useful employment can be found, then the marginal utility is equal to zero, and a commodity of that particular class is valueless. Here, then, we have an entirely natural explanation of the phenomenon which originally struck us as so surprising that comparatively useless things, such as pearls and diamonds, have so high a value, while infinitely more useful things, like bread and iron, have a far less value, and water and air no value at all. Pearls and diamonds are to be had in such small quantities that the relative want is only satisfied to a trifling extent. And the point of marginal utility which the satisfaction reaches stands relatively high. Happily for us, on the other hand, bread and iron, water and light, are, as a rule, to be had in such quantities that the satisfaction of all the more important wants which depend on them is assured. Only very trifling concrete wants, or no wants at all, are dependent, for instance, on the command over a piece of bread or a glass of water. It is, of course, true that in abnormal circumstances, as, for instance, in besieged towns or in desert journeys, where water and food are scarce, and small stores only suffice to meet the most urgent concrete wants of meat and drink, the marginal utility flies up. According to our principles, the value of those goods otherwise, of so little account, must rise also, and the inference finds ample empirical confirmation in the enormous prices paid in such circumstances for the most wretched means of subsidence. Thus those very facts, which at first sight, seem to contradict our theory that the amount of value is dependent on the amount of utility conditioned, on closer examination afford a striking confirmation of it. Chapter 5. Complications The cases we have hitherto considered have been comparatively easy of interpretation, but practical economic life brings out a great many complications which the practical man treats with easy assurance but the theorist finds considerable difficulty in explaining. To understand these, everything depends on the correctness of our casuistical decision as to that amount of utility, which in the given circumstances is the marginal utility. For this purpose, the following general direction may serve as master key to all the more difficult problems of value. We must look at the economic position of the person who is estimating the value of a good from two points of view. First, we must, in thought, add the good to his stock, and consider what further and lesser concrete wants can now be satisfied. Second, we must, in thought, deduct the good from his stock, and consider again what concrete wants will still be satisfied. In the latter case, of course, it becomes manifest that a certain layer of wants, which is the lowest layer, has lost its former provision. This lowest layer indicates the marginal utility that determines the valuation. The first very obvious but theoretically not unimportant application leads us to recognize 
that in valuing a good sometimes it is the importance of some one individual concrete want that is taken into consideration sometimes it is the importance of many concrete wants that has been summed up that is to say in the nature of things the layers of want that depend on the object we are valuing may turn out to be very various in compass and extent according to the constitution of that object if it is a single individual of a perishable group of goods for instance of food the marginal utility will usually include no more than one single concrete want or even a partial want if the object again is a durable good and thus susceptible of repeated acts of use or if it is a number of goods considered as a whole it is natural that an entire sum in certain circumstances a very great sum of concrete wants may be included in the layer of wants that depends on it on the possession or non-possession of a piano for instance depend hundreds of musical enjoyments on the possession of a cask of wine hundreds of pleasures of the palate and the importance of those pleasures naturally must be summed up in valuing these goods to pass on now to another far-reaching complication it follows from our earlier analysis that the marginal utility which determines the value of a good is not or is only accidentally identical with the utility which the good itself actually affords as a rule the marginal utility of any good is a foreign utility the utility of the last individual good or of the last similar part which may be taken to replace it in simple cases this utility although the utility of another good is at least the utility of a good of the same kind in the illustration already made use of the value of each individual sack of corn and therefore the value for instance of the first sack was determined by the utility of another the last sack of corn but always by the utility of a sack of corn the existence of organized exchange however may cause considerable complications here in making it possible to exchange goods of one kind without loss of time for goods of another kind it also makes it possible to shift a loss which occurs in one kind of goods over to another kind instead of replacing the loss of an individual good by withdrawing another good of the same kind from a less important employment and leaving there a vacancy we may summon goods of entirely different kinds from the occupation in which they have previously been employed and by way of barter procure the good required to supply the loss what is here lost in losing a good of class a is really the utility which the good taken from class b would otherwise have afforded. and since of course we should not think of taking the replacing good from the more important but from the least important employments in their spheres of utility the loss comes upon the marginal utility of the foreign good that transferred from class b to class a here therefore the marginal utility and the value of a good of one kind is measured by the marginal utility of a good of another kind by the good or portion of goods devoted to replace it to illustrate this my only overcoat has been stolen there is no question of replacing it directly by another coat of the same kind because i had only the one but all the same i shall not willingly let the loss caused me by the theft rest where it originally fell for the want which now makes itself felt that of warm winter clothing is a very urgent one its non-satisfaction may involve the most serious consequences to my health and even endanger my life i shall accordingly try to shift the incidence of the loss on to other kinds of goods and i shall do so by parting in exchange for a new overcoat with goods which in other circumstances would have been put to other uses the goods needed for this exchange i shall naturally withdraw from those uses which are of least consequence to me that is to say i shall take the goods which are of least marginal utility to me if i am well off i shall probably take the three dollars the price of a new great coat out of my cash box and i shall be able to buy one luxury the less with my diminished funds if i am not well off but am not exactly a poor man i shall have to fill up the deficit in the cash box by economizing on my housekeeping expenses for a couple of months 
if I am so poor that I neither have the money nor can save it out of my monthly income, I shall have to sell or pawn some of my articles of furniture, which can be most easily dispensed with. Finally, if I am so far reduced that I can provide only for the most urgent concrete wants in all the other classes, then I cannot shift the loss to other classes of wants, and needs must get along without an overcoat. If we put ourselves for the moment into the position of the owner of the overcoat and ask what it is as regards his well-being that depends on the coat being stolen or not, we shall find that the dependent circumstance is, in the first case, the spending of money on some luxury, in the second, some little curtailments in housekeeping, in the third, deprivation of the utility of the goods sold or pawned, in the fourth, the actual preservation of health. Only in the last, therefore, is the value of the coat determined by the immediate marginal utility of its own class, which marginal utility here happens to coincide with the utility of the good itself because the class is represented by a single individual. In all the other classes, it is determined by the marginal utility of foreign classes of goods and wants. Under the present economic system, where exchange is very highly organized, a notable importance attaches to the casuistical modification we have just described. We might almost say that it includes the majority of subjective estimate of value. For reasons which may be easily inferred from what has been said, we scarcely ever value goods that are indispensable to us by their direct utility, but almost always according to the substitutionary utility of foreign classes of goods. I should say, however, emphatically, that even where exchange is most highly organized, we do not always have the occasion to employ this latter method of valuation. It is only under certain conditions, although, of course, conditions then very often occur. That is to say, we employ the substitutionary method only when the marginal utility of the replacing good is less than the immediate marginal utility of the class into which it is transferred. To put it more exactly, when the prices of goods and, at the same time, the circumstances of provision for the various kinds of ones are such that if a loss occurring in one kind were born inside the kind itself, wants relatively more important would go unsatisfied than if the purchase price of the replacing good were drawn from other kinds of wants. But through all complications, it is always the least utility, immediately or immediately dependent on a good that determines its true marginal utility and value. Casuistical complications similar to those made possible by exchange may be caused by the fact that replacing goods can be quickly obtained by production. This kind of complication also has a very notable place in the theory of value, from the fact that it gives the key to the influence of cost of production on value. It requires, on that account, particularly careful treatment, but it will be more appropriate to give an independent consideration to this and to certain other casuistical complications somewhat later, and to return meantime to the simple fundamental law, the statement of which requires to be supplemented in a particular direction. Chapter 6. What Determines Marginal Utility Thus far, we have traced the amount of value which goods possess to the amount of their marginal utility. We may, however, pursue the causes which determine value one step further back, and ask on what circumstances the amount of this marginal utility itself depends. The answer is on the relation between wants and their provision. The way in which these two factors influence the amount of marginal utility has been suggested so often and so fully in the foregoing analysis that I need not say any further in way of explanation. I shall content myself with shortly formulating the law relating to it. It runs thus, the more comprehensive and the more intense the want, the higher the marginal utility, and vice versa. That is to say, the more numerous and the more intense the wants demanding satisfaction on the one hand, and the less the quantity of goods available to satisfy them on the other hand, the more important are the layers of want that must remain unsatisfied, and the higher, therefore, the marginal utility, and conversely, the fewer and the less urgent the wants, and the more goods there are to satisfy them. 
the deeper down the scale goes the satisfaction, and the lower falls the marginal utility in the value. It comes nearly to the same thing, only in a less precise form to say, usefulness and scarcity are the ultimate determinants of the value of goods, insofar as the degree of usefulness indicates whether in its way the good is capable of more or less important services to human well-being. So far, at the same time, does it indicate the height to which the marginal utility, in the most extreme case, may rise. But it is the scarcity that decides to what point the marginal utility actually does rise in the concrete case. This proposition that the height of marginal utility is determined by the relations of wants and provision admits of a great number of useful applications. Just now, I shall only emphasize two of these, which we shall have to make use of later on in the theory of objective exchange value. First, since the relations of wants and provision among individuals are extremely various, one and the same good may possess an entirely distinct subjective value for different persons, without which, indeed, it is difficult to see how there could be any exchanging at all. And thus, second, under otherwise similar circumstances, the same quantities of goods have a different value to rich and poor. To the rich, they have a smaller, to the poor, a larger value. The rich being amply supplied with all classes of goods, their satisfaction extends, generally speaking, to the more unessential wants, and the added or deducted satisfaction dependent on any particular good is consequently inconsiderable while to the poor man, who is generally able to provide for only his most urgent wants, the utility which depends on each good is much greater. Experience also shows that poor men find it a pleasant thing to acquire goods and a painful thing to lose them, where a similar gain or loss does not affect the rich at all. We would scarcely compare the state of mind of a poor clerk who received his monthly salary of $5, on the first day of the month and lost it his way home, with that of the millionaire who dropped the same sum. To the former, the loss would mean most painful privation over a whole month. To the latter, it would only involve the want of some idle luxury. Chapter 7. Alternative Uses In the present and following chapters of this book, we shall continue the discussion of various casuistical complications which arise in practical life in the formation of value. We must go into these for two reasons. First, in order to put on a sure foundation the perfect agreement of our theory of value with the phenomena of actual life. And second, because the conclusions arrived at now will find important applications later when we come to the theory of capital. It often happens that a commodity permits of being employed or used in two or even several entirely different ways. Wood, for instance, can be used for burning, or for building, grain for bread, for seed, or for distilling, salt as a relish, or as an auxiliary material, in the making of chemicals. Since then, in each different employment, the commodity supplies different wants, and these wants have, of course, different degrees of importance. Since further, in these different classes of wants, the relations of wants and its provision are frequently dissimilar. And since finally, the good, if it possesses a complex usefulness, does not usually possess this usefulness in the same degree at all times. On all these grounds, it is easy to see that the increment of utility which a good causes, or the marginal utility which it may afford, may vary very greatly from one employment to another. For instance, it may very well be that a pile of boards used for building materials affords its owner only a marginal utility that may be indicated by the figure 8, while the same board, used as fuel, would only afford a marginal utility indicated by the figure 4. The question now is, in such cases, which is the true economical marginal utility that determines the value of a good? The answer is easy enough. It is always the highest marginal utility, as has been already shown at length. The true marginal utility of any good is identical with the least utility which it may be employed economically in providing. 
If then several mutually exclusive employments compete for any particular good, it is clear that in any rational scheme of economy, the most important among them will get the preference. It alone is economically permissible. All less important uses are excluded, and as the good cannot be used in these employments, they can have no influence on the value set upon it. To put it in terms of our concrete example, if a peasant, after using his stock of wood to provide for all the more urgent wants of building and fuel, has still two uses for wood, two employments to which he could profitably put it, indicated by the numbers eight and four, but has only one pile of boards remaining, it is clear that he will apply them to the more important of the two uses, and leave the less important unprovided. So long as he can get a utility indicated by eight in building, he will not burn the wood to get a utility indicated by four. What depends then on his having or not having that particular pile of boards is the obtaining or not obtaining of the greater utility eight. We may put the rule in general terms thus, in the case of goods which allow of alternative uses or employments and are capable of furnishing different marginal utilities in these uses, that employment which yields the highest marginal utility is the standard for the economical value of the goods. This rule will be found amply confirmed by experience. Nobody would price oak furniture at its value as fuel, or sell a fine picture for the price of old canvas, or estimate a lady's hunter by its capacity to draw a butcher's cart. The formula, however, as now stated, might easily give rise to mistakes, and it will be advisable to anticipate these before going further. It might seem as if what I have just said was contradictory of what was said a little while ago. I now say that among several alternative employments having different marginal utilities, the highest is the standard, while a few pages ago it was demonstrated that if the immediate marginal utility of a good, say the utility the last good of its own class, was greater than its immediate marginal utility, say the marginal utility of goods of another class employed as substitutes, the lower marginal utility was the standard. The seeming contradiction is very simply explained. In the former case, we were dealing with a distinction between several ways in which a stock of goods could be employed. Now we are dealing with a distinction between two or more employments for which the stock of goods is not sufficient. And as I have already shown on a former occasion, the least of those uses to which a good is put always coincides exactly with the greatest of those uses which fail of provision if there is no such good. When then, in the above formula, I spoke of several alternative employments and of alternative marginal utilities, it must be understood as a method of expression which, literally speaking, is not quite correct. For naturally, of those competing employments, only one can economically be the last. Only one, therefore, can be the true marginal employment, that in which we find the marginal utility, while all the other employments are economically inhibited. They make the more demand on our attention, however, as being the first or most conspicuous representatives of an entire branch of employment. As soon as we think of this latter branch at all, these representatives force themselves, in the first place, on our consideration, and it is by choosing between them that we, as it were, give a cast and vote for one among entire groups of employment, such as carving and burning of wood, hacking and knacking of horses, and so on, an actual psychological procedure which appears to me best and most concisely indicated by the above formula. Here, however, it must be emphasized that the precedence given in the course of our inquiry to those pseudo-marginal employments is only formal. In our economical decisions, they enjoy no sort of material preference. Generally speaking, the fact that the employments to which a good may be put into several distinct branches has really not the slightest influence on our calculations of value. Just as we do not value goods according to kinds of forms, so we do not distribute them according to branches of employment. Every concrete employment is only looked on as a possible employment according to the rank which it maintains in virtue 
of the importance among all competing employments of every branch. And thus, in obedience to the principle of economic conduct, we follow one and the same course. We allocate our stock of goods among the concrete uses, which are of most importance on our scale. And the last of these determines for us the marginal utility and the value of the good. Now in doing so, it will often happen that only one single branch of employment is taken into consideration. This will, of course, be quite regularly. The case where we have only a single individual commodity to dispose of, but it will also happen where a whole series of concrete employments of one kind outweighs that of another kind in importance, and where at the same time this series is long enough, or the available stock of goods is small enough to leave no provision for employments of less importance. If, for instance, in any branch of industry there are a hundred opportunities of employing certain goods and the importance of each opportunity is indicated by the figure 8, while the opportunities in another branch of employment are indicated only by the figure 6. And if our stock of goods consists of 50 individual commodities only, naturally all the 50 will be devoted exclusively to the first kind of employment, and their value will be fixed according to the highest utility at 8. But often it will happen that wants representing different branches of employment, say for instance timber, wanted for building and for burning, demand satisfaction simultaneously. In such cases, it is the ratio that chances to exist between the opportunities and the goods that decides to what branch of the want the last employment will belong. That is to say, the employment which determines the value. Suppose that in one branch of employment, there are four opportunities indicated according to importance by the figures 10, 8, 6, 4, and that in another branch there are four opportunities indicated by the figures 9, 7, 5, 3, and suppose that a man possesses in all five individual goods. There is no doubt that the five goods will be allotted to the opportunities 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and that the last figure, which accidentally belongs to the first branch of employment, is the real marginal utility and determines the value of the good, while the employment that comes next in the second branch, that indicated by the figure 5, must, according to our formula, become the pseudo-marginal utility. Chapter 8. Subjective Exchange Value We are now ready to consider a concrete application of what has just been said, and one that lies at the root of a very widespread phenomenon. Hitherto, we have mostly had before us cases where a commodity, in virtue of some technical adaptability peculiar to it, becomes susceptible of being employed in various ways. Quite apart from any such special assumption, however, the existence of an organized system of exchange gives almost every good a second kind of employment, that of being bartered for other goods. It is customary to put this against, and in opposition to, all other kinds of employment, and to associate this opposition between use and exchange, with the division of value into use value and exchange value. Understood in a certain sense to which in this place we shall adhere, both of these exchange value as well as use value are kinds of subjective value. Use value is the importance which a good obtains for the welfare of a person, on the assumption that it is used immediately in furthering his well-being, and similarly, exchange value is the importance which a good obtains for the welfare of a person through its capacity to procure other goods by way of barter. The amount of use value is measured, according to rules already known to us, by the amount of the marginal utility which the good in question brings its owner when used by himself. The amount of subjective exchange value, on the other hand, obviously coincides with the amount of the use value of the goods got in exchange. When I employ a good by bartering it, I procure for my welfare exactly what the goods I get in exchange procure for me in utility. The amount of the goods subjective exchange value, therefore, is to be measured by the marginal utility of the goods got in exchange for it. Now nothing is more common than that the use value and the exchange value of a good to its owner are of unequal amount. To a scholar, for instance, 
the use value of his books would, as a rule, be considerably greater than their exchange value, while to the bookseller the contrary is likely to be the case. The question now recurs, which of the two values in such cases is the true one? Here we have only to deal with a special case out of a group for which we have already laid down the general rule. Employment in personal use and employment in exchange are two different ways of employing one good. If the good affords a different marginal utility in each employment, it is the higher utility that gives the standard for its economical value. If, therefore, the use value and the exchange value of a good are different in amount, the higher of them is its true value. We recognize this principle in practical life. We always employ our goods in that which corresponds to the higher and the true value. The scholar keeps his books, the bookseller sells his, or if the scholar gets into reduced circumstances, he also sells his books. But in this case, while the use value and also the objective exchange value of the books remain unaltered, their subjective exchange value to him has risen. That is to say, there are now more urgent wants of other classes clamoring in vain for satisfaction. And the possibility of satisfying these other wants through the sale of the books acquires for him an increased importance, and an importance that easily outweighs the use of the books. The recognition that there is a subjective exchange value, and that this is something entirely distinct from what is usually called exchange value, that is, objective exchange value, is of fundamental importance in guiding us among the phenomena of value. It may be advisable, on that account, to devote a little more attention to the subject. The illustration of the scholar is enough to convince us that the subjective importance based on the possibility of barter may take a different direction from that taken by the objective power in exchange and price of goods. For price remaining unaltered, the subjective exchange value of the goods may rise, but the two exchange values may even move simultaneously in opposite directions. Take the case of a poor student who is last in sole possession, the only thing he can call his own, a jubilee sovereign. There is no doubt that this sovereign will have a high subjective importance for the satisfaction of his own wants, and that there is no doubt that this importance is an exchange value. For sovereigns, have no use value. Now suppose that our student falls heir unexpectedly to a fortune of £10,000, while simultaneously, on account of the limited number issued, the sovereign goes up from 20s to 40s. How is it now with the exchange value of the sovereign? Here the difference between the two conceptions becomes manifest. The objective exchange value, the current value of the coin, has gone up from 20s to 40s. But the importance which it has for the satisfaction of its owner's wants, the subjective exchange value of the sovereign, has, owing to the changed relations between the student's wants and his resources, unquestionably fallen. Yesterday, our student would have lamented the loss of the sovereign as a loss of his last offense against extremist hunger and misery. Today, perhaps, he gives it away with a light heart to a friend who collects coins. In spite of its increased current value, it has become a mere bagatelle to him. This fundamental and real difference between the two conceptions of exchange value is the principal reason why we cannot accept the ordinary division of use value and exchange value as the ultimate division of the total phenomena of value. To do so would be to separate related things and to mix up matters which are really so heterogeneous that it is scarcely possible to find a common definition for them. Obviously, subjective exchange value is much more nearly related to subjective use value than to objective exchange value. If we wish to find our way with certainty among those phenomena to which the name of value has been attached, it is advisable to do so as we have done. Place objective value by itself on one side and subjective value on the other side, and afterwards separate the latter into subjective use value and subjective exchange value. Chapter 9. The Value of Complementary Goods It very often occurs that in order to obtain an economic utility, several goods require to cooperate in such a way that if one good falls out of its place, the utility cannot be obtained 
or cannot be completely obtained. Goods whose uses thus supplement each other, we may follow Menger, in calling complementary goods. Thus, for instance, paper, pen, and ink, needle and thread, cart and horse, bow and arrow, right and left hand gloves, and so on, are complementary goods. This complementary character obtains generally, indeed, almost universally among productive goods. It is easy to see that the intimate correlation of complementary goods, the correlation in which they afford this utility, will be reflected in the formation of their value. This leads to a number of peculiarities, all, however, occurring within the limits of the universal law of marginal utility. In stating these, we must distinguish between the value which belongs to the complete group and that which belongs to the individual members of it. The total value of the complete group adapts itself, as a rule, to the amount of the marginal utility which it is capable of affording as a group. If, for instance, three groups, A, B, and C, form a complementary group, and if the smallest utility economically obtainable by the joint employment of these three goods amounts to a value of 100, the three goods A, B, and C taken together will be worth 100. The only exception to this rule occurs in those cases where on the general principles with which we are now familiar, the value of a good is to be measured not by the immediate marginal utility of its own class, but by the marginal utility of other classes of goods drawn on to serve as substitutes. In the special case under consideration, this will occur if every individual member of the complete group is replaceable by purchase or production, or even by taking a substitute out of some other isolated employment, and if, at the same time, the total sum of the utility which the substituted goods would otherwise, in isolation, have had is less than the marginal utility they afford as combined. If the latter, for instance, amounts to 100, while the substitutionary value, the value of the three members individually, is only 20, 30, and 40, that is in all 90. The thing that depends on the group of three is not the obtaining of the combined utility of 100, which is, in any case, assured by the substitutionary goods, but only the obtaining of the small utility the 90, which fails of its provision when the members are taken away and become substitutes in the group. Since, however, in such cases, the complementary character has, properly speaking, no influence on the formation of value, and this value is simply determined according to the ordinary laws already familiar to us, we need not give any separate consideration to this. In what follows, then, I shall give particular attention only to the normal case, where the marginal utility attainable by goods in joint employment is, at the same time, the true marginal utility. As was before remarked, this marginal utility, first of all, determines the united value of the whole group, but in the manner in which this total value is divided out among the single members of the group, considerable differences emerge, varying with the casuistical peculiarity of the case. First, if none of the members admits of any use other than the joint use, and if, at the same time, no one member which cooperates towards the joint utility can be replaced, then one single member has the full total value of the group, and the other members are entirely valueless. Suppose, for instance, I pay five shillings for a pair of gloves. Five shillings is the total value of the pair. If I lose one glove, I lose the whole utility, and with it, the whole value of the pair, and the remaining glove has no value. Of course, either of the two gloves equally admits of either valuation, and it is simple circumstances that decide which of them is to rank as all, and which as nothing, the glove needed to complete the pair or the useless single glove. Cases of this kind are relatively scarce in practical life. Second and more common is the case where the individual members of the group can afford an other, though a less utility, outside their joint employment. Here the value of the single member does not lie between everything and nothing, but between the amount of the marginal utility which it is capable of affording in isolation as minimum, and the amount of the joint marginal utility after deducting the isolated marginal utility of the other members as maximum. 
Suppose, for instance, that three goods, A, B, and C, in cooperation, afford a marginal utility of 100, that A, by itself, has marginal utility of 10, B, by itself, of 20, and C, by itself, of 30. The value of A is determined as follows. If a merchant owns this good by itself, he can get from it only its isolated marginal utility of 10, and the value of the good accordingly is only 10. But suppose he owns the whole group, and is asked to sell or give away the good A out of that group. What he has to consider is that with the good A, he can get a marginal utility of 100. Without it, only the smaller isolated utility of goods B and C, that is 20 plus 30, which equals 50. And that, accordingly, on the having or losing of the good A, depends a difference in value of 50. As a complement of the group, it is therefore worth 100 minus 20 plus 30, which is 50. As an isolated good, it is worth only 10. Here, the difference in value is not so extreme as in the first case, but still it is very considerable. Third and more common still is the case where some individual members of the group are not only employed for other purposes, but are at the same time replaceable by other goods of the same kind. For instance, building ground, bricks, beams, and labor are complementary goods in the building of a house. But if a few cars of bricks intended for the building go astray in transit, or some of the laborers engaged for the job refuse to work, in normal circumstances, this does not in the least hinder the obtaining of the joint utility. The built house, the laborers, and materials are simply replaced by others. The consequences as regards the formation of value are as follows. 1. The replaceable members, even if they are needed as complements, can never obtain any higher than their substitution value, which is the value by the utility in those branches of employment from which the replacing goods are obtained. 2. This fact considerably contracts the limits within which the value of the individual good, estimated sometimes as complementary, sometimes as isolated good, may be determined particularly when it is a common marketable good. The more numerous the available goods of any kind, and the more numerous the opportunities of using them, the smaller will be the difference between the importance of that use from which a replacing sample might be drawn as a maximum, and the use next to it in rank, in which a superfluous isolated good might be employed as minimum of value. If, for instance, beside the good A, which we shall call A1, contained in the complementary group, there are two other similar goods, A2 and A3, and, if possible, opportunities of use outside of employment in the complementary group, possess an importance indicated by the numbers 50, 20, 10, and so on. Only the uses indicated by 50 and 20 would be filled by the goods A2 and A3, and if one of these two were taken to replace the good A1, a utility of 20 would be lost. On the other hand, if the complementary group were broken up, as the good A1 itself obliged to seek for an isolated and inferior employment, its only chance would be the third, that indicated by 10. Thus its value would always lie between 10 isolated and 20 complementary. But if, instead of 3, there are a thousand goods, and a thousand opportunities of using them, the difference between the 1,000th employment from which the good required to replace the other must, in case of need, be drawn, and the 1,001st in which the good must look for employment if it becomes superfluous through the breaking up of the group will certainly fall to a quite insignificant amount. Now, of course, it is not likely that any one individual within the limits of his own economy will possess a thousand goods of one kind, and a thousand different opportunities of employing them. But all the same, the efficiency of the influences just described is in no wise annulled. It is only the scene of their operation that is changed from individual economy to the market, and that in the following way. Individuals buy what they require and sell their surpluses in the market. Here, then, all the stocks of goods and all the opportunities of employing them over the entire field covered by the market come together. 
And now, exactly as before, everything depends on whether in the market commodities and opportunities of employing them are scarce or not. If the commodity is very scarce, it makes a very considerable difference in the determination of price, whether we approach the particular good as buyer or as seller. For instance, suppose, as before, that there are only three similar goods and three buyers, each wishing to acquire just one such good. With the view of using it in employment that will yield 50, 20, and 10. Then, if one of these goods be withdrawn from the market to serve in a complementary employment, the two remaining goods are bought for the employments indicated by 50 and 20, and according to laws, which will be explained in next book, the purchase price must be fixed between 10 and 20, say at 15. But if the complementary employment fails and the third good also is thrown on the market, it must, if it is to find a sale at all, fall to the buyer who can get 10 by employing it. And the result is that the market price is in all cases fixed below the level of 10. Here then, the price and the subjective exchange value based on it varies not inconsiderably. If, on the other hand, there are a thousand similar goods offered and a thousand buyers demand them, evidently it will not make the smallest difference to the market price whether there appears a thousand and first buyer or a thousand and first seller. The good obtains a price and value independently of whether it finds a place in the single complementary employment or not. Thus, under the assumptions now laid down, the value of the replaceable members is fixed at a certain level independently of their concrete complementary employment, and this value they have when we distribute out the total value of the group among its individual members. The distribution then will be made thus of the total value of the whole group, which is determined by the marginal utility of the joint employment. This fixed value is previously assigned to the replaceable members, and the remainder which varies according to the amount of the marginal utility is reckoned to the non-replaceable members as their individual value. To use our old illustration again, say that the joint marginal utility amounts to 100, and that the members A and B have a fixed substitution value of 10 and 20 respectively. 70 must be reckoned the individual value of the non-replaceable good C, or Say that the marginal utility of the group amounts to 120, the individual value of C will be 90. Of the three cases we have discussed, the last mentioned is by far the most common in practical life, and accordingly, in the great majority of cases, the value of complementary goods is determined according to the latter formula. The most important application of it is in the distribution of the product among the various productive powers of cooperating in producing it. Almost every product is the result of the cooperation of a group of complementary goods consisting of uses of ground, labor, fixed, and floating capital. Of the complementary members, the great majority are marketable commodities and replaceable at will, as for instance, the labor of wage earners the raw materials, fuel, tools, etc. Only a few of them are non-replaceable, or not easily replaceable, as, for instance, the land on which the peasant works. The mine, the railway lines, the factory walls, the activity of the undertaker himself, with his peculiar and high qualifications, and so on. It is easy to see, therefore, that here we have exactly those casuistical circumstances in which the foregoing formula of distribution obtains, and as a fact, it is acted upon in practical life in the most accurate way. In actual business, the costs are first deducted from the total return. If we look closer, however, we shall see that what is deducted is not at all the cost, for, if so, the use of ground or the undertaker's activity as both valuable goods would come under costs but only the expenditure for real replaceable means of production with a given substitution value, which is the wage of labor, raw materials, wear and tear of tools, etc. The remainder under the name of net return is ascribed to the non-replaceable member or members. The peasant calculates it to his land, the mine owner to his mine, the manufacturer to his factory, 
the merchant to his undertaking activity. If the joint returns increase, it would not occur to anybody to ascribe the surplus to the replaceable members. It is always the ground or the mine that produces more. And similarly, if the joint returns decrease, nobody would credit the costs with a reduced amount. The deficiency also is conceived as exclusively due to the diminished productiveness of the ground or the mine. And this is entirely logical and correct. On goods replaceable at any moment, only the fixed substitution value is actually dependent. The entire remainder of the joint amount of utility obtainable depends on the goods that cannot be replaced. The theory of value of complementary goods is the key which will solve one of the most important and difficult problems of political economy. The problem of the distribution of goods as made in the present state of society, where competition is more or less free and prices are determined by free contract. All products come into existence through the cooperation of the three complementary factors of production, labor, land, and capital. Now our theory in showing how much of the joint product may economically be considered as due to each of these and what share of the total value may accordingly be assigned to each of them lays down at the same time the most decisive basis for determining the amount of remuneration which each of the three factors obtains and thus although as we know capital as factor of production does not exactly coincide with capital as source of income yet this gives us at least a rough indication of the way in which the amount of the three branches of income, wage, rent, and interest, is determined. It does not indeed do this quite directly. That quota which the workers receive, and that other quota which the owners of the cooperating ground receive, is directly identical with wage and rent. But the quota which falls to the cooperation of capital is not interest, as in theories of distribution economists have repeatedly assumed ever since the days of say with fatal precipitation. It is, first, the gross remuneration for the cooperation of capital, and out of this interest is got like a kernel out of a shell, because, and to the extent that, something remains over after deducting from the gross remuneration the value of the Wernal capital. To explain how this is so, it's a problem in itself. To make it quite clear by illustration, suppose that a commodity produced by the cooperation of all three factors is worth $100. The law of complementary goods will carry us thus far. It will enable us to determine that the share of labor, the labor directly employed in the production, amounts to say 20, but the ground to 10 and the capital to 70. But it does not tell us what or how much of that 70 remains over net as interest after deduction of the wear and tear of capital. On the contrary, the law of complementary goods in itself would rather lead us to the conclusion that nothing remains over. For according to it, it would be the most natural to assume that the capital to the cooperation of which the return of $70 is ascribed and which has been consumed in obtaining that return has already been valued at the entire 70. And if this were the case, the return to capital would naturally be entirely absorbed by the wear and tear of capital. That this is not the case is, so to speak, an internal matter, a matter which plays its part inside the gross share of capital determined by the law of complementary goods, and is the object of an independent problem, the peculiar problem of interest. But before we can discuss interest, there is still a great deal to be explained. Chapter 10. The Value of Productive Goods, Value and Costs It has been almost a commonplace of economical teaching that the value of goods is regulated by the costs of their production. This doctrine has very seldom been questioned on the grounds of theory, but very often its validity has been closely limited by the enumeration of exceptions and insertion of all sorts of saving clauses. In this contracted sphere, however, it has held almost unquestioned authority down to our own times. It is a certain amount of support in practical experience, and what is most serious, it seems to contradict the theory of value just put forward. For costs of production are nothing else than the sum of productive goods, which must be used up 
and the making of a good, the concrete capital consumed, the labor expended, and so on. Now to the question as to the ground and amount of value which a good has. Our theory answers, it depends on the marginal utility which a good is capable of rendering. That is to say, it depends on its future employment. But the other theory answers, it depends on the value of the productive goods consumed in producing it. That is to say, on the conditions of its origin. Putting aside this contradiction for a moment, and forgetting everything we have been taught as to costs, let us inquire impartially what our theory of marginal utility, logically carried out, has to say as to the value of productive goods, and as to costs. For the sake of clearness, it is desirable, before going further, to define with more exactness the object of our present inquiry, which is productive goods, as compared with consumption goods, which directly serve to satisfy human wants. All productive goods have this common feature. They serve to satisfy human wants only indirectly, but they differ again from one another in the degree of indirectness. The flour, for instance, from which bread is baked, stands nearer to the final satisfaction of want by several degrees than the field which grows the wheat. To express these degrees, which we shall find to be of importance both theoretically and practically, we shall avail ourselves of Menger's division of goods into ranks. In the first rank, we shall place consumption goods, those goods which serve immediately for the satisfaction of wants, such as bread. In the second rank, we place those goods which assist in the producing the goods of the first rank, the goods which cooperate in the production of bread as flour, the oven, the baker's labor. In the third rank, we place those goods which serve the production of goods of second rank, as the wheat from which the flour is ground, the mill in which it is ground, the building materials of the oven, etc. In the fourth rank, we put the means of production of goods of third rank, as the land which grows the corn, the implements used in cultivation, the labor of the agriculturist, the building materials of the mill, etc., and so on to the fifth, sixth, and seventh ranks, which embrace those goods, the useful service which consists in producing goods of the rank immediately below them. On the lines of our conception of value, it must be self-evident that productive good, like any other good, can only obtain value for us through our recognition that on its possession or non-possession depends our gain or loss of some one utility, of some one satisfaction of want. And it is equally self-evident that its value will be high when the dependent satisfaction is important, and low when it is unimportant. The only difference is that, in the case of goods, for immediate consumption, the good and the satisfaction stand beside each other in a direct causal relation, while in the case of productive goods, there is interposed between them and the satisfaction finally dependent on them a more or less lengthy series of intermediate members, their successive products. In this prolonged connection, there is both matter and occasion for the development of new and legitimate relations, particularly between the value of means of production and that of their products. But the great law of value is neither destroyed nor disturbed by these relations. Exactly as the analogous case of complementary goods, it is only obscured, as it were, by a mass of details to which the more ample development of the phenomena gives occasion. These details we have now to consider. To this end, let us take a typical productive series. A good for immediate consumption, which we shall call A is made from a group of productive goods of second rank, which we shall call G2. This from a group of goods of third rank, G3. And this, finally, from a group of fourth rank, G4. For simplicity's sake, assume, first, that each of these productive groups passes without loss of time into the product which it creates, and that at the same time, this particular employment is the only one of which it is capable. We have now to find out what is the relation of dependence between each member of the above series and the well-being of its owner. What depends on the final member, the good A, we already know. It is its marginal utility. Our inquiry then begins at the member G2. If we had not the group G2, we should not have its product A. That is to say, 
that the class of goods to which A belongs, we should have one fewer than we should otherwise have had. But, as we already know, one good less means one satisfaction less, and that the least satisfaction to which economically one good of the stock would otherwise have been devoted. In other words, it means the loss of the marginal utility of the product A. On the group G, too, therefore, exactly as on the final product A itself, depends the marginal utility of A. Looking now at the member, we find that if we had not the group G3, we could not have the group G2, which is made from it, and as consequence, we should lose one good of the class A, or its marginal utility. On the group G3, then, depends exactly the same utility and importance for well-being as on the members which come after it in the production series. The same thing again follows in the case of the group G4. If it fails us, we of course lose one of the group G3, which otherwise might have been produced from it. We lose further one of the group G2, one of the class of good A, and finally the marginal utility of A. Thus we arrive at the following general proposition. On all groups of means of production, of remoter rank, which successively pass into one another, there depends one and the same gain to human well-being. That is, the marginal utility of their final product. No one will be surprised at this result. It is a foregone conclusion that a series of productions which has no relation to our well-being, except through its final member, can neither tend towards any other utility, nor condition any other utility, than that which this final member itself conditions. In every member of the chain successively, we hold in our hand the condition of this final utility, sometimes at a further, sometimes at a nearer stage on the way to it. From what has been said, we may deduce the following general principles as regards the value of means of production. First, since on one and the same utility depend all the groups of means of production which successively pass into one another, the value of all these groups must be substantially the same. Second, the amount of this, their common value, is regulated for all, in the last resort, by the amount of the marginal utility of their finished product. I emphasize, in the last resort. For thirdly, the value of each group has its immediate measure in the value of its product, the succeeding group. In the first instance, the utility and service of the means of production consist and exhaust themselves in the making of their product, and naturally, the more important and more valuable the product is for us, when made, the higher will be the estimate put on the importance of this utility, and of that which provides it. Substantially, the third proposition is fully covered by the second, for, in the value of the goods of higher rank, the marginal utility of the final product is mirrored. From this marginal utility value is conducted to all the groups of means of production, but the conduction is done as it were, by stages. First and immediately, the amount of the marginal utility stamps itself on the value of the final product. This then forms the measure of the value of the group of goods from which this product comes. This again measures the value of the third group, and the third group, finally, the value of the last group, the goods of fourth rank. From stage to stage, the name of the determining elements changes but under the different names, it is always the same thing that acts, the marginal utility of the final product. Although the second and third propositions then agree in substance, it is necessary to formulate the third explicitly. It is important as being a convenient abbreviated formula, which we use in practical life much more frequently than the principal formula. If we are estimating what amount of well-being a productive instrument brings us, we look naturally, first of all, to the product which we get from it, and then beyond that, to the well-being which that product brings us. If we do not know this, we must, I admit, go over the entire course of the conduction of utility, member by member, till we come, finally, to the marginal utility of the final member, the finished product. But very often this is not necessary, from previous consideration or from experience we meet with some opinion already formed on the value of the products, and without further consideration, we make this the ground of our opinion 
as to the value of the means which produced them. A wood merchant buying timber for cask staves will not take long to consider the value of the wood to him. He estimates how many staves he can get out of the timber, and he knows what the staves are worth in the condition of the market at the time. Further than this, he need not trouble himself. Thus far, we have formulated these principles as to the value of means of production on purely theoretical grounds, to some extent as postulates of economical logic. If now we ask what experience says to these postulates, we shall find that it confirms them. Indeed, we can appeal for confirmation to that very law of costs, which is apparently so hostile to our theory of marginal utility. Experience shows that the value of most goods is equal to their costs, but costs are nothing else than the complex of those productive goods which have value, the labor, concrete capital, uses of wealth, and so on, which must be expended in the making of a product. The well-known identity of costs and value is only another form of expressing the identity of value between groups of goods of various ranks which pass into one another. I am quite aware, of course, that as regards the cause of this identity, those who adopt the law of costs usually read it in a converse way. While we say that the value of means of production and therefore the value of the costs is regulated by the value of their products, the usual way of interpreting the law is to say that the value of products is determined by the value of their costs, that is, by the value of the means of production out of which they are made. Later on, we shall have occasion to go thoroughly into this difference of opinion as to the cause of the identity. Meantime, all I intend to do is simply to confirm the statement that the asserted identity of value between groups of productive instruments which successively pass into one another, whatever be its cause, is an actual empirical fact. Of course, this identity is not absolute, but approximate. We can only speak of a tendency towards identity of value. The divergences from absolute identity are of two kinds, partly irregular, partly normal. Both kinds arise from the fact that production costs time. In the long periods, which often intervene while goods of sixth or eighth rank are passing gradually through all the transformation stages into the finished consumption good, both men and things may change. Wants may change, the relations between wants and the provision may change, and, not less important, the knowledge of these relations may change. With them, of course, changes the valuation of the goods at various stages, on their way to the matured product. It is easy to understand that the fluctuations which proceed from this cause may be sometimes great, sometimes small, sometimes upwards, sometimes downwards. They are irregular fluctuations. But besides these, we notice a divergence from complete identity which is constant and normal. It is a matter of observation that the total value of a complete group of remote rank lags somewhat behind the value of its products, and in a definite ratio, and that indeed, the amount of this difference in value is graduated according to the time required to change the group of means of production into its product. If the value of the product, for instance, is $100, experience tells us the total value of the labor, uses of land, fixed and floating capital spent in producing it is something less than $100, perhaps $95. If the production process lasts a year, perhaps $97 or $98, if it lasts only half that time. This difference of value is the crease, as it were, in which interest is caught. Its explanation is a subject by itself, with which we shall have enough to do in following chapters. It would be very far from advisable to mix it up with our present inquiry, where we are dealing with the general relation between the value of means of production and that of their products. And for the moment, we shall therefore entirely disregard the existence of this particular difference of value. Up to this point, we have expounded the law which governs the value of productive goods under the simple hypothesis that each group of productive instruments permits of only one quite definite employment. But in actual life, the cases in which this hypothesis corresponds with facts are very limited. It is indeed characteristic of productive goods that they admit 
of an infinitely more various use than consumption goods. The vast majority of them are adapted to several productive uses, while many of them, like iron, coal, and above all, human labor, are adapted to thousands of different uses. In theoretical research, we must, of course, take note of these actual circumstances and see whether they do not involve some modification of our law, that the value of a group of goods of remote rank is determined by the value of its product. Suppose then we vary the assumption of our typical illustration. A man possesses a great stock of groups of productive instruments of second rank, G2. From one such group, he can, at will, make a finished commodity of the kind A, or one of the kind B, or one of the kind C. Naturally, he will provide for his various wants harmoniously, and will therefore, by means of different parts of this stock, produce simultaneously finished goods of all three classes, according to the measure of his requirements. In a scheme of provision that was really harmonious, the amounts produced would be so regulated that in each kind wants of something like the same importance would depend on the last sample of the kind, and the marginal utility of every sample would therefore be approximately equal. Nevertheless, there will be differences, and even considerable differences, of marginal utility because, as we already know, the gradation of the concrete wants in any kind of want is not always uniform and unbroken. One fireplace in a room, for instance, will give me a very considerable utility, which I may represent by the figure 200, while a second fireplace would not be of any further use to me. Naturally, in providing for my wants, I shall therefore, in any case, stop at fireplaces when I have one fireplace, with its marginal utility of 200. Even if in other branches of wants, the provision goes down, on the average, as low as a marginal utility of 100 or 120. To make our typical illustration true to nature, therefore, we must assure that the marginal utility of one sample is of different amounts in the same three kinds, A, B, and C. Say 100 in A, 120 in B, 200 in C. The question now is, in these circumstances, what is the value of G2? After the practice we have had in drawing distinctions of similar kind, we can give the answer without hesitation. The value will be equal to 100, for if one of the available groups were lost, the owner would naturally shift the loss to the least sensitive part. He would neither limit the production of the kind B, where he would lose a marginal utility of 120, nor to the kind C, where he would lose a marginal utility of 200. He would simply produce one less of the kind A, whereby his loss of well-being would only be 100. To put it generally, the value of the productive unit adjusts itself to the marginal utility and value of that product, which possesses the least marginal utility among all the products for whose production the unit might economically have been employed. All the relations which we have found to hold as regards the value of means of production and of their products under the simple hypothesis of the single employment hold, therefore, generally between the value of means of production and their least valuable product. And how does it stand with the value of the remaining classes of products B and C? This question brings us to the source of the law of costs. If, under all circumstances, the marginal utility attainable within the kind itself were to decide, the kinds of goods B and C would possess a value diverging as well from the value of the kind A as from the value of its costs G2. B would have a value of 120, C a value of 200, but this is one of those cases where through substitution a loss occurring in one kind of good is shifted to another kind, and consequently the marginal utility of the latter becomes the standard for the former. That is to say, if one of the kind C gets lost, there is no occasion to give up the marginal utility of 200, which it would have directly afforded. We can and will immediately procure a new C out of a productive unit G2, and we shall prefer to produce one less of that kind of good in which the marginal utility and with it the loss of utility is least. This, in our illustration, is the kind A.
in virtue of the opportunity of substitution offered by production, a good of the kind C is therefore valued, not at its own marginal utility 200, but at 100, the marginal utility of the least valuable cognate, product A. The same holds, of course, of the value of kind B, and would hold, generally speaking, of every kind of good which is cognate in production with A, and has at the same time an immediate marginal utility greater than that of kind A. This leads to several important consequences. First of all, in this way, the value of goods which have a higher individual marginal utility is put on a level with the value of the marginal product, as we shall call that product which has the least marginal utility. And thus, with the value of the means of production, from which both in common core, the theoretical identity of value and costs, therefore, hold in this case also. But it is well worthy of notice that here the agreement between value and costs is brought about in a way essentially different from the agreement between costs and marginal product. In the latter case, the identity was brought about by the value of means of production adapting itself to the value of the product. The value of the product was the determining, that of the means of production the determined. In the present case, on the contrary, it is the value of the product that must adapt itself. In the last resort, of course, it adapts itself only to the value of another product, the marginal product of the cognate production. But in the first instance, it accommodates itself also to the value of the means of production from which it comes, and which are mediated by the substitutionary connection with the marginal product. Here, the conduction value describes as it were, a broken line. First, it goes from the marginal product to the means of production and fixes their value. Then it goes in the opposite direction, from the means of production to the other products which may be made from them. In the end, therefore, products of higher immediate marginal utility get their value from the side of their means of production. To translate this from the abstract formula into practice, if we are considering what a good B or C generally speaking, a product of higher immediate marginal utility is worth for us, we must say first of all, it is worth exactly as much as the means of production from which we could replace it at any moment. Then if we examine further how much the means of production themselves are worth, we come to the marginal utility of the marginal product A. But very often indeed, we may save ourselves this further inquiry, as we already know the value of the goods that make up the cost without having to begin at the foundation and follow it from case to case. And in all such cases, we measure the value of the products in an abbreviated form, both accurate and convenient, that is to say, simply by their costs. Here then, we have the whole truth about the celebrated law of costs. As a fact, people are right when they say that costs regulate value. Only they must always be conscious of the limits within which this law holds, and the source from which it gets its strength. It is first only a particular law. It holds only in so far as it is possible to obtain, at will and at the right time, substitutes through production. If there is no opportunity of substitution, the value of every product has to be measured by the immediate marginal utility of its own kind and its agreement with the value of the marginal product and with the intermediate means of production is disturbed. Hence, the well-known empirical proposition that the law of costs holds only as regards goods reproducible at will or freely produced, and that it is simply an approximate law which does not bind the value of the goods that come under it with slavish exactitude to the level of cost, but according as production for the moment comes short of demand or runs beyond it, permits of fluctuations, now on one side, now on the other. But it is still more important to emphasize in the second place that even where the law of costs holds, costs are not the final but only the intermediate cause of value. In the last resort, they do not give in their products but receive it from them. In the case of productive goods, which have only a single employment, this is perfectly clear. The toke is not valuable because there are toke vineyards, 
but that Toke vineyards are valuable because Toke has high value. No one will be inclined to deny any more than that of the value of a quicksilver mine depends on the value of quicksilver, the wheat field on the value of wheat, the brick kiln on that of bricks, and not the other way about. It is only this many-sided character of most cost goods, their capacity of being employed in many different uses, that gives the appearance of the contrary, and a little consideration shows this to be an appearance and nothing more. As the moon reflects the sun's rays on the earth, so the many-sided costs reflect the value which they receive from their marginal product on to their other products. The principle of value is never in them, but outside them, in the marginal utility of the products. The law of cost is not an independent law of value. It only forms an incidental case against the true universal law of marginal utility. It is simply the great counterpart to the law of complementary goods, as the latter disentangles and explains those relations of value which result from the temporary and causal collocation, the simultaneous cooperation of several goods to a common useful end. So does the law of cost for the value relations of those goods which act in temporary and causal sequence, the working of goods after one another and through one another to the same final goal. If we think of the value relations of goods that work into one another as a much tangled net, we might say that the former law disentangles the meshes in their length and breadth, while the latter disentangles them in their depth. But both fall under the all-embracing law of marginal utility, and are nothing but special applications of that law to special problems. Book 4. Price. Chapter 1. The Fundamental Law. Exchanges are not made simply for amusement. People who take the not always trifling trouble to exchange the goods which they possess for other goods do so for rational and material end. And in 999 cases out of a thousand, this end is to better their economical condition by the exchange. Whether this end be attained, and in what degree it be attained, depends naturally on the current conditions of exchange, particularly on the prices which the parties get as equivalent for their goods. It is, therefore, a perfectly natural thing that the motive which gives rise to exchange in general, namely the striving after economical advantage, should maintain a commanding influence in the fixing of the exchange prices. In what follows, I mean to inquire how prices are determined under the assumption that all who take part in this exchange act exclusively from the motive of pursuing their immediate economical advantage in it. The law which we shall arrive at in this way, I have already, for very good reasons, called the fundamental law of the formation of price. I am perfectly aware that in practical life this law does not exactly obtain. For although the motive of self-advantage is almost never absent, and there is almost always the most prominent motive, still in price transactions other motives do very often get mixed up. Such motives as humanity, custom, friendship, vanity, or the other influence of outside institutions, such as government taxation, union regulations, boards for fixing wages, and the like, give them another direction than they would have taken if exclusively dominated by self-advantage. Such motives, indeed, scarcely ever get the upper hand of the other to the extent of making us conclude an exchange which would cause us positive economic loss, but they often make us decide to be content with a less amount of advantage than we should have got in steadily pursuing our interests. I have on the same occasion expressed myself with all clearness on the theoretical and practical importance of the admixture of these other influences, and I shall only now briefly sum up what I then said. In actual life, this admixture of motives causes certain modifications of the fundamental law of the formation of price, and the statement of these modifications cannot be neglected in any accurate and complete theory of it. But if all that is wanted is to grasp the characteristic features of the formation of price, it is enough to put forward the fundamental law above mentioned. For just as, among the motives that determine price, that of striving after self-advantage in exchange 
as the lion's share, so does the lion's share in the theoretic explanation of the phenomena of price fall to the fundamental law here stated. And it is sufficient for us in our present task, as we have not to pursue the theory of price as an end in itself, but only so far as is necessary to establish the theoretical connection between the elementary phenomena of subjective value and the complicated phenomena of interest. In this law, we may obtain a principle which is not minutely accurate, but is amply sufficient for the further development of the theory of capital. Before going on to state the peculiar laws of price, it may be desirable to preface them by some considerations that may more accurately unfold the content of the fundamental motive which forms the assumption and basis of the whole of the following inquiry. In exchange transactions, the decisions made always turn on two points. These are, one, whether in a given state of things a man should exchange or not, and two, if he decide to exchange, what form he should try to give to the terms of the exchange. Now in making these decisions, it is obvious that the man who looks to his own immediate advantage and nothing else will act according to the following rules. First, he will exchange only if the exchange brings him an advantage. Second, he will rather exchange for a greater advantage than for a less. Third, he will rather exchange for a small advantage than not exchange at all. It scarcely need be shown that these three rules are dictated by our fundamental motive and constitute the practical substance of it. What does require elucidation is an expression that recurs in them all. To exchange with advantage. The meaning of the expression obviously is to exchange in such a way that the exchanger gains more in well-being from the goods he gets than he loses in the goods he gives, or since the importance that goods have for life and well-being is expressed in their subjective value, to exchange in such a way that the goods received possesses a greater subjective value than the goods parted with. If A owns a horse and is willing to exchange it for 10 casks of wine, it can only be because the 10 casks of wine have a greater value for him than his horse has. But naturally, the other party to the contract thinks exactly in the same way. He, on his part, will not give up the 10 casks of wine if he does not get for them a good that has a greater value for him. He will exchange his 10 casks for A's horse only if the wine is worth less to him than the horse is. From this, we get an important rule. An exchange is economically possible only between persons who put a different value, even an opposite value, upon the commodity and upon the price equivalent. The buyer must put a higher, the seller a lower, estimate on the commodity than he does on the equivalent. Indeed, the interest which the two parties have in the exchange and the gain they get from it increases as the difference between their estimates increases. If the differences decrease, their gain decreases. And if the difference disappears, then their estimates coincide. No exchange is economically possible between them. It is easy to see that under the regime of the division of labor, there must be innumerable chances of opposing estimates, and therefore innumerable opportunities of exchange. That is to say, as each producer makes only one or two kinds of articles, and these far in excess of his own personal requirements, he has at once a superfluity of his own products and an absence of all others. He will therefore ascribe to his own product a low subjective value, and to other products a relatively high subjective value. But conversely, the other producers will ascribe a high value to all products, which they have not and a low value to their own products, of which they have too many. And here we have, in the fullest degree, the relation of opposite valuations, which is most favorable to the effecting of exchange. Another idea that comes out in what has been said, we may follow to its logical consequences. To one consulting his own advantage, an exchange, as we saw, is economically possible only when he estimates the good to be acquired more highly than the good possessed. Now obviously this will more readily occur the less value he puts on his own commodity, and the more value he puts on the equivalent. A man who values his horse subjectively at 50 
and values a cask of wine at 10 has economically a much greater possibility of exchange, or, as we shall say, in future, for brevity's sake, is much more capable of exchange than another who values his horse at a hundred and a cask of wine at five. The former, obviously, can proceed with the exchange if six casks are offered him for his horse, while the latter must hold back unless something over twenty casks is offered him. If a third party again values his horse only at forty and a cask of wine at fifteen, obviously he would be economically capable of concluding an exchange if even three casks were offered him. Generally speaking, then, that the exchanger is the most capable, who puts the least value on his own commodity in comparison with that offered him in exchange, or, what is the same thing, puts the highest value on the other commodity in comparison with the commodity which he offers in exchange for it. Now that we are sufficiently acquainted with the meaning and the content of our fundamental motive, we may proceed with our proper work, and consider what are the normal effects which this fundamental motive exerts on the formation of price. In this part of our work, the method already pursued by several distinguished economists seems to me by far the most convenient, first by typical illustrations to show how, under certain definite assumptions, price is and must be determined, and then to separate the accidental surroundings of the illustration from what is universal and typical, and formulate the latter into laws. I shall begin with the simplest typical case, the determination of price in isolated exchange between a single pair of exchangers. Chapter 2. Isolated Exchange A peasant, whom we shall call A, requires a horse. His individual circumstances are such that he attaches the same value to the possession of the horse as he does to the possession of thirty dollars. A neighbor, whom we shall call B, has a horse for sale. If B's circumstances also are such that he considers the possession of the horse worth as much as, or worth more than thirty dollars, there can, as we saw, be no exchange between them. Suppose, however, that B values his horse at considerably less, say ten. What will happen? First, it is certain that there will be an exchange. In the assumed circumstances, each of the contracting parties can make a considerable profit by the exchange. If, for instance, the horse changes hands at 20, A, who considers it worth 30, makes a profit of 10, and B, who gets 20, for an article only worth 10 to him, gets the same amount of profit. They will, therefore, in any case, according to the proposition, rather a small gain than no exchange, agree on making an exchange at a price advantageous to both of them. The question now is how high will this price go? As to this, it may be definitely, the price must at all events be less than 30. Otherwise, A would have no economical advantage and would have no motive for going on with the exchange, and it must at all events be higher than 10, or there would be no use in the exchange for B, and perhaps even loss. But the particular point between 10 and 30 at which the price will be fixed cannot be determined beforehand with certainty. Any price between the two is economically possible. A price of $10 1s or a price of $29 19s here then is room for any amount of higgling. According as in the conduct of the transaction, the buyer or the seller shows the greater dexterity, cunning, obstinacy, power of persuasion, or such like, will the price be forced either to its lower or to its upper limit. If both parties have equal skill in bargaining, the price will be fixed at approximately midway, that is to say, about 20. There is no difficulty in putting this briefly in the form of a general proposition in isolated exchange, exchange between one buyer and one seller. The price is determined somewhere between the subjective valuation of the commodity by the buyer as upper limit and the subjective value by the seller as lower limit. Chapter 3 one-sided competition. First, of one-sided competition of buyers, accommodating the conditions of our illustration to the requirements of the new typical case, let us assume that A1 finds a competitor, who we shall call A2, already in the field, and that he has also the intention of purchasing the horse. The circumstances of this competitor are such that he counts the possession of the horse 
worth as much as 20. What will happen now? Each of the competitors wishes to buy the horse, but only one, of course, can buy him. Each of them wishes to be that one. Each, therefore, will try to persuade B to sell the horse to him, and the means of persuasion will be to bid a higher price. Thus ensues the familiar phenomenon of mutual overbidding. How long will this last? It will last till the rising bids have reached the valuation of the least capable competitor, who, in this case, is A2. So long as the bids are under 20, A2, acting on the motto rather a small gain than no exchange, will try to secure the purchase by raising his offer, which attempt naturally A1, acting on the same principle, will counteract by raising his offer. But A2 cannot go beyond the limit of 20 without losing by the exchange. At this point, his advantage dictates better no exchange than a loss, and he leaves the field to his competitor. This is not to say that the price A1 pays must be just 20. It is possible that B, knowing A1 to be in urgent want of a horse, will not be content with 20, and will try by holding back and by skillful bargaining to extort a price of 25, 28, or even 29 nineteenths. The one thing certain is that the price cannot exceed 30, the valuation of A1, who concludes the purchase, and cannot be under 20, the valuation of A2, the excluded competitor. Now assume that, in addition to A1 and A2, three other buyers, A3, A4, and A5, compete for the horse, and that their circumstances are such that they count the possession of the horse equivalent to 22, 25, and 28, respectively. It is easy to show, in the same way, that in the ensuing competition A3 will bid to the limit of 22, A4 to 25, and A5 to 28, that the most capable competitor, A1, will always be the successful one, and that the price will be fixed between 30 as a higher limit and 28, the valuation of the most capable of the excluded competitors as lower limit. The results of this investigation may therefore be expressed in the following general proposition. The one-sided competition of buyers, where there is one seller and more than one buyer, the most capable competitor will be the purchaser, that is, the one who puts the highest value on the commodity he wishes to buy in comparison with the good he wishes to sell, and the price will lie somewhere between the valuation of the purchaser as higher limit and the valuation of the most capable among the unsuccessful competitors as lower limit. Always understood that the price can, in no case, be lower than the subsidiary lower limit of the seller's own valuation. Comparing this proposition with the results arrived at under the former typical case, we see that the competition of buyers has the effect of narrowing the sphere within which price is determined, and narrowing it in the upward direction. Between A and B, the limits within which price was determined were 10 and 30. By the added competition, the lower limit was moved up to 28. Second, of the one-sided competition of sellers, this forms the exact converse of the foregoing. Entirely analogous tendencies lead to entirely analogous results, only in an opposite direction. The statement of this need not detain us long. Suppose that our friend A is the only buyer and that he deals with five dealers, whom we shall call B1, B2, B3, B4, and B5, are competing to sell him a horse. We assume that all horses are equally good but B1 values his horse at 10, B2 values his at 12, B3 at 15, B4 at 20, and B5 at 25. Each of the five rivals tries to utilize the present as the sole opportunity of sale, and endeavors to secure a preference over his competitors by underselling, as in the former case, by overbidding. But as no one will care to offer his commodity for less than what he is worth to himself. B5 will cease offering at 25, B4 at 20, B3 at 15, then B1 and B2 will compete for a while, till finally at 12, B2 finds himself economically excluded, and B1 alone keeps the field. The price at which he remains a seller must necessarily be higher than 10, otherwise there would be no use in the exchange and therefore no motive for it. But neither must it be higher than 12 otherwise B2 will continue his competition. In general terms, then, 
we have the following proposition. In one-sided competition of sellers, where there is one buyer and more than one seller, the more capable competitor will be the actual seller, that is the one who puts the lowest value on the good he wishes to sell in comparison with the commodity he wishes to buy, and the price will lie somewhere between the valuation of the seller as lower limit and the valuation of the most capable among the unsuccessful competitors as higher limit. Compared, therefore, with the case of isolated exchange where according to the first formula, the price had to lie between 10 and 30. The sphere within which price is determined will be narrowed by the competitions of sellers and narrowed in the downward direction. Chapter 4. Two-Sided Competition The case of two-sided competition is the most common in economic life, as it is the most important in the development of the law of price. It demands, therefore, our most careful attention. The typical situation, which the present case assumes, may be represented by the following scheme. It shows us ten buyers and eight sellers, each of them wishing to buy or sell a horse, and it tells us, at the same time, the degree of the subjective valuation put upon the horse by each of the exchangers. It will be seen that the figures which represent these valuations are very different, and this exactly corresponds with facts, indeed the individual relations of want and provision for want, which regulate subjective value, are so various that it would be difficult to find two persons who had an entirely similar opinion about the value of any one thing. To complete the scheme, it must be added that all the competitors appear simultaneously in the one market, that all the horses offered for sale are of equal quality, and finally, that the buyers and sellers make no mistake about the actual state of the market, such as would prevent them from really pursuing their own egoistic interests. We ask now what will happen in this situation. The circumstances of A1 are such that he considers a horse to be worth 30 to him. It would therefore be his advantage to buy even at 29, and it is quite certain that any of the eight sellers would be glad to sell him a horse at the price so advantageous to them. But evidently, A1 would be a very poor businessman if he rashly bought at such a high price. For his self-interest demands from the great exchange not merely a profit, but the greatest possible profit. Instead, then, of buying at the highest price, which all the same will might do in the worst possible case, he will prefer to begin by offering a price as low as his least capable rivals, and will only raise his offer when, and in the degree that, it is necessary to save himself from being shut out of the market. In the same way B1, who, economically, could quite well sell at the price of 11, and at that price could very easily find a buyers, will carefully hold back from offering his horse at the lowest figure, which he would accept, and will now reduce his price below what he must take, if he is to keep his place in the competition. It may be assumed, then, that the transaction will begin with the buyers holding back and offering low prices, and with the sellers holding back and asking high prices. Suppose the buyers begin with an offer of 13. It is at once clear that putting aside the case of gross error as to the condition of the market, the buying cannot be concluded at this price, for at 13 all the 10 buyers would be willing to buy, since all of them put a greater value on the horse than 13, but at that price only two horses those of B1 and B2, could economically be offered for sale. Now evidently, B1 and B2 would be very poor sellers if they did not make use of the active competition of buyers to raise their price, and the others would be poor buyers if they let the best chances of purchasing be snatched away by two of the members without attempting to obtain the preference by bidding a price somewhat higher, but still advantageous to themselves. Exactly then, as in the case discussed in the last chapter, the surplus buyer will be weeded out by means of mutual overbidding. How long will this weeding process go on? At any price that's under 15, all 10 buyers can compete. From that point, the least capable competitors must, one after another, withdraw from the competition. At 15, A10 is knocked out. At 17, A9. At 18, A8. At 20, A7. But as the bids rise on the one side, the number of those sellers who economically become capable of selling increases on the other side. 
at any price above 15, B3 may seriously think about selling, above 17, B4, and above 20, B5. Thus the marked disproportion which existed at first between the horses demanded and the horses actually offered for sale is gradually reduced. At 13, there was an effective demand for 10 horses, and only two could, economically, be offered, while at any price over 20, only six horses are demanded and five offered, the majority of buyers over sellers thus being reduced to one. So long, however, as the rival buyers are in the majority, and this fact is accurately known in the market, there can be no final settlement. For on the one hand, sellers have always the chance and the temptation to take advantage of the excess of buyers and stand out for higher prices, and on the other hand, the mutually opposed interests of the rival buyers compel them to bid still higher against each other. Obviously, A6 would scarcely consult his own interests if he were calmly to look on while his five rivals went off with the five cheapest horses, and left him no chance of an exchange, and therefore no chance of a profit. But at the same time, no one of these rivals would allow A6 to purchase one of the five horses most strongly offered for sale. For if so, the man who withdrew in favor of A6 might indeed purchase a horse, but only under less favorable conditions, the conditions, that is, offered by the most conservative sellers B6, B7, and B8, at a price which, at least, exceeds the subjective valuation of 2110S that B6 puts on his horse. Thus, if the buyers know their own interests, the whole body of them will feel impelled to continue their bidding against each other, above the level of 20. Finally, the situation becomes essentially different when the rising bids have reached the limit of 21. At that price, A6 is compelled to cease bidding, and there are now only five sellers against five buyers. These buyers can all be satisfied simultaneously, and there is no occasion for further competition among themselves. On the contrary, as against the sellers, their common interest is to close at the lowest possible price. The bidding of buyers against each other, which hitherto has prevented the final settlement, now comes to an end, and the bargains may be concluded at the price of 21, but they need not be concluded at that price. The sellers may possibly be stiff and refuse 21, in hope of a still higher offer. What will happen in this case, first of all, the buyers, rather than have a fruitless errand and go away without making any exchange, will bid higher. But their limit is now very near at hand. If the sellers stand out at a price above 22, A5 must give up all idea of purchase, and there will be five sellers against four buyers. One of the sellers then will have to fall out, and as no one would care to be that seller, there will, from motives quite analogous to those which before prompted the surplus, buyers to overbid each other and sue a mutual underselling among the surplus sellers till such time as the fifth seller meets a buyer. This will be the case somewhere under the limit of 22. Indeed, in the present case, the limit must still go lower, so low as a price over 21 tenes was possible. There would be a sixth possible seller in the person of B6. This would give the sellers a majority, one over the five buyers, and compel them to offer under each other if they are not to be shut out from the exchange. In this competition, the weakest must first go to the wall, and this fate will overtake B6. The moment that his rivals are content to take a price below the level of 2110S, at which figure the number of competitors on either side will be equalized, and the level of price found, which the competition may seize. Thus assuming, as we do in this illustration, that each competitor knows what is the condition of the market and intelligently follows his own interests, the limits within which the price must necessarily be determined are narrowed to 21 and 2110s, those being the only limits within which there occurs the relation favorable to the final settlement, that all who are able to take a share in the business find it their advantage to do so, while all who do not find their advantage, the unsuccessful competitors, have no power to prevent the others from coming to terms. Let us try now to apply the results of these lengthy analysis to
to our theory of price. We notice first that what decides success in two-sided competition is, as in the case of one-sided competition, the degree of capability for exchange. On either side, it is the most capable competitors who come to terms, namely those buyers who put the highest value on the commodity, A1 to A5, and those sellers who put the lowest value, B1 to B5, while all less capable competitors are excluded. And indeed, if we look more closely, we shall find that the series of successful competitors includes all competing pairs, arranged by capability between whom there exists the relation necessary for exchange, which is that the buyer considers the commodity worth more than the seller does. In our illustration, A5 considers B5's horse worth more than B5 himself does, and accordingly, they can exchange with each other. A1, on the other hand, values the horse of B1 at 21, while B6 values it at 2110s, and therefore cannot come to terms, and still less can those competitors who are less capable. Very closely related to the grounds on which are decided the successful competitors in the struggle of competition are, secondly, the grounds on which is decided the market price that results from the struggle. This price, to recur our illustration, cannot in any case be higher than the valuation of A5, nor less than that of B5. Otherwise, the fifth buyer in the one case and the fifth seller in the other would not have come to terms. But again, the price cannot in any case be higher than the valuation of B6, nor less than that of A6. Otherwise, in the former case, a sixth buyer would begin competing with the other five buyers, and in the latter case, a sixth seller competing with the other five sellers. The equilibrium would thus be destroyed. And overbidding and underoffering would inevitably be continued till such time as the price was forced within the limits already indicated. To put these results in general form, in two-sided competition, the market price is determined within the latitude of which the upper limit is constituted by the valuation of the last buyer who actually exchanges and that of the most capable seller excluded, and the lower limit by the valuation of the least capable seller who actually effects a sale, and that of the most capable buyer excluded. The meaning of this double limitation is that, in every case, it is the narrower limit that decides. If, finally, we substitute the short and significant name of marginal pairs for the detailed description of the four parties whose competition determines the price, we get this very simple formula. The market price is limited and determined by the subjective valuations of the two marginal pairs. This suggests a number of reflections. The first thing that strikes us is the analogy between the formation of price and the formation of subjective value. We saw that the subjective value of any good unaffected by the more important uses to which single members of the same stock might be put was a marginal value, a value determined by the good's marginal utility, or that utility which stands on the very limit of the economically permissible. Now we see that every market price is a marginal price, a price determined by the economical relations of those competing pairs, which also stands on the very limit of exchangeability. It is easy to see that the analogy here is no chance coincidence, but one that results from closely related and internal causes. In the case of subjective valuation, the motive of economical advantage demanded that the available stock of goods should be employed in satisfying the wants that stood highest on each man's scale. The last of the wants thus supplied indicating the marginal utility in the case of the formation of price, the motive of the competitor's economical advantage demands that the pairs which are most capable on the scale of competitors should come to terms, and one of these, again, is the last, the marginal pair. In the former case, the provision for all satisfactions more important than the marginal utility was assured without the particular good whose value was the subject of discussion, and the only utility dependent on this latter good was the last. The marginal utility. In the latter case, all the contracting pairs more capable than the marginal pairs may come to terms at prices higher or lower, and here again it is only the fate of the last, the marginal pair, that depends on the price just reaching a definite height, neither greater nor less. And finally, 
in the former case the importance of the last dependent want in virtue of its dependent relation gave the good its value so in the latter case the economical circumstances of the last dependent pair here also in virtue of their dependent relation confer on the commodity its price but this analogy does not exhaust the connections between price and subjective value of still greater consequence is the fact that price from the beginning to end is the product of subjective valuations look back over what we have said it is the relation of subjective valuation of commodity and price equivalent which decides the persons who may consider it worth their while to compete either as buyers or sellers that is to say decides which parties are capable of exchange it is the same relation which decides on the degree of each competitor's capability of exchange with perfect exactness it decides for each man the figure at which his advantage calls him to join in the competition and it decides at the same time the limit at which he is beaten and obliged to withdraw from it as further result it decides the parties who among the most capable competitors actually come to terms it decides to which pair fails the role of being marginal pair and finally it decides on the price at which the bargains are concluded in the market thus as a fact in the whole course of the formation of price so far as it is conducted on purely egoistic principles there is not a single phase nor feature which is not traceable wholly and entirely to the position of subjective valuations as its cause and this is at bottom perfectly natural for as we know these subjective valuations point out whether any importance great or little attaches to a good as regards our economic well-being and how great the importance is and consequently these valuations wherever we acquire or parge with goods solely with regard to our economic well-being mark out the natural indeed the only possible compass of our transactions we are therefore fully justified in defining price as the resultant of subjective valuations put upon commodity and price equivalent within a market of course it is a resultant of a peculiar kind the amount of price is not the resultant of the sum or of the average of all valuations that come to the surface in the formation of price these take very different shares one class of them has no effect on price at all which is those valuations made by all the unsuccessful competitors except the most capable pair it is all the same whether there are no such valuations or whether there are scores of them in the market they make not the slightest difference on the resultant price in our illustration whether there are unsuccessful buyers a7 to a10 or not whether the category of the unsuccessful is composed of them alone or of a hundred others besides so long as they cannot bid more than 20 it is easy to show that the resultant price will always run between 21 and 21 s the excluded competitors may increase the congestion of the market but they are not factors in that condition of a market which determines the formation of price a second group plays a very peculiar part in this resultant which is that consisting of the valuations of all the contracting parties who actually come to terms exclusive of the last what they do is simply to bind and to neutralize each other recur again to our typical illustration if we inquire what for instance the presence of a1 contributes to the formation of price we find that it takes up one member of the opposing series namely b1 with the resultant that now the formation of price proceeds exactly if neither a1 nor b1 were in the market similarly it is not difficult to see that the efficiency of a2 a3 and a4 simply consists in cancelling the efficiency of b2 b3 and b4 if they are in the competition the resultant price falls between 21 and 21 10s if they were all absent a5 and b5 would still make their exchange at a price between 21 and 21 10s and it is worth emphasizing that the degree of subjective valuations made in this group is quite indifferent to the result a1 for instance whose valuation in our scheme is put down at 30 would cancel b1 not less thoroughly if his valuation amounted to only 25 or 22 and conversely suppose that his estimate were 200 or 2000 of this enormous amount absolutely nothing would affect the resultant price 
except the sum, in any case, absorbed in neutralizing B1. If, however, the valuations of this group have no direct influence on the formation of price, it cannot be said that they are quite without effect. When the valuations of A1 to A4 cancel those of B1 to B4, they have a twofold result. They prevent any stronger seller than B5 getting into the marginal pair which immediately determines the price, and second, they prevent the strongest sellers from cancelling the next strongest buyers, as they might do if not cancelled already, and they thus prevent any weaker member of the buying series than A5 from getting into marginal pair. The part played by all those exchanging pairs who are stronger, more capable than the last, may therefore be accurately characterized in the following words. Their valuations contribute nothing directly to the formation of the resultant price, but they do indirectly insofar as they neutralize each other and thus preserve the role of marginal pair for another couple. Finally, the real decision of price lies exclusively with a third group, and that a small one, the valuations of the two marginal pairs, all weaker competitors being absolutely without influence and all stronger ones cancelling each other, they and they alone are the directly effective components, and the market price is their resultant. At first sight, it may appear strange that so few persons and those so little conspicuous should decide the fate of the whole market, but on closer examination, this will be found quite natural. If all are to exchange at one market price, the price must be such as to suit all exchanging parties, and since naturally, the price which suits the least capable contracting party suits in higher degree all the more capable. It follows quite naturally that the relations of the last pair whom the price must suit, or as the case must be, the first pair whom it cannot suit, afford the standard for the height of price. Chapter 5. The Law of Supply and Demand The zone within the limits of which the struggle of competition forces the formation of price is as we have seen, characterized as lying between the subjective valuations of the marginal pairs, and on this characteristic feature we have formulated our law of price. But this zone has a second characteristic feature. It is that in which exactly as many commodities are offered for sale as are wanted to purchase, or, to use the common expressions, in which supply and demand are quantitatively in equilibrium. In our scheme, at a price which did not rise to £21, more horses were demanded than were offered, at a price which rose above £21 and 10 shillings. More horses were offered than were demanded, while in the zone indicated by our law of marginal pairs, that between £21 and £21 and 10 shillings, the position requisite to end the competition was reached, and at that price exactly as many horses were asked as were offered. Now, if it should be thought preferable, the formulation of the law of price may be based on this second characteristic feature, and it will then take the following shape. The market price is found in that zone in which supply and demand quantitatively balance each other. This formula is as correct as the other. It indicates the same zone in another way, but it is less expressive, one, insofar as it points only to the level of determining zone in a roundabout way, while by formula the limits of this zone are directly and positively indicated, two, as it has to contend to some extent with the difficulty of having to use the expression supply and demand, for the protean ambiguity of these terms is sure to bring innumerable errors and misconceptions in their train, just as it brought the terms themselves into thoroughly bad repute with many. Still, these drawbacks may very well be overcome by critical attention, and there is no objection, in my opinion, to treat the theory of price under the good old catchwords supply and demand, if care is only taken to avoid the errors and misunderstandings which so plentiful surround them, and to inform the old forms and formulas with new and clear knowledge. In one special case, this second formulation of our law of price is even more exact of the two. In the vast majority of cases, the zone within which supply and demand just balance each other exactly coincides with the zone whose limits are marked out by the valuations of the marginal pairs. 
but there is one quite definite coincidence of circumstances in which it may happen that the equilibrium between supply and demand does not make its appearance within the whole of the last mentioned zone but only within a distinctly narrower part of that zone and in such cases the price is always fixed within these narrower limits the very peculiar coincidences of circumstances which produce this result occurs very rarely indeed in economic life but among the cases where it does occur there is one that is very important for the theoretical explanation of interest and for that reason in spite of its somewhat exotic character i must devote a few words to it the casuistical conditions of this case are the following first there must be considerable latitude between the valuation of the marginal pairs this condition is most thoroughly fulfilled where all the competing exchangers come to terms there being therefore no excluded competitors and when at the same time the buyers as a body value the commodity considerably higher than the sellers do if there are for instance ten buyers who each value the commodity at ten pounds and ten sellers who each value it subjectively at one pound obviously all the ten pairs can come to terms and the zone which lies between the valuations of the last buyer and the last seller represents the wide latitude between one pound and ten secondly this latitude should be narrowed down the further circumstance must be present that the desire of the buyers is directed to an unlimited number of goods while at the same time the total amount of means of purchase must be strictly limited and the buyers must be determined to spend the whole of this sum in purchase of the commodities in question in the purchase of fewer goods if the price be high in the purchase of a proportionately larger number of goods if the price be low to put it in terms of our illustration say that each of the ten buyers is resolved to spend the sum of one hundred pounds in buying cotton goods that is to say at any price under ten he will buy as many pieces as he can obtain for one hundred and suppose that against this total competing demand of one thousand pounds there is a supply of two hundred goods which their owners are inclined to let go at any price above one it is easy to see that the price must be fixed at five pounds the piece for the price were to be less say four the two hundred pieces would be purchased for eight hundred and two hundred of the available means of purchase would remain unemployed here the owners acting on the motto rather a small gain than no exchange will continue bidding up against each other and so raise the price to five at which figure the whole capital of one thousand finds employment if on the other hand the price were to be put still higher say eight only 125 pieces of cotton goods could be bought with the 1,000 available, and 75 would remain unsold. Now obviously, no seller, considering that the price remains profitable to him till it is brought down as low as 1, would willingly forego taking part in the exchange, and thus the sellers, in fear of being shut out, would offer below each other, and the price would be pressed down to the equilibrium point of 5. Inside the wider zone, then of one pound to ten pounds that determined by the valuations of the marginal pairs the necessity for equilibrium between supply and demand determines the price with much more exactitude and fixes it at five pounds that being the point at which if the competitors follow their own interests without let or hindrance the market price must be fixed as we have already said the extremely peculiar coincidence of circumstances necessary to this result occurs very seldom but as it happens the cases where it does not occur are very notable one of these is the formation of the price of money which however does not concern us here a second is the formation of price in the labor market and this is the case which we shall have to take up later on on account of its close connection with the origin and height of interest it should however be carefully noted that even in these two cases the conditions under which this special form of the law of price appears are seldom met with in economic life in entire isolation thus the practical importance of such cases is still further diminished and if the recognition of them cannot well be ignored in the course of any theoretical exposition still as regards the infinite majority of cases the first formulation of the law of price that which determines the height of price by the subjective valuations of the marginal pairs 
may be relied on with perfect confidence. This formulation is always correct, and for the infinite majority of cases, is sufficiently exact. Moreover, without losing its practical usefulness in the majority of cases, it permits of being still further simplified. Before going on to this, however, some other explanations are necessary. Chapter 6. The Individual Determinants of Price In the chapter before last, we saw that price is determined at a level fixed by the valuation of the marginal pairs. We have still to ask, what are the circumstances which determine whether this level itself is high or low? The first few steps in the answer are very easy. It is clear at a glance that the two things which must have the decisive influence on the position of the marginal pairs are the number and the intensity of the desires or valuations on both sides. In this way, the level of the valuation of the marginal pairs will tend to be higher when, on the side of the buyers, there are very high valuations and relatively a great number of them, and when, on the side of the sellers, the low valuations are relatively few. For in this case, the few low valuations of the sellers will be cancelled by a portion of the more numerous high variations of the buyers, and since after this is done, there are still buyers with a high valuation, while at the same time, the only remaining sellers also have a high valuation. The marginal pairs on both sides are composed of persons with high valuations. On quite analogous grounds, the level of the valuation of the marginal pairs will tend to be low when, on the side of the buyers, there are relatively few high valuations, and on the side of the sellers, there are relatively many low valuations. If we single out the individual factors from the combined action of which, as we have shown, the valuation level of the marginal pairs results, we get the following individual determinants of price. 1. The number of desires directed towards the commodity, which the extent of demand, and 2. The figures which the buyers put upon their valuations, which is intensity of demand. The latter, however, is not a simple matter. The figures in which valuations are expressed are in no wise simple expressions of the absolute amount of subjective value which the commodity has for the valuer. They only express a relation obtained by comparing two different valuations, that of the commodity and that of the equivalent price. When we said in our scheme that A values a horse at 30, that is not to say or prove anything of the absolute importance of a horse to A's well-being. All that it expresses is the relation in which the value of the horse to A stands in the value of the money to A. It simply says that A values the horse 30 times more highly than he values one pound sterling. If, therefore, we wish, and this is the task in which we are at present engaged, to lay down the elementary factors in the formation of price, we must put down, instead of the combined amounts which make up the figures of our valuation, the elements out of which they are combined. These elements are two, first the absolute amount of subjective value which the commodity has for the valuer, and second, the absolute amount of the subjective value which the unit of the equivalent price has for the valuer. And indeed, they obviously work towards culmination in this sense, that the figures are high in direct ratio to the absolute value of the commodity and in inverse ratio to that of the equivalent and vice versa. Thus, in our scheme of the determinants of price, instead of the valuation figures, we have to lay down as the determinants of these figures. A, the subjective value of the commodity by the buyers, which itself again according to the law of marginal utility already laid down, depends on the relation of wants and provision for want. And B, the subjective valuation of the equivalent price by the buyers, since under present conditions it is money that most serves as equivalent, and since, as we saw in a former chapter, the unit of money has a smaller subjective value for the rich than for the poor. It is, in the last instance, the standard of comfort of the buyers which has the preponderating influence on the formation of this determinant. Continuing our enumeration, we have 3. The number in which goods are offered for sale, which is the extent of supply, and 4. The figures which the sellers put upon their valuations, which is the intensity of supply. As in the former case, this latter determinant may be split up into two simple factors, 
a. the subjective valuations of the commodity by the sellers, and b. the subjective valuations of the equivalent price by the sellers. These two find their own further determination according to the law of marginal utility, but frequently this leads to a very noteworthy peculiarity. In the present condition of industry, most sales are made by men who are producers and merchants by profession and who hold an amount of their commodities entirely beyond any needs of their own. Consequently for them, the subjective use value of their own wares is for the most part very nearly nil. And the figure which they put on their valuation in which the subjective use value is the standard element also sinks almost to zero. Finally comes the result that in such sales the limiting effect which, according to our theoretical formula, would be exerted by the valuation of the last seller practically does not come into play and price is actually limited and determined by the valuations of the buyers alone. In other words, when goods are once produced and the owner can do nothing with them for his own personal wants, they must, all the same, seek a market. To find this market, the seller must, in the usual way, put his goods at a price low enough to find buyers for the whole stock he offers for sale. In the case of a stock of 1,000 pieces, for instance, he will find his market at a price which is somewhat less than the valuation of the thousandth buyer, and somewhat higher than the valuation of the thousand and first. If now the relations of production and sale are normal, the whole stock offered will, almost invariably, be taken off by the demand at a price which is far above the minimum use value of the commodity to the sellers and which, beyond the full amount of costs, brings them a business profit. If the circumstances, however, are unfavorable, it may well happen that the seller must seek for his market at considerably lower levels of demand, and be content to take prices which show a loss when compared with costs of production. But as a rule, even those forced prices are still above the subjective use value of the commodity to the seller, and the function of this subjective use value as lower limit of price does not come into operation. It is only if the price should sink almost to zero that it would be checked in its descent by this latter limit, the valuation of the seller finally coming into play. But it can scarcely ever come to this. In almost all cases, the competition of buyers is sufficient of itself to stop the downward movement at a higher point on the scale. Thus, in regard to the prices actually established within a large an organized market, the law of price undergoes a great simplification. Of the four valuations which, as valuations of the two marginal pairs, limit the zone within which price is determined, the valuations of the seller, for the reasons mentioned above, fall out altogether. But if the buyers are very numerous, the interval between the figures which two successive buyers put on the valuation is so small that the zone limited by the figure of the last buyer and that of the first unsuccessful competitor is narrowed almost to a point. And so far as this is the case, it may be asserted with sufficient exactness of economic exchange, which goes on in large markets, that the market price is determined by the valuation of the last buyer. Chapter seven, the law of costs. In the sphere of price, as in the theory of subjective value, we find a law firmly rooted in economic literature and accredited by common experience. It tells us that the market price of goods reproducible at will tends to equalize itself in the long run. With costs of production, the following perfectly valid line of argument is usually adduced in proof of this. The market price of goods reproducible at will cannot in the long run be maintained either much above or much below their cost. If at any time the price of an article rises appreciably above the cost, its production will be particularly profitable to the undertakers. This will not only induce the latter to extend their already flourishing businesses, but will encourage new undertakers to enter the same remunerative branch of industry. Thus, the amount of product brought to the market will be increased. And finally, according to the law of supply and demand, a fall in price will ensue. If conversely, at any time the market price falls below cost, Continued production will show a loss. Many undertakers will reduce their output, the supply of the commodities will be reduced, and this, finally, 
in virtue of the law of supply and demand will lead to a raising of the market price. From this law of cost has gathered a great mass of theoretical detail, which may, for our purposes, be left entirely on one side. Our whole interest is centered in the question as to the position which the law, so well accredited by experience, takes in the systematic theory of price. Does it run counter to our law of marginal pairs or not? Our answer is that it does not. It is as little of a contradiction as we before found to exist between the proposition that the marginal utility determines the height of subjective value and the other proposition that the costs determine it. The line of thought, which in both cases leads to the solution of the apparent contradiction, is the same, feature for feature, except that, in the present case, in virtue of the intervention of exchange, in virtue, that is, of the translation of the phenomena out of individual economy into social economy. There appear richer developments at every station on the line of thought. In what follows, I shall try, as briefly and clearly as possible, to describe the concatenation between value, price, and costs. And I think I am not exaggerating when I say that to understand clearly this connection is to understand clearly the better part of political economy. The formation of value and price takes its start from the subjective valuations put upon finished products by the consumers. These valuations determine the demand for those products. As supply over against this demand stand, in the first instance, the stocks of finished commodities held by producers. The point of intersection of the two-sided valuations, the valuation of the marginal pairs, determines, as we know, the price, and of course determines the price of each kind of product separately. Thus, for instance, the price of iron rails is determined by the relation of supply and demand for rails, the price of nails by the relation of supply and demand for nails, and similarly the price of every other product made out of the productive good iron, such as spades, plowshares, hammers, sheet iron, boilers, machines, etc., is determined by the relation between the supply and demand which obtains for these special kinds of products. To make this perfectly clear, let us assume that the relations between requirements and stocks of the various iron products, and accordingly, their prices to begin with, are very various. But the price of a quantum of commodity, which can be made out of one and the same unit of productive material, for instance, from a hundred weight of iron, varies from two shillings, for the cheapest to twenty shillings. For the dearest class of products, these prices are the result of the position of the market at the moment, and we have first assumed that the stocks of products the supply are a given quantity, but they are only for the moment a given quantity. As time goes on, they are always getting supplemented from production, and this makes them a variable quantity. Let us follow the circumstances of this production. For the manufacture of iron fabrics, producers, of course, require iron. Under the system of division of labor, they must buy this in the iron market. The manufacturers represent this demand for iron. As regards the extent of the demand, it is clear that every producer will buy as much iron as he requires to produce that amount of the commodity which he may expect to sell among his customers. But how will it be as regards the intensity of the demand? Obviously, no producer will give more for the hundred weight of iron than he can get for it from his own customers in the shape of price. But up to this point, even in the worst case, he can and will compete rather than let his production come to a standstill for want of raw material. The manufacturer, therefore, who can profitably employ the hundredweight of iron if he gets 20 shillings from his customers will be a buyer in the iron market up to the price of 20 shillings as maximum. He who can profitably employ the hundredweight of iron at 16 shillings will naturally not buy at a price over 16, and so on. In this way, the market price which each producer of iron wares gets for his particular wares, or the share of the market price which falls to iron according to the law of complementary goods, furnishes him with the concrete valuation which he has in his mind when joining in the demand for iron. The supply which stands over against this demand consists of the stocks of iron held by the mine owners and iron masters. These stocks will pass, in methods familiar to us, in the possession of the most capable buyers, 
and at a price which approximately corresponds to the valuation of the last buyer. Suppose the stocks of iron are sufficient to meet the demand of all those buyers who value the iron from 20 shilling down to 6 shilling per 100 weight, the valuation of the last buyer, and thus the market price of the iron will stand at 6 shilling. And we now have to consider the causal connection which has ended in the price. It runs in the clearest possible way in an unbroken chain from the value and price of products to value and price of cost from iron wares to raw iron and not conversely. The links in the chain are these. The valuation which consumers subjectively put upon iron products form in the first link. This helps next to determine the figures of the valuation, the money price at which consumers can take part in the demand for iron products. These prices then determine in methods with which we are now familiar, the resultant price of iron products in the market for such products. This resultant price again indicates to the producers the exchange valuation which in turn may attach to the productive material iron and thus the figure at which they may enter the market as buyers of iron. From their figures finally results the market price of iron. But still another and very important connection may be gathered from all this. It is that we have simply the great law of marginal utility fulfilling itself. According to that law, the available stock of goods is successively conducted into the most remunerative employments, put to the most advantageous uses, and the last use to which the goods are put determines their value. In any individual economy, the most remunerative uses are seen to be those which express the most urgent subjective wants, and the value which emerges as a result of these individual relations is purely personal subjective value. In the more extended sphere of a market, on the other hand, everything is referred no longer directly to subjective wants, but to those wants as mediated by money. Money being, as it were, the neutral common denomination for wants and feelings of various subjects which are not immediately commensurable. Here emerge as the most remunerative employments, not those which express the wants absolutely most urgent, but those which are represented by the highest money valuation that is, the best paying employments, and the value which results in objective exchange value. Thus it is, first of all, with iron products. In their respective markets, they pass to the best paying buyers, and the price which expresses the valuation of the last buyer determines their market value and price. But so it is also, in the second place, in a slightly roundabout way, with the cost good, iron itself. In the iron market, it goes to the best paying producers and the valuation of the last of these determines its price. But here the producers are simply mediators in their conducting of the iron to their best paying consumers. The stock of iron really passes successively to the most remunerative forms of consumption, and the last of these forms provided for determines through the valuation named by the last producer who enters the market as buyer, the market price of the cost good, iron. It is not this cost good, then, that dictates its fixed price to the products that proceed from it. On the contrary, it receives its own price by the medium of the price of its products. In conformity with the great law of marginal utility, according to which the available stock is forced into the most remunerative employments and receives its price from the money valuations of the last of these. But connected with this is a series of subsequent phenomena which, obviously, have given rise to the opinion that costs exert a causal influence on the price of products. So long as the price of various products made from iron varies between 20 shilling and 2 shilling, while the price of the unit of iron stands between 6 shilling, it is an evidence that the economical principle which should guide the stocks of iron into the most remunerative employments is not fully carried out. Iron is being used in employments where the products fetch only two shilling or three shilling, where accordingly the use is less than the last economically permissible, and on the other hand, there are still numerous employments unprovided for, where the products would obtain a greater value than six shilling. If, for instance, the market price of an iron product stands at 20, it is a proof that only those consumers of that product who value it at 20 and upwards are actually purchasing 
while other consumers whose valuations range from 18 shilling down to 6 shilling are not supplied in the market. Similarly, with products whose market price stands at 16 shilling, there will be an unsatisfied layer of demand with a use for the product corresponding to the prices 14 shilling down to 6 shilling, and so on. Now this must be corrected, and the enterprise of undertakers will usually not be long in supplying the needed correction. The production of those iron wares, the price which still stands above 6 shilling, will, under the inducement of the premium offered by the difference between price and cost, be increased till all those employments where the utility is greater than the amount of 6 shilling are supplied. Of course, this increase of supply has the effect of always reducing the level in which the last buyer is found, and thus the market price sinks till such time as the money valuation of the last buyer and with it the market price comes to the normal level of 6. Conversely, where iron has been put to employments whose products fetch less than 6 shilling, the loss that ensues will prevent more iron being thus employed. This will be brought about by a temporary suspension or limitation of the production of those iron wares, the market price of which is under 6 shilling. This limitation of supply will soon have the effect of raising the price to 6, and now, as the state of the case demands, the commodity, iron, will only be attainable by those buyers who can use it to make products that will fetch at least 6 shilling. Thus, from above and from below, all iron products come together at the price of 6. The amount of their costs, but quite evidently, the cause of this, is not that the cost good, iron, can force its own arbitrary fixed price on its products, but that all the products involved, including the cost good, iron, conform to the law of marginal utility, find their way successively into the most remunerative employments, and together receive their price as regulated by the last of these. Empirical proofs of this may be had in abundance. It is a very well-known fact that active building of railways raises the price of rails, and through this, the price of iron, that the present strong demand for copper wire in electric lighting puts up the price of copper. In these cases, it is evident that the upward movement of price takes its start from the final products and is transferred from these to the cost goods. But the objection will probably suggest itself to many readers that there are also cases where the movement of price is from costs to products. The stocks of iron, for instance, of which we have been speaking in our illustration, are not a fixed amount, but are smaller or greater according to the circumstances of iron production. Now, if there is an extension of this production, and the supply of iron increases, its price will certainly fall, and that from causes peculiar to the iron, and this fall in prices will drag down the price of iron wares. Does the causal connection here not run from costs to price of products? To answer this objection, we have only to carry the concatenation, of which we have hitherto examined only a few links, back to its beginning. It is quite correct to say that stocks of iron are not a fixed amount, but the varying result of a production which is capable of being extended or limited at will. For the production of iron, two things are necessary, mines, and to put it shortly, direct and indirect labour. The mines are a given quantity and cannot be devoted to the production of anything but iron. On the other hand, the quantity of labour available as a whole for economical employment is an amount given and limited by the current state of population. But this is not the case with that particular labor, which is employed in the production of iron. Labor is a productive power capable of being employed in any number of ways, and all the branches of production carried on in the community compete for it. Who or what now is it that decides what exact proportion of the original productive powers at the disposal of industry, namely labor and uses of land, is employed in the production of iron, and who and what is it that decides on the value and price of the unit of those productive powers? Here, then, for the last time, is repeated in the elements of all economy, the movement which we saw in the case of final products and intermediate products. The original productive powers in the nation force themselves into the most remunerative employments one after another, and receive their value and price from the last of these, as little as, perhaps even less than, any other good have they any a priori fixed value. They receive it only from the opportunities of employment. 
Whether the day's work is worth two shilling or six shilling depends on the worth of the product which can be turned out in a day's work, and indeed on the last product. The one worst paid for the production of which there is still enough labor for the necessary quality left. After all, the better paid employments have been supplied. Production may be compared to a giant pump. Every branch of want has a separate pipe sunk down to the great reservoir of the original productive powers and competes with all the other branches of want in trying to draw its supply by suction from that reservoir. Every branch has a different power of suction, the power increasing with the number and remunerativeness that is to say, in the case of organized exchange, the money value of the employments it embraces. In the nature of the suction pumps too, there is a difference. Many are quite simple. Others have independent intermediate lengths that convey the pressure that comes from the wand, as it were, by stages. And in correspondence with that, the productive powers which supply the wand are raised by stages. The simile extends still further. Such wants as demand personal services for the satisfaction attract labor quite directly according to the payment which they can and will give for them. Such wants again as demand material goods for their satisfaction get these supplies first by payment of a market price which is remunerative in itself and then the remunerative price of the products must attract the productive powers to their manufacturer. Sometimes this is done through one or two, sometimes through 20 or 30 members. In our illustration, human demand asked and paid for iron wares. The market price of iron wares attracted people to the purchase of iron. The price of iron finally attracted the original productive powers to the production of iron. In the case of other consumption goods, the number of intermediate members, or to keep to the terms in our comparison, the number of intermediate lengths in the suction pipe may be double or 20 times as great, but the principle of the movement, and what chiefly interests us, the result is always the same. Whether there are many or few intermediate members may hasten or hinder the result, but cannot weaken or strengthen it. In the end, every want, according to the power expressed by its money valuation, draws to itself, immediately or immediately, the productive powers required for its supply. To supply the wants of the rich innumerable productive powers, are always active. Even if, simultaneously at other points of the economy, there is want both of men and goods, the reason of this is that the high figures which the rich are able to offer for the satisfaction of their wants never fail to exert and continue their attractive force through all the stages of production, right down to the reservoir of their original productive powers. Thus all human wants exert, as it were, a suction power indicated by the figures of their valuation. Now that layer of wants which is willing and able to pay, say 20 shilling and upwards, for the day's work devoted immediately or immediately to its satisfaction is soon entirely provided for. After if those layers in succession draw supply to themselves which can and will pay the day's labor with 18, 16, 14, and 12, even down to 10, 8, 6, and 4 shilling, if at the limit of four shilling, the entire stock of original powers is required and is taken, this decides two things. All wants which will not or cannot pay the day's labor devoted to their service at four shilling remain unsupplied, and the market price of the day's labor will stand at the figure of the last buyer, namely four shilling. But if, as we may rather assume, the available quantity of labor is greater than this, the wants of still lower levels may be supplied. The last needs, immediate or immediate, which are supplied may be those that pay the day's labor at two shilling only, and in conformity, the market price of labor also will be fixed at this lower figure of two shilling, and indeed this market price will be a general one. The uppermost layer will not be paid twenty shilling, and the lowest layer two shilling for the same work or the same commodity. The market price will be the same for all buyers. And now we come in sight of the answer to the doubt suggested by our former illustration. Suppose that the price of the day's labor is two shilling, and the price of a hundred weight of iron, which takes three days to produce, is six shilling. Suppose now that all of a sudden new and productive mines are opened, or some great improvement in process discovered, 
which makes it possible to produce the hundred weight of iron in two days labor. What is the consequence? So long as the iron and its products maintain the old price of six shilling, only those wants in the department of iron wares are supplied, which are able and willing to pay six shilling for two days work, that is to pay the day's labor at three shilling, while all round in other departments of want and branches of production, that layer of want is applied, which pays only two shilling for the day's labor. On economic principles, which are willingly carried out by undertakers of industry, who are always ready to seize the chance of a profit when offered them, those opportunities of employment which pay the day's work at more than two shilling, and have hitherto been misapplied, will now be supplied. More original productive powers will, accordingly, be invested in the production of iron, and the supply of iron and iron products will be increased till such time as here as elsewhere, that level of wants which is willing to pay the day's labour at two shilling is satisfied, and therefore the hundred weight of iron, which costs two days' labour, fetches four shilling. Parallel with this, of course, the price of iron and iron products goes down to the level of four shilling, and all this is not in opposition to, but in real fulfilment of our law of marginal utility, of which the law of costs, rightly understood, is only a special expression suitable to a special group of phenomena. If what is practically inconceivable, production were carried on in ideal circumstances, unfettered by limitations of place and time, with no friction, with the most perfect knowledge of the position of human wants requiring satisfaction, and without any disturbing changes of wants, stocks, or technique, then the original productive powers would, with ideal and mathematical exactitude, be invested in the most remunerative employments, and the law of cost, so far as we can speak of such a law, would hold an ideal completeness. The complementary groups of goods from which in the long run the finished good proceeds would maintain exactly the same value and price at all stages of the process, and commodity would be exactly equal to its costs. These costs and their costs and so on, back to the original productive powers from which ultimately all goods come, but this ideal symmetry is traversed by two disturbing causes. The first of these I may call by the general name of friction. Almost invariably, there is some hindrance, great or small, permanent or temporary, to the due investment of the original productive powers in the employments and the forms of consumption, which are the most remunerative at the time. In consequence of the provision for wants, and likewise the prices are somewhat unsymmetrical, Sometimes it is that individual branches of want are, relatively, more amply supplied than others. So that, for instance, in woolens, those wants are supplied which pays the day's labour indirectly at one shilling eight pence only, while it may be that, in copper goods, no wants are satisfied which cannot pay three shillings for a similar day's labour. But sometimes it may be that groups of productive materials successively transformed till they are changed at last into the finished commodity are not equally valued at all stages of the process. If we compare the means of production to a stream, we might say that the stream is not, as it should be, of equal breadth at all stages of its course. From some disturbing cause or other, there may be dams at certain particular points and leakages at others. And these cause an unsymmetrical divergence of price compared with the prices obtained at stages before and after or, as it is usually conceived and expressed, a divergence of the price of a product or intermediate product from its costs. Thus it is, in our illustration of the iron, when production is suddenly cheapened from six shilling to four shilling, as a consequence of the production of iron is at first increased and presses down the price of raw material, while the products of iron may still, for some time, maintain a price greater than their costs, but gradually the increase of supply presses forward to the later stages of production, passes from the production of raw materials to the manufacture of final products, and by reducing the price here also the four shillings, restores the disturbed symmetry between price and costs. In practical life, such frictional disturbances are innumerable. At no moment and in no branch of production are they entirely absent, and thus it is that the law of costs is recognized as a law that is only approximately valid, a law riddled through and through with exceptions. These innumerable exceptions, small and great, 
or the inexhaustible source of the undertaker's profits, but also of the undertaker's losses. The second disturbing cause is the lapse of time, the weeks, months, years, which must stretch between the inception of the original productive powers and the presentation of their finished and final product, the difference of time in exerting a far-reaching influence on our valuation of goods makes a normal difference between the value of productive groups standing at different points of the production process through which they must all pass and is therefore a difference to be kept quite distinct from the unsymmetrical divergences caused by frictional disturbances. It is this second disturbing cause which gives rise to interest. Our further task will be to intercalate the theory of interest in its place within the value and price theory already outlined.